Pearl Harbor The Story of the Secret War George Morgenstern published January, 1947 But one of the weightiest objections to a plurality in the executive, and which lies as much against the last as the first plan, is that it tends to conceal faults and destroy responsibility. Responsibility is of two kinds, to censure and to punishment. The first is the most important of the two, especially in an elective office. Man, in public trust, will much oftener act in such a manner as to make him obnoxious to legal punishment. But the multiplication of the executive adds to the difficulty of detection in either case. It often becomes impossible, amidst mutual accusations, to determine on whom the blame or the punishment of a pernicious measure, or series of pernicious measures, ought really to fall. It is shifted from one to another with so much dexterity, and under such plausible appearances, that the public opinion is left in suspense about the real author. The circumstances which may have led to any national miscarriage of misfortune are sometimes so complicated that, where there are a number of actors who may have had different degrees and kinds of agency, though we may clearly see upon the whole that there has been mismanagement, yet it may be impracticable to pronounce to whose account the evil which may have been incurred is truly chargeable. I was overruled by my counsel. The counsel were so divided in their opinions that it was impossible to obtain any better resolution on the point. These and similar pretexts are constantly at home, whether true or false. And who is there that will either take the trouble or incur the odium of a strict scrutiny into the secret springs of the transaction? Should there be found a citizen zealous enough to undertake the unpromising task, if there happen to be collusion between the parties concerned? How easy it is to clothe the circumstances with so much ambiguity, as to render it uncertain what was the precise conduct of any of those parties. The Federalist, number 70 Alexander Hamilton. Forward This book is intended to give the facts and examine the meaning of Pearl Harbor. The facts have come to the American public in disjointed form, from many sources, and with many interpretations over a period of four and one half years. Pearl Harbor is already a chapter in history. Historians of World War II cannot escape its implications. At this date, so soon after the end of a victorious war, there has been a reluctance to appraise these implications. The mores of a victorious nation dictate that the whole of the war guilt be attached to the defeated adversary. Pearl Harbor, as a study of war origins, is thus a national embarrassment. For the United States, World War II, the most unpopular war in history, to use the apt descriptive phrase of Lieutenant Gen. Q. A. Drum 1, officially began December 7, 1941, with the Japanese attack upon Pearl Harbor. The assault which brought America into the war was the greatest naval disaster in American history. It was originally investigated solely as a failure of the commanders of the fleet and garrison at Hawaii. As more and more facts came to light, it became clear that any balanced study of the events of December 7 could not be thus restricted. Pearl Harbor was the terminal result of a complex of events moving in many parallel courses. National ambition and international intrigue, diplomacy, espionage, politics, personalities and the personal responses of men to crisis, all of these were of equal or greater importance than purely military considerations. Finally, Pearl Harbor reduced itself to a study of the reasons for which the United States was taken to war, the methods by which it was taken to war, and the motives of those who determined that course. Of some dozen investigations and studies of Pearl Harbor, most were plainly partisan undertaken neither in defense of President Roosevelt and his administration or of certain members of the civil government or of the Army and Navy High Command. An inquiry by Army intelligence for Mr. Roosevelt was so secret that its existence is known only by hearsay. Two, a second investigation was authorized but never occurred. Colonel Charles W. Bundy and Lieutenant Colonel George W. Ricker of the War Department General Staff, who were commissioned to undertake the project were killed while flying to Hawaii when their plane crashed December 12, 1941, in the Sierra Nevadas near Bishop, California. Other investigations and studies were conducted by the late Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox, 
by a presidential commission headed by former Associate Justice Owen J. Roberts of the United States Supreme Court, by an Army Board of Inquiry, comma, 3 by a Naval Court of Inquiry, comma, 4 by Admiral Thomas C. Hart, comma, 5 by Adm. H. Kent Hewitt, by Major General Myron C. Kramer, Army Judge Advocate General, by Major Henry C. Clausen, by Colonel Carter Clark, and by a joint congressional committee. Throughout these investigations, the administration was in a strategic position, because of its control of Congress and the executive departments, its control of records, its influence on rank and status in the services, its power to initiate investigations to appoint the investigators and counsel, to define the limits and control the course of the investigations, and, during the war and the continuing period of emergency, to exercise powers of censorship. The administration has done its utmost to discourage examination of the acts and intentions of the men who were in the vanguard of the march toward war. It has suppressed relevant documents and permitted important papers to disappear or be destroyed. It has even sought legislation which, on threat of penal confinement and heavy fines, would have forbidden discussion of the vital intelligence which came into its possession as a result of penetrating the Japanese code. There could be no guarantee of impartiality and disinterestedness when men who were in the position of defendants were empowered to investigate and to appraise their own conduct and that of their close associates. This generalization is particularly applicable to a political party which is in the process of canonizing a party leader whose name has had a peculiar efficacy in maintaining that party in power. Mr. Roosevelt was at pains to protect his reputation and political tenure by forestalling any thorough examination and report during his lifetime. When the Army Pearl Harbor Board submitted embarrassing findings six months before his death, his Secretary of War, resorting to the pretext of national security, used the censorship to suppress the entire report for ten months. When, after both Germany and Japan were defeated, the report was finally released, fifty-two pages of it were still suppressed. They were made public two and one-half months later, when the hearings of the Joint Congressional Committee provided a convenient diversion to obscure their meaning. The Congressional Committee through the enterprise and resourcefulness of the minority members, made valid contributions to history, but the course of this investigation in itself provides discouraging evidence of the forces which were at work. On September 6, 1945, a concurrent resolution calling for an investigation of the Pearl Harbor disaster was submitted by Alban W. Barclay, the Senate Majority Leader. The purpose was described in section 2 colon the committee shall make a full and complete investigation of the facts relating to the events and circumstances leading up to or following the attack made by Japanese armed forces upon Pearl Harbor in the territory of Hawaii on December 7, 1941, and shall report to the Senate and the House of Representatives not later than January 3, 1946, the results of its investigation together with such recommendations as it may deem advisable. Six, the spirit and intentions supposed to animate the inquiry were described by Senator Barclay in his address. He said that reports of previous investigations are confusing and conflicting, when compared to one another, and to some extent contain contradictions and inconsistencies within themselves. He referred to the widespread confusion and suspicion that prevailed among the American people and among the members of Congress. Senator Barclay said that the congressional investigation should fix responsibility upon an individual, or a group of individuals, or upon a system under which they operated or cooperated or failed to do either, and that it should determine what corrective action might tend to prevent a recurrence of the disaster. The inquiry, Barclay said, should be conducted without partisanship or favoritism toward any responsible official, military, naval, or civilian, high or low, living or dead. Congress itself should make its own thorough, impartial, and fearless inquiry into the facts and circumstances and conditions prevailing prior to and at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, no matter how far back it may be necessary to go in order to appraise the situation which existed prior to and at the time of the attack. Seven, the resolution as so interpreted passed the Senate unanimously and was concurred in by the House on September 11th. 
The administration then candidly confessed the partisan nature of the project by allotting six of the ten places on the committee to members of its own party and installing the Senate Majority Leader as chairman. The majority established committee rules retaining control in its own hands and foreclosing important areas of inquiry. The effect of executive orders promulgated by President Truman was to deny minority committeemen the right to search government files. Under these favorable auspices, witnesses with a direct concern in the proceedings were permitted to absent themselves, while those with a similar interest who appeared were emboldened to cover up what they could. In a courtroom many would have been adjudged reluctant if not hostile. The record of the hearings is filled with shabby and transparent evasions, special pleading, changes in sworn testimony, and unbelievable lapses of memory. Eight in significant respects it fails to satisfy the general standards of credibility. A minority of witnesses displayed not only candor but courage, but there were few who did not have some particular axe to grind who were not trying to justify their actions or protect someone, or who had not been thoroughly coached in advance. Any show of independence in searching out the facts during the investigation provoked vituperative outbursts from New Deal spokesmen and the push-button press. There was an evident fear that someone might pursue the facts to their logical conclusion. A campaign was instituted to intimidate the minority with the argument that if they gave an exact description of the methods and motives of President Roosevelt and his administration in following the road to war, they could properly be pilloried as defenders of Hitler and Tojo. The investigators were exposed to the threat that by imputing censure to the nation's wartime leadership, they would be depicted as blaming the United States for starting the war. This defense was mercilessly exploited by the Roosevelt Truman administration. It was reduced to the lowest common denominator by Senator James A. Tunnell of Delaware, who implied that any investigation of Pearl Harbor must necessarily be partisan and an apology for Japan. In their desperation, said Mr. Tunnell, Mr. Roosevelt's opponents have in effect put on Japanese kimonos and said, Honorable Roosevelt and Honorable Hull teased us into attacking. Nine no one with the courage and capacity to confront facts need be deterred by such abuse. The committee reports Comiten submitted July 20, 1946, constituted three separate statements of opinion. The majority report was signed by all six Democrats and was adhered to without express qualification by Representative Gerhardt. The minority report was submitted by Senators Ferguson and Brewster. Representative Keefe, although signing with the majority, filed a supplementary statement which, in essential respects, placed him with the minority. 11 The record of diplomacy which so vitally influenced the Pearl Harbor tragedy is admittedly incomplete. It is, however, far more complete than it would be if there had been no investigation. 12 Someday, when the passions of partisan apologists have cooled, when the archives are opened and candid statesmen, if such the be, have provided a more adequate account of motives and events, more may be known of the hidden history of our times. Enough of the truth is known now so that judgments may be formed and conclusions of it. Dot with all of the elements at hand, the reader has the ingredients of a mystery story. There are victims, 3,000 of them in the Pearl Harbor attack. There are a variety of clues. There are a multitude of false leads. There are numerous possible motives. Innumerable obstructions are put in the way of the discovery of truth. Many of the characters betray guilty knowledge. Not only the writer of detective fiction, with full control over his plot and his characters, can hope to achieve a complete examination of motive and solve every subsidiary puzzle in the major mystery. The Pearl Harbor record ends with no signed confessions. August 23, 1946 Democratic members of the committee were, Senator Barclay, Chairman, Representative Jeremiah Cooper, Vice Chairman, Senator Walter F. George, Senator Scott W. Lucas, Representative J. Bayard Clark, and Representative John W. Murphy. Republican members were, Senator Homer Ferguson, Senator Owen Brewster, Rep. Frank B. Keefe, and Rep. Bertrand W. Gearhart. Acknowledgements permission has been granted to quote from the following books How War Came by Forrest Davis and Ernest Gay Lindley.
by permission of Simon and Schuster, Incorporated, New York. Copyright 1942 by Forrest Davis and Ernest Gay Lindley. Ten years in Japan by Joseph C. Grew, by permission of Simon and Schuster, Incorporated, New York. Copyright 1944 by Joseph C. Grew. They call it Pacific by Clark Lee, by permission of the Viking Press, Incorporated, New York. Copyright 1943 by Clark Lee. The Armed Forces of the Pacific by Captain W. D. Pulston, USN, by permission of the Yale University Press, New Haven. Copyright 1941 by W. D. Pulston. The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce, by permission of Albert and Charles Boney, Incorporated. Battle Report, Pearl Harbor to Coral Sea by Commander Walter Carrick, USNR, and Lieutenant Wellborn Kelly, USNR, by permission of Reinhardt and Company, Incorporated, New York. Copyright, 1944, by Farrah and Reinhardt, Incorporated. Memoirs of a Superfluous Man by Albert J. Nock, by permission of Harper and Brothers, New York. Copyright, 1943, by Albert J. Nock. The Case Against the Admirals by William Bradford Huey, by permission of E. P. Dutton and Co., Incorporated, New York. Copyright, 1946, by William Bradford Huey. Permission has also been obtained to quote from the following article, An Adventure in Failure by E. Stanley Jones, by permission of Asia and the Americas. Copyright by Asia Press, Incorporated. This article appeared as a special supplement to Asia and the Americas, Volume XLV, Number 12. December, 1945. The author wishes to express his gratitude to Charles A. Beard for a scholarly appraisal of this work, to Mary D. Alexander, who prepared the manuscript for the printer, to Mrs. Adelaide Dollegendorf, who made the index, to Kathleen King, who designed the jacket, to Gary Sheehan, who drew the maps, and to Leon Stoles who read the manuscript and gave valuable criticism. Pearl Harbor Chapter 1 War Art 758 AM on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a radio warning was broadcast to all ships in Pearl Harbor. Air Raid, Pearl Harbor. The radio screeched. This is no drill. This is no drill. Three minutes before, Japanese warplanes had come in over the great naval base at Oahu launching their first torpedoes and dropping their first bombs. Almost at once a second warning was broadcast by the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, from Sinkpak to all ships Hawaii area, air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. The Navy radio station at Mare Island Navy Yard, San Francisco, intercepted this message. The country soon knew that it was at war. For a year and a half, a debate had raged the length and breadth of America over going to war or staying out. It was bitterly fought in Congress, in the newspapers, over the radio, in public forums, in private homes, by propagandists, by politicians, and by the plain people, and all the words, if people had but known it, were futile. Long before December 7, the United States was in fact at war. That decision had come at the policy-making level of the government and of the Army and Navy High Command, and it had been put into execution without anybody asking a vote from Congress or bothering to let the people in on the secret. For more than two years there had been war in Europe, and for more than four years war in the Orient, but, so far as the people knew, the United States was not a party to either war. In Europe, Germany and Italy, with their satellites, were at war with Russia, Britain, and the nations of the British Commonwealth, supported by a group of paper allies, the governments in exile of Poland, Norway, Belgium, Yugoslavia, Greece, Ethiopia, Holland, and the de Gaullists of France. In the Far East Japan and China had been fighting since July 7, 1937, but neither chose to call it a war. To the Japanese it was the China incident. The Chinese didn't have a name for it until two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, when they finally declared war. The debate over American intervention was emotional and none too well informed. The totalitarian governments of Germany and Italy, with their scurvy and cutthroat leadership, had nothing to commend them, 
while the brutal efficiency of the German army terrified the timid. The Sabaratlas of Tokyo were no more ingratiating. The Japanese military, in the course of a long harassment of the inoffensive mass of the Chinese people, had earned the condemnation of civilized men, and, in such outbreaks of mass insanity and violence as accompanied the fall of Nanking, had aroused horror and revulsion. On the other hand, the forces in opposition were hardly able to pin the sanctions of high minded morality or abstract justice to their banners. Even the Chinese, who had suffered long and had a legitimate claim upon the sympathy of the outside world, were afflicted with a corrupt, devious, and scheming central administration under the domination of a leader whose methods had frequently been discreditable, exercising his will ineffectively through the one party Kuomintang government. China was disorganized, shot through with internal dissension, and more an anarchy than an organized state. The faults of Britain and France were of another order. The French and British Munichmen had been guilty of the betrayal of national self interest the cardinal sin in the conduct of statesmen, and were now appealing to America to bail them out. They had sacrificed whatever hope there might have been in collective security by their selfish and cynical policy, accepting the extinction in turn of Austria, Ethiopia, Czechoslovakia, Albania, and the legal Spanish government, and calling these sellouts appeasement and peace for our time. One the judgment of Winston Churchill after Munich was prophetic. France and Britain had to choose between war and dishonor. They chose dishonor. They will have war. The Nazi and fascist slave states were abhorrent to decent people, but it was not easy to forget that the British Empire rested upon the exploitation of hundreds of millions of natives, sweating out their lives in the steaming mines of the Rand at seven cents a day or in the jungles of New Guinea at less than five and one half cents a day, or subsisting, as 400 million of them did in India, with famine always half a step from the threshold. Shocking as were Hitler's concentration camps, his calculated campaign against the Jews, and his dictum that the conquered were subhuman, fit only for slavery or the charnel house, the barbaric government by terror, purge, an enslavement conducted by Stalin over his fellow Russians was no more exemplary. The two tyrants had had no scruples in striking a bargain on August 23, 1939, when the Ten Year on Aggression Pact signed by them turned the German army loose eight days later upon Poland and Western Europe, and permitted Stalin to roll up Eastern Poland. Moral distinctions were difficult to perceive between this pair. For its part, Britain, in guaranteeing to defend the corrupt Polish government of colonels and feudal gentry, had committed itself to a decision which was on a par with all of the other stupidities achieved in London. At any time up to the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia on October 1, 1938, the British and French, if they had been so minded, could have stopped Hitler. Too, when they finally chose Poland as the issue over which to fight a war, they assumed a task which was militarily impossible. They had waited too long and Hitler had grown too strong. Moreover, their commitment was neither complete nor candid. Britain's guarantee to Poland was first announced in the House of Commons March 31, 1939, by Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. The Prime Minister stated that consultations were in progress between the two governments. But in the meantime, before their conclusion, I now have to inform the House that during that period, in the event of action which clearly threatens Polish independence, and which the Polish government accordingly considered it vital to resist with their national forces, His Majesty's government would feel themselves bound at once to lend the Polish government all support in their power. Chamberlain added that the French government had adopted a parallel policy. On April 6, the communique released by Chamberlain stated that the two countries were prepared to enter into an agreement of a permanent and reciprocal character to replace the present temporary and unilateral assurance given by His Majesty's government to the Polish government. Like the temporary assurance, the communique stated, the permanent agreement would not be directed against any other country but would be designed to assure Great Britain and Poland of mutual assistance in the event of any threat, direct or indirect, to the independence of either. On August 25, 
Six days before Germany invaded Poland, the tentative Anglo-Polish arrangement was converted into a formal agreement of mutual assistance, pledging each party to give the other all the support and assistance in its power in the event of either becoming engaged in hostilities with a European power in consequence of aggression by the latter against that contracting party. Eight articles of the treaty were made public. The first seemed to be an unequivocal pledge to fight any aggression. Such was not the fact. Despite Chamberlain's statement in Parliament and the clear commitment in the published articles that Britain would come to Poland's defence in the event of aggression by any European power, it would later be discovered that strings were attached to the British guarantee, and that Britain had escaped from any commitment to defend Poland against aggression by Russia or to rectify any grabs Russia might subsequently make. It was finally disclosed on April 5, 1945 that the first article of a secret protocol to the Anglo-Polish Treaty of Mutual Assistance provided, by the expression a European power employed in the agreement is to be understood Germany. 3. This escape clause paved the way for the Yalta and Potsdam deals handing over eastern Poland to Russia, thereby permitting Stalin the fruits of aggression under his deal with Hitler in August, 1939. As the capstone to this edifice of bad faith. Hitler and Stalin, through the uneasy 22-month existence of their non-aggression treaty, dickered for a full military alliance and a four-way partnership dividing up three continents among themselves, the Italians, and the Japanese. All that prevented the consummation of this deal was the cupidity of the tyrants in Berlin and Moscow, whose greed and distrust confirmed the validity of the definition that an alliance is the union of two thieves who have their hands so deeply inserted in each other's pockets that they cannot separately plunder a third. For the memoirs of Prince Kono, who committed suicide on December 16, 1945, provide evidence that Russia late in 1940 agreed in principle to broaden the tripartite alliance of September 27, 1940, among Germany, Italy, and Japan into a four-power entente. Kono said that Iran and India were to be Russia's future sphere of influence under a secret agreement accompanying the proposed entente. Japan was to receive the South Seas area, Germany would have taken Central Africa, and Italy Northern Africa. Kono stated that von Ribbentrop, Nazi foreign minister, advanced the plan for a four-power agreement, providing firstly, the Soviet Union will declare that it agrees with the principle of the tripartite pact in the sense of preventing war and swiftly recovering peace. Secondly, the Soviet will recognize the leading position of Germany, Italy, and Japan, respectively, in the new order in Europe and Asia, and the three nations will pledge respect of Soviet territory. Thirdly, the three nations and the Soviet Union pledge not to assist any nation being the enemy of the other, nor to join such a group of nations. The Japanese government promptly approved the plan, which was handed to Foreign Commissar Molotov of Russia during his Berlin visit in November, 1940. Then Tokyo heard nothing further until March, 1941, when the Japanese Foreign Minister, Yosuke Matsoka, visited Berlin. Matsoka was told that Molotov had agreed in principle, but proposed exchange conditions of over 30 articles which Germany could in no way recognize. By then, Matsoka told Kono German officials were openly talking about the inevitability of an Nazi Soviet war. Five additional light on this cynical deal was supplied through captured German documents, now in the possession of the American government, tracing Molotov's conversations with Ribbentrop. These documents disclosed that Russia's appetite for more and yet more of the Earth's surface was all that prevented the formation of a Berlin Moscow Tokyo Rome plunderbund. Six these intrigues are sufficient to demonstrate that there was not a major power involved in the mess in Europe or Asia that could come to the United States with clean hands, or represent itself as either a democracy or an exemplar of justice. The knowledge of all of this chicanery was, of course, withheld from the American people until after the war, and the debate on the question of intervention versus non-intervention was thus not illuminated by any perceptible degree of understanding or truth. The American people, 
who thought that the issue of whether it was to be peace or whether it had to be war was still subject to democratic debate, did not know in the closing months of 1941 that the decision had long since passed them by. They did not know that already a state of war existed by executive action. Not for four years would they hear the admission from President Roosevelt's Chief of Naval Operations that by October, 1941, the American Navy was in effect, at war in the Atlantic, comma 7 and that this shooting war against Germany and Italy constituted a direct invitation to Japan to attack the United States under the tripartite pact. 8 On December 7, 1941, the policymakers and warmakers in Washington were confidently awaiting the hour when their undeclared war would be regularized by the logic of events. On that same December 7, the people were still hoping that the peace which had already been lost could be preserved. The previous day Pope Pius had said that the world needed faith more than great statesmen. In one American city there was a Christmas expression of such faith, a great star of peace emblazoned in lights 132 feet wide and 150 feet high on the side of a skyscraper office building. Even Lord Halifax, the British ambassador, had a kind word for peace as he busied himself talking up war. Lasting peace, he said, was foreshadowed explicitly and implicitly in the Atlantic Charter semicolon 9 but he implied that to catch up with the shadow Americans would first have to fight, otherwise the professed objectives of the Charter could not be realized. The war, so far, had made little impact upon civilian life in America. The national debt, after eight and one half years of the New Deal, stood at $55 billion. There were 15 shopping days until Christmas and the display advertisements told of peacetime abundance. No one yet had imposed rationing, although some of the more vocal proponents of war in and out of the administration were impatient that consumers' goods were still available, when, so these gentlemen thought, the nation's entire production should be devoted to rearmament and lend-lease for Britain and Russia. Secretary of Commerce Wallace was later to pay his peculiar tribute to American industry and management, which outproduced all other belligerents combined, friends and foes alike, by saying that plant managers were sheer fascists and that it had been necessary to take industry by the scruff of the neck to get it into war. If war crept into the advertisements, it was only in the form of 50 peace soldier sets offered as a Christmas gift for the children 24 soldiers, one cannon, 12 shells, a pop gun, and 12 corks, all for dollar one dot. There was another kind of advertisement. The United States Army Recruiting Service was calling for volunteers. The appeal said throughout the regular army, there are thrilling jobs to be mastered, jobs that provide splendid technical training, combined with adventure, useful service to your country, and the opportunity to provide for a successful future career. More than a third of all enlisted men volunteer because of the recommendations of their friends in the army. Most of them re-enlist after their first three years. The actual war still seemed far away to those who read the morning newspapers of December 7, telling of million and a half German troops, 8,000 tanks, and 1,000 guns massed before Moscow. Hitler was talking as if the fall of the Soviet capital was a matter of a few days if not of ours, and no one, least of all the Japanese whom he had been at pains to impress, knew that his armies had already been beaten by the terrible Russian winter and were even then preparing to retreat. What hints there were that America would soon be committed to the slaughter were oblique. The people knew that relations with Japan had been deteriorating, but knew nothing of the course of the seemingly interminable diplomatic negotiations in Washington between Secretary of State Cordell Hull and the Japanese emissaries, Admiral Kikaiser Bureau Nomura and Saburo Kuresu. Washington encouraged the notion that as long as the negotiations continued, there was still a substantial hope of achieving a settlement and keeping the peace. Not a word was let drop that the negotiations had come to an end and that war was inevitable though the leaders of our government were fully aware of these facts. True, Mr. Hull's pronouncements were not encouraging, and President Roosevelt's latest contribution, a personal appeal cable December 6 directly to Emperor Hirohito, seemed, even for Mr. Roosevelt, a little frantic and somewhat excessively flamboyant. 
On Saturday Mr. Hull had acknowledged that relations with Japan were grave. He had called the president's attention to the presence of an estimated 125,000 Japanese troops in French Indochina, which Japan had effectively taken over after the fall of France, and manifested disquiet because 18,000 of them were loaded aboard troop ships in Camran Bay. That suggested that they were going somewhere, and the only places to which they could go were the property of nations other than Japan. Mr. Roosevelt, in an ill-advised moment in April, 1939, had addressed a personal message to Hitler asking him to pledge respect for the territorial integrity of 30 of Germany's neighbors in Europe and the Near East, 10 only to be rewarded with a sarcastic response. Hitler pointed out that although there were interlopers in many lands, they were not Germans, and that although many peoples were oppressed, their complaints were directed, not against Germany but against nations which were prone to parade their virtue, among them the United States. Eleven, Despite the dubious success of this venture in personal diplomacy, Roosevelt in his message to Hirohito followed virtually the same formula, and laid himself open to much the same retort he had received from Hitler. Hirohito's advisers, however, did not see fit to present Roosevelt's message to the Emperor until 20 minutes before the first bombs dropped at Pearl Harbor. 12 If Hirohito thought anything of Roosevelt's message, which in itself is doubtful, he probably reflected that the President didn't have much understanding of protocol, for not even Presidents communicate with gods. The State Department on the morning of December 7 did not disclose the nature of the note that Roosevelt had dispatched but later it would become known that the message had appealed for Hirohito's aid in dispelling the dark clouds of a possible Japanese invasion of Malaya, Thailand, the Dutch East Indies, and the Philippines. The Japanese might have conceded Roosevelt's right to discuss the Philippines, which were under the protection of the American flag, but when the president also projected himself as the defender of British and Dutch imperialism, he merely confirmed the Japs in a belief they had entertained all along, that the United States would go to war to preserve the white empires. Inasmuch as the time would never be more propitious than the present, the new government of General Hideki Tojo had determined, in the general's own phrase, to answer Roosevelt by quick action, not words. 13 Mr. Roosevelt knew this quite as well as Gen. Tojo and the other sword rattlers in Tokyo. His appeal to Hirohito so late in the day was dispatched with an eye toward the justification of history, although originally the president had had another purpose in mind. A few weeks earlier Roosevelt might easily have succeeded in avoiding embroilment in a war with Japan, but by December both Tojo and he were equally intent that there should be no turning back. By the final month of 1941 the Western proprietors of colonial empires in East Asia and the Southwest Pacific were in no position to safeguard their title. Japan had found how easy the pickings were when, after the fall of France, Japanese forces had seized the defenseless French holding of Indochina. Holland, occupied by Germany, was impotent to defend the Netherlands East Indies, while the British had been driven off the European continent and were on the defensive in their home island and engaged in an inconclusive seesaw war in North Africa. Britain could exact no great price from any invader which went after its colonies in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. This, so it must have seemed to the Japanese militarists, was the opportunity of a lifetime. More than ever is prompted a program of conquest. The Japanese military machine was bogged down in China in a war now well into its fifth year. With the military needing vast amounts of war material in order to continue functioning, the United States had cut off critical supplies by embargoing the export to Japan of oil and steel. It had then frozen Japanese credits, threatening Japan with economic strangulation. Hull although even his countrymen did not know it, had set a stiff price if Japan was to restore itself to the good graces of the United States. He demanded nothing less than that Japan evacuate Indochina, get out of China, repudiate its alliance with Germany and Italy, and accept equality and no more in the trade of the Far East. Such terms confronted Japan with a dilemma. All that had been gained in four and one half years of struggle in China would be lost if Japan gave in. 
the Japanese warlords could look upon lands not far removed which were possessed by the absentee white proprietor and see all of the oil, rubber, tin, and other materials which were so highly prized by a Japan which was denied them. The Japanese people, bound in uncomplaining bondage to the military, could follow that same glance and see rice and opportunity denied them in their homeland. In the last estimate, Japan was confronted with the option of striking out for a rich new empire or abandoning its conquests and resigning itself to the future of a third rate nation. It made the natural if mistaken choice. Edma. Nomura and other intelligent Japanese knew that the choice meant the ruin of Japan, yet, there certainly seemed a chance of success in December, 1941, and a chance, which, very likely, would never again be so favorable. Nomura's estimate proved correct. Japan now is not a third-rate nation. It is, by the description of a perspicacious general of B-29s, a 40th-rate nation a Bulgaria or less. The Japanese had hoped that the tripartite pact would serve to warn the United States of the greater East Asia Go prosperity sphere which Japan had staked out for itself. This alliance pledged Germany and Italy to respect Japan's position of leadership in the new order in East Asia, while Japan respected the ascendancy of Rome and Berlin in Europe. More important, it specified that if any of the partners was attacked by a nation not then involved in their respective wars, the other two should render all possible military, economic, and political assistance. Inasmuch as Russia had been specifically accepted when the pact was executed, and the United States was the only remaining powerful nation in the world, the alliance obviously was intended to caution this country against interfering either in Europe or the Pacific. The purpose had failed. But at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack the tripartite pact still offered considerable insurance to Japan, especially in view of Roosevelt's preoccupation with the task of defeating Hitler and saving the British. The Japanese military government knew that if it had to fight the United States, it would fight with the support of a still powerful Germany, which could be expected to engage a substantial proportion of the American Army, Navy and air force in a theater far distant from the Pacific. Furthermore, the Japanese militarists determined that, if they must fight America, they should seize every possible initial advantage, especially that of surprise. They had a precedent for their strategy. In 1904 Japan had broken off relations with Russia on February 5th, but war was not declared until February 10th. Not even waiting for the declaration, Edm. Togo sent his torpedo boats into Port Arthur the night of February the 8th to the 9th and caught the Russian fleet by surprise in harbor. The Russians had played into Japan's hands by splitting their fleet, and then splitting it again. Russia had a powerful fleet in the Baltic, in addition to its Far Eastern fleet. If the two could unite, they would decidedly outnumber the Japanese fleet, but the Union was never permitted to take place. Russia had further divided its Far Eastern fleet. Four of its first-class cruisers were at Vladivostok, a fifth at Kemalpo, and the remaining four at Port Arthur, so that the Russian Port Arthur fleet under Vysadm. Stark was in no way equal to the fleet under Togo, which promptly put Port Arthur under blockade. In 1941 the Jap High Command could not but notice a striking parallel to this situation when it contemplated the American fleet dispositions. Roosevelt and the High Command not only had split the fleet between the Pacific and the Atlantic, but had split the Pacific fleet further into an Asiatic fleet based upon Cavite, in the Philippines, and the main fleet body based upon Pearl Harbor. In the week preceding the December 7 attack, the Pearl Harbor fleet was split again when the only two carriers in Hawaii, with six heavy cruisers and 14 destroyers, were sent to ferry a few Marine Corps planes and crews to Wake and Midway Islands, a mission which could easily have been performed by freighters. In addition, a third task force, consisting of one heavy cruiser and five destroyer mine sweepers, was off Johnston Island, 700 miles southwest of Oahu, while one heavy cruiser and four destroyer mine sweepers were 25 miles south of Oahu. Meanwhile, the battleship strength of the Pacific Fleet was bottled up in Pearl Harbor. 
All that had changed in the 37 years since the Port Arthur incident was that the airplane had replaced the torpedo boat as the instrument of attack. In the event of war, it was a foregone conclusion that the Japanese would seek out the American adversary for surprise attack at whatever place American fleet strength was concentrated. 14 Pearl Harbor was the only possible objective because that was where the fleet was. The Japanese objective was simple. By attacking the fleet wherever it was to be found, Japan would destroy the ships of greatest range and firepower and thus prevent interference with its advance in Asia and the Western Pacific. With the exception of the British battleship Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser Repulse, which arrived at Singapore only a week before Japanese planes were to seek them out and sink them as they steamed without air cover in the East China Sea. The only element that could possibly interfere with Japan's program of conquest was the American fleet. Once it was immobilized, the Jap fleet and army could move at will on their mission of capturing American possessions and imperial colonies. These strategic considerations alone were sufficient to have demonstrated to Roosevelt and the High Command that war against the United States would be inaugurated by a Japanese surprise attack at Pearl Harbor and no place else. For years afterward the story was carefully cultivated that the Japanese attack was a treacherous surprise, launched when there was no remotest reason for expecting it, and therefore a great shock to the leaders of government. The excuse has been made that Japan's success in attaining surprise was the result of striking at a time when the administration was engaged in peaceful negotiation and war was remote from its thoughts. And even if the administration had known that war was coming, the apologists say, it could not have known at what time or what place. Nothing was then known of the interception by American intelligence of Jap secret messages which, decoded, pointed unmistakably to attack at Pearl Harbor December 7. Four years later it would become known that the Jap's secret code had been cracked many months before Pearl Harbor and that the men in Washington who read the code intercepts had almost as good a knowledge of Japanese plans and intentions as if they had been occupying seats in the war councils of Tokyo. But in the last month of 1941 the American people knew nothing of this. If war was close, indeed, was here, the people were ignorant of it. They had not read the intercepts, tracing the gradual deterioration of relations with Japan. They did not know of warnings sent out by Tokyo to its diplomatic corps that after November 29 things were automatically going to happen, of statements that by the beginning of December negotiations in Washington would be de facto ruptured, of instructions to destroy code machines and burn ciphers in the Japanese embassy in Washington, comma, section of Japanese confidences to Hitler at the end of November that a Japanese war with the United States might come quicker than anyone dreams. Vertical bar they had never heard then of East Wind Rain. Pilgro they knew nothing of last minute instructions to the Japanese emissaries to hand in their reply to Hull at 1 p.m., Washington time, on December 7. Roosevelt, the inner circle of the war cabinet, and the Army and Navy High Command knew all of this and more, but the stage had been set that December Sunday to convey the impression that no one was more surprised than the President himself. That day Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins, with whom he shared state secrets, were in the Oval Study on the second floor of the White House. The scene has been described by Forrest Davis and Ernest Gay Lindley. 15 Their account runs Mr. Roosevelt had dedicated this day to rest. Today, tealess and in shirt sleeves, he hoped to catch up with his neglected stamp collection. The president might have been any one of a million Americans putting in a loafing Sunday with a crony and a hobby. Mr. Roosevelt expected war, but not this weekend. That was the scene. That is the frame of mind which it was desired that the American people would remember. The president himself vouched for the fact that this was his attitude and these his thoughts. All of the telephone lines through to Roosevelt had been shut off. A do not disturb order had been placed with the switchboard. Mr. Roosevelt was topping his dinner with an apple. His personal chronicler's report, when his desk telephone jangled disobediently. It was Secretary of the Navy Knox who had insisted on disturbing his tranquility. In his annual report, published that morning, Knox had been reassuring. 
He said I am proud to report that the American people may feel fully confident in their navy. In my opinion, the loyalty, morale, and technical ability of the personnel are without superior. On any comparable basis, the American Navy is second to none. The international situation is such that we must arm as rapidly as possible to meet our naval defense requirements, simultaneously in both oceans, against any possible combinations concerting action against us. Our aim always must be to have forces sufficient to enable us to have complete freedom of action in either ocean while retaining forces in the other ocean for effective defense of our vital security. 16 at Oahu the Japs were revising Secretary Knox's report, and now the crestfallen secretary was obliged to call Roosevelt and make some emendations. Mr. President, Knox began, it looks like the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. No. Roosevelt is supposed to have cried. 17 The reaction would suggest that he was surprised. CF. pp. 99, 132 36. CF. pp. 99, 132. CF. p. 160. CF. p. 390. Note 7. CF. P. 184. CF. P. 188. Section CF. Pages 192 to 94, 197. Vertical bar CF. P. 190. Pilgro CF. PP. 183, 198, 222. CF. Pages 196 to 97, 275, 76, p. 400, note 56. Chapter 2 Mount Nyataka, the night of December 5, 1941. The Japanese naval radio sent the code message, Climb Mount Nyataka. That message meant war. One to the first Japanese air fleet, 800 miles north of Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands. It meant that there was no turning back. To Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, the fleet commander, it conveyed the order to attack Pearl Harbor with his carrier planes at dawn the second day following. Adm. Nagumo put on full steam, and all that night, all the next day, and all the second night his powerful task force forged southward at force draft. At 6 a.m. December 7, the Japanese striking force, then 200 miles north of Oahu, began launching its planes from six carriers, the Kaga, Akagi, Haru, Soru, Shikaku, and Zuikaku. The planes, 351 in all, 2 took off in three waves. All had cleared the flight decks by 7.15. They rendezvoused to the south and then flew in for coordinated attacks on Pearl Harbor and the Hawaiian airfields. The first air fleet had left Hitokapu Bay, Itarofu Island, in the southernmost part of the Isles, at 9 a.m., November 26, Japan time, 1.30 p.m., November 25, Hawaii time. The striking force, commanded by Adm. Nagumo, consisted of 27 warships, the six carriers, two battleships, the Hiwa and Kairishima, two heavy cruisers, the Tone and Shikama, one light cruiser, the Abukama, and 16 destroyers. Eleven vessels were in the supplely train. The Japanese Sixth Fleet, under command of Vice Admiral Mitsumi Shimazu, formed an advance expeditionary force. His fleet consisted of two light cruisers, the Ishizu and Yura, one training light cruiser, the Kateri, 20 submarines, 5 midget submarines of 45 tons, with a range of only 200 miles, and 6 vessels of the fleet train. The plan of attack had originally been proposed early in January, 1941, by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander-in-chief of the combined Imperial fleets. Rear Admiral Takijiro Anishi, Chief of Staff of the 11th Air Fleet, had been ordered by Yamamoto at that time to study the requirements of such an operation. It is not to be supposed from these facts that Japan even then was committed to war with the United States. The United States, 
as is now known, had also prepared war plans which were to be executed upon the decision to go to war, and at one stage, by the statement of former Secretary of War Stimson, even meditated a sneak attack such as the Japanese carried out at Pearl Harbor. The basic Japanese plan for an attack upon Pearl Harbor had been evolving ever since 1931. Its theoretical possibilities had been explored by all graduates of the Japanese Naval Academy, who, each year were asked on the final examination, how would you carry out a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor? Three ironically, however, it was the United States Naval Planning Board which helped the Japs perfect the plan. In 1932, an American battle force assembled in the Pacific to test Pearl Harbor's defenses. One section of it was to attack, while the other, with coast artillery, a division of troops, 100 planes, and a number of submarines, was to defend the naval base. The attacking force, commanded by Admiral Harry E. Yarnell, an air-minded officer who had made many flights with his squadrons, unusual in the Navy of that day, revolutionized naval strategy by leaving behind all his battleships and cruisers and using only two aircraft carriers, the Lexington and Saratoga, and four destroyers. This was the first appearance of a new naval grouping, afterward to be known as a task force. When 24 hours off Oahu the attacking force encountered heavy weather. This, from Adam. Yarnell's viewpoint, was all to the good, for the weather conditions made it less probable that the sure defenders, on the lookout for a great invasion fleet, would spot so small a flotilla. By the evening of February 6, a Saturday, Adam. Yarnell's force was in a position to reach Oahu by dawn. Yarnell surmised that if he attacked early on Sunday morning the defenders would be less alert than usual. Thirty minutes before dawn on February 7, when the carriers had approached within 60 miles of Oahu after a forced run all night, they launched 152 aircraft, bombers, fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo planes. Yarnell's planes, coming in from the northeast, exactly as the Japs were to do nine years later, were undetected until they darted out of the clouds into clear weather over Pearl Harbor. Simulated machine gun fire theoretically destroyed all defending planes on the ground. Not one got into the air during the attack. All of the hypothetical vessels in the harbor were sunk. Japanese observers watched the maneuver and forwarded full details to Tokyo. It was evident that Yarnell's maneuver had upset all existing naval concepts. Some American officers who participated later in the critiques when the lessons of the operation were evaluated argued that the Navy should be reorganized so that the striking force of the fleet should be built around its air arm, and the battleship and other surface craft relegated to the subordinate mission of protecting the air striking force and its carriers. As might be expected, the battleship admirals opposed, and, inasmuch as they held the positions of power in the naval hierarchy, they won. It was left for Japan to adopt Yarnell's brilliant concept. For in late August, 1941, Adam. Yamamoto ordered all fleet commanders and key staff members to Tokyo for war games, preliminary to a final formulation of plans for a Pacific campaign which comprehended a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in the event of war. Between September 1st and 12th, the outline of a basic plan of operations was drafted at the Naval War College in Tokyo. As early as October 5th, part of the attack plan was revealed to officer pilots of the task force who had been called together aboard the carrier Akagi in Shikishi Bay. About 100 pilots who were present were told of the design to strike the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Adam. Yamamoto informed them that although Japan never wanted to fight the United States, the Japanese were forced to do so or they would be defeated regardless. American aid to China and the American embargo on oil shipments to Japan, the Admiral said, were seriously affecting the progress of the Imperial arms in the China War. Yamamoto predicted to the pilots that the United States fleet would take two or three years to recover from the intended attack and that meanwhile Japan would occupy Sumatra. Java, and other territories from which critically needed materials could be extracted. The Admiral described the American fleet as Japan's greatest enemy. 
Premier Prince Kono's cabinet failed, so it was announced, to agree on national policy, and, upon Kono's resignation October 16, War Minister Tojo received the Imperial Command to form a new cabinet. The war party was now fully in control, and, although there was still a prospect of settling American differences with Japan, Tojo was taking no chances. On October 17, without even waiting to form his cabinet, he issued orders for the 1st and 2nd squadrons of the 6th Fleet's submarines to put to sea. This force represented some 14 of the submarines which were to be a part of ADM. Shimizu's advance expeditionary force in the Pearl Harbor operation. That night they left Kure under cover of darkness and advanced to Kwajalein, in the Marshall Islands, where they found the cruiser Kateri. Fearing discovery, the flotillas dispersed temporarily to nearby Wat and Malilap, in the Marshalls. On November 4, Combined Fleet Top Secret Operation Order No. 1 was promulgated to all fleet and task force commanders. It provided for subsequent designation of Y Day as the approximate date for the attack on Pearl Harbor, and of X Day as the actual date for execution. Operation Order No. 2, issued by Yamamoto November 6, set Y Day as December 7, Hawaii time. On November 13, Yamamoto ordered the Pearl Harbor attacking force to assemble in Hitokapu Bay and remain there until November 22, taking on supplies. On November 21, Admiral Ozami Nagano, Chief of the Naval General Staff, instructed Yamamoto that fleet units in Hitokapu Bay might use force if they encountered any interference from British, Dutch, or American forces, but later the same day he amended the order in certain significant respects. Nagano's revised order read If American Japanese negotiations are successful, forces will be ordered back immediately. Use of force mentioned above will be limited to three cases, if American, Dutch, or British surface forces appear in Japanese waters for reconnaissance, if same forces approach Japanese sea waters and jeopardize our forces, if aggressive action is taken by same forces outside Japanese territorial waters. This was still far from reflecting an assumption that war was bound to ensue. It indicated that Japan was hopeful that some diplomatic compromise would enable a showdown to be avoided. By then, however, the hands of the clock of diplomacy were approaching midnight. On November 24, the order was issued by Yamamoto to the striking force to leave Hitokapu Bay the following day and proceed in secret to Hawaiian waters. The order read A. The task force keeping its movements strictly secret and maintaining close guard against submarines and aircraft, shall advance into Hawaiian waters and, upon the very opening of hostilities, shall attack the main force of the United States fleet in Hawaii and deal it a mortal blow. The first air raid is planned for dawn of X day, exact date to be given by later order. Upon completion of the air raid the task force, keeping close coordination and guarding against enemy counterattack, shall speedily leave the enemy waters and then return to Japan. b. Should it appear certain that Japanese-American negotiations will reach an amicable settlement prior to the commencement of hostile action, all the forces of the combined fleet are to be ordered to reassemble and return to their bases. c. The task force shall leave Hitokapu Bay on the morn of the 26th of November, Japan time, the 25th of November, Hawaii time and advance to 42 degrees in, and 170 degrees e. Standing by position, on the afternoon of the 4th of December, Japan time, the 3rd of December, Hawaii time, and speedily complete refueling. The task force stood out to sea on November 25th and cruised eastward at 13 knots, held down by the low speed of the supply vessels. Lookouts were posted but no searches or combat air patrols were flown. It had been calculated that North Pacific weather would cause difficulty in refueling at sea, so those ships whose capacity was small were loaded with oil and drums for emergency use. The weather, however, proved calm, and fueling from the tankers was carried out as planned. The progress of the striking force was skillfully covered by a barrage of false warship call signs, padding of radio circuits, 
and similar deceptive tactics to simulate the presence of the principal carriers and carrier air groups in the inland sea. So successful was this program that in his intelligence roundup for December 1st Vice Admiral Theodore S. Wilkinson, Chief of Naval Intelligence, said of Japanese fleet dispositions, major capital ship strength remains in home waters, as well as the greatest portion of the carriers. This estimate could not have been more misleading to the fleet and army commanders in Hawaii. In order further to allay American suspicions, Premier Gen. Tojo announced that the Osama Maru would be sent to repatriate Jap presidents in Malaya and British Borneo, and that the Tatsuta Maru would touch at Mexico to bring Japanese nationals back from the United States. The captain of the Tatsuta Maru had orders to take an eastward course in North Pacific waters, and, on reaching 180 degrees longitude, to turn southward. On the morning of the attack at Oahu his ship was back off Chosi, Japan. Meanwhile, Japanese spies in Hawaii were busy feeding back reports to Tokyo on the movements and disposition of the American fleet. Although American intelligence was intercepting Tokyo's instructions to the spies, together with the responses of these agents, the intelligence chiefs of our army and navy later professed to see nothing alarming in Japan's preoccupation with the berthing of the Pacific Fleet. Twice after its departure from Hitokapu Bay the Jap striking force received code messages from Tokyo giving dispositions of the fleet in Pearl Harbor. The second of these was received three days before the attack. In addition, an officer aboard the Akagi was detailed to listen to Honolulu broadcasts and decode them for last-minute information on fleet movements in and out of Pearl Harbor. A broadcast that the German attaché has lost one dog would mean that a carrier had left the harbor. If the attaché wanted a cook or a houseboy, that would mean that a battleship or a cruiser had entered. The War Council in Tokyo had recognized December 7 as suitable for attack. Tuesday. December 9, was also considered suitable for a dawn attack, because it would then be the dark of the moon. It was expected, however, that the Pacific Fleet, in accordance with its custom during maneuvers, would enter the harbor on Friday and leave on Monday. Adam. Yarnell's plan, moreover, had demonstrated that conditions on a Sunday were propitious for attack. Therefore, Sunday was chosen. Another consideration favoring an attack on Sunday around 8 a.m. was, in the view of Adam Nagano, that American officers were inclined to sleep late on Sunday morning. 5 On December 1 an Imperial Naval Order fixed X day, stating that hostile action against the United States shall be commenced on 7 December. This order thereby confirmed the date originally fixed in the wide day order of November 6. On December 2, however, Nagano again inquired if the fleet could be recalled in the event of a belated settlement being reached in the Washington negotiations. He was assured by Yamamoto that it could. Six that same day, Adam. Yamamoto fixed Tora as the code word by which the attacking fleet would signal a successful outcome. Upon receipt of the order setting December 7 as X day, all ships in the Japanese striking force were darkened and conditioned to second degree of readiness gun crews stationed, was ordered. On December 4 the rendezvous point about 2,350 miles east of Tokyo and 1,460 miles northwest of Pearl Harbor was reached. The combat ships of the fleet fueled to capacity from the tankers, which were dropped that night. The task force then turned southeast at increased speed. The carriers Haru and Soru, whose fuel capacity was small, had been oiled daily while in company of the tankers and now had to be fueled by bucket brigade from the oiled drums taken on board. The crews from the beginning had been uneventful. The route lay beyond the patrol sweeps of any American land-based planes. The Great Circle route through the vast and lonely North Pacific, between Midway and the Aleutians, was far from the commercial ship lanes and well out of waters which American patrol ships might be expected to prowl. No ships or planes had been sighted and no false alarms had been sounded. Although the progress of the task force was unexpectedly smooth, the Japs were fearful of failure almost to the last. According to an official United States Navy account, the striking force, 
if detected before X-2 day, was to withdraw without executing the attack. In the event of being discovered on X-1 day, the question of whether to make an attack or to return would have been decided in accordance with local conditions and at Adam. Negumo's discretion. If contact had been made at sea with the main body of the United States fleet, the JAP operational plan called for a reserve group of heavy naval units to sortie from the inland sea of Japan to support the carrier striking force in a decisive engagement. The Japanese assumed that, with 180 or more combat vessels in the Pacific as against 102 warships in the United States Pacific Fleet, their numerical superiority would be sufficient to bring them victory. While the pilot and officer personnel of Adam Negumo's fleet knew the objective was Pearl Harbor, the crews of the six carriers thought until the day before the assault that they were on a training cruise. When the men noticed that the bows were heading east, According to the account of Captain Michi Fukida, commander of the flight groups aboard the carriers, they began to wonder and speculate. On December 3 the fleet personnel learned that Japan might enter the war and the men became kind of excited, but they calmed down when given the order to attack. 7 On the night of December 5 the task force received the Mount Nyataka code signal. The run in toward Hawaii the night of December the 6th to the 7th was made at top speed, 26 knots. At 5 a.m. two zero reconnaissance planes were launched to survey Pearl Harbor and Lahaina Anchorage. They reached their destination an hour before the arrival of the attack planes from the Japanese carriers, reported that the fleet was in and completed their mission without having been detected. On the night before the attack the 20 large submarines of Adam Shimizu's advance expeditionary force had reached the waters in the vicinity of Pearl Harbor under orders not to attack until the carrier planes had made their assault. The five midget submarines were launched from specially fitted fleet submarines between 50 and 100 miles off Pearl Harbor as a special attacking force. Their task was to prevent the escape of the American fleet through the harbor entrance during the air raid, but two actually entered Pearl Harbor before the attack. One of these made an extensive reconnaissance and probably reported back to the fleet by radio. Planes were launched from the large submarines after the attack to survey the extent of the damage. The operation plan provided that if the American fleet was virtually destroyed, one Japanese submarine division or less would be placed between Hawaii and the west coast of the United States to destroy sea traffic. In fact, at least one submarine was dispatched to the Oregon coast about December 14, where there was taken into consideration. Most of the winter the trade wind in Hawaii blows steadily from the northeast against the 2,800 foot cool hour range, where it discharges its moisture. An air force which escapes being picked up by detection apparatus can approach hidden in the towering wall of rain clouds and then emerge suddenly into clear weather over Pearl Harbor before defending planes can rise to intercept. Adam. Yarnell's attacking force in 1932 had taken advantage of these conditions, and the Japs also counted on this cover. The weather at Pearl Harbor on December 7 was officially logged by the Navy as averaging partly cloudy, with clouds mostly over the mountains. Cloud base at 3,500 feet, visibility good. Wind north, 10 knots. These conditions favored a surprise attack. The planes bearing the rising sun were screened by the cumulus banks over the mountains until the aircraft were ready to split up and make predetermined approaches on their targets. The Japanese had expected to lose 33% of all participating units. Specifically, they thought they would lose at least one Akagi class carrier and one Sora class carrier. They also expected to lose all of the midget submarines, whose personnel had been prepared for death and were correct in this estimate. Eight, no attempt was made preliminary to the attack to reckon probable losses in planes, but losses were far less than even the most optimistic estimate could have suggested. Only 27 aircraft failed to return to the carriers. At no time was a landing in Hawaii contemplated. The Japanese high command believed that a landing operation would involve insuperable problems in logistics. 
troop transports and cargo vessels carrying the huge volume of supplies necessary to sustain an expeditionary force would have required a great convoy, while the progress of the striking force would have been held to the pace of the slowest vessel. If speed were sacrificed, it was thought unlikely that surprise could be achieved. The Japanese thought it impossible to follow up the air raid with a landing in less than a month. They apparently had underestimated the damage they would inflict and did not know how ill prepared Hawaii was to resist a landing in strength following closely upon an attack. After the surrender of Japan, Captain Ryonosuke Imamura, Secretary of the Naval Ministry, said, we had expected a much greater defense at so important a base. We were amazed. Our fleet was told to bomb and leave. We had no troops with which to make a landing. If we had, perhaps we could have taken Hawaii, but we had no plan to do so. 9 On the first anniversary of the attack, Secretary Knox asserted that the Japanese could have returned and taken Hawaii. 10 The statement must be regarded with a certain skepticism, inasmuch as Knox advanced it in justification of the concealment of American losses for a full year. Major General Walter C. Short, commander of Army forces in Hawaii in 1941, estimated five years afterward that Japan would have required a force of 200,000 men to have taken Hawaii, and thought that, even so, the operation could have been successfully brought off only if the American fleet were not present to help defend the island. 11 The Pearl Harbor attack was executed by Japan for the purpose of immobilizing the American fleet while the Japs expanded southward, and his fleet, in the opinion of Adam. Nagano, achieved far greater success on this mission than had been expected. 12 General George C. Marshall, wartime chief of staff, later testified. If the attack had been repulsed successfully, the Japanese would have had to proceed more conservatively. Instead of striking south, to Malaya and the Dutch Indies, without protecting their lines of communication from flank attacks, they would not have dared to proceed as they did, a major part of the United States fleet would still have been in effective condition. 13 There were other and graver mistakes in Japanese strategy than failure to attempt to seize Hawaii. One was in the selection of the very targets at Pearl Harbor. The Japs went after our battleships. In order to carry out that attack without hindrance, they also went after the planes parked on the Hawaii airdromes. Planes are easily replaced, especially types which are obsolete or obsolescent, as most of those at Pearl Harbor were. The battleships which were knocked out were so old as to be of slight value. The records show that during the entire course of the Pacific War battleships fired at other surface craft on only four occasions. 14 After the war Rear Admiral Husband D. Kimmel, who was in command of the Pacific Fleet on December 7, said that proper Japanese strategy would have knocked the fleet out of action for a long time even if there had been no ships in harbor that day to attack. He said even if they had not sunk a ship the Japs might have crippled the base and destroyed all the fleet's fuel supplies, which were in the open. The result might have been worse than it actually was, because this would have forced the fleet to return to the west coast. As it was, our fuel was left intact at Hawaii and the base could still be used. 15 He added that the Japs failed to immobilize the fleet because his three carriers and most of his fast cruisers, the most valuable vessels of his command, were not in harbor. 16 Vice Adam. W. W. Smith, Chief of Staff to Kimmel, said that the attack upon the fleet was Japan's greatest mistake. The Japs, he said, knocked out only battleships, which were of less value than the two carriers which were at sea and escaped damage. Adam. Smith said that the Japs could have crippled the Pacific fleet for months if they had destroyed the oil supplies and machine shops at Hawaii instead of the battleships. By doing so, he said, the base would have been rendered untenable. 17 Adm. Raymond de Spruance, the present commander in chief of the Pacific fleet, said that the attack demonstrated that the Japs did not appreciate sea power as an offensive weapon. Instead of following up his initial successes, said Spruance, the enemy diverted the navy, which then far outclassed ours, to the southwest Pacific. The Japanese might have won a quick and decisive victory had the base at Pearl Harbor been smashed.
18 Another error was the failure of the Japs to seize Midway Island in the first days of the war. They contented themselves with shelling Midway the night of December 7, but the defending garrison scored three hits on a destroyer with shore guns and at least two on a cruiser before the attacking force withdrew. If the Japanese wanted to take Midway, they would have found the island's defenses at their weakest in the first few days or few weeks after Pearl Harbor. But not until six months later did Japan make a serious effort to seize the island, and by then it was too late. The crushing defeat imposed upon the Imperial fleet in the Battle of Midway, June 4 to 6, 1942, was a turning point in the war and one of the decisive battles of history. After the attack upon Pearl Harbor, the Japanese striking force was under orders to withdraw from Hawaiian waters with all possible speed. All except 27 planes returned safely to their carrier decks between 10:30 a.m. and 1:30 p.m and the task force withdrew to the northwest. The carriers, according to the flight group commander, Captain Fukida, had intended to bomb Midway on the homeward journey, but changed plans because the weather grew bad. On the way back to Japan, Fukida said, two carriers left the fleet to assault Wake Island, which fell to a Japanese landing force on the evening of December 22. After a 15-day siege, the remainder of the Pearl Harbor striking force returned to Japan by a circuitous course, arriving at Kure on December 22. Japanese officers said that there was no particular excitement or celebrations aboard the ships, but that the pilots had a good drink after returning to their carriers. Any celebrations which might have seemed in order would, in any event, have been short-lived. Four of the carriers which attacked Pearl Harbor, the cargo. Akagi, Soaring, and Heru were sunk six months later in the Battle of Midway. The Shikaku was sunk in the Battle of the West Marianas, and the Zuikaku in the Second Battle of the Philippine Sea. Fukida said he believed that he was the only flyer from the sneak attack group who survived the war. C.F. Pages 294-96. C.F. P. 262. Chapter 3 The Rising Sun on Wednesday, December 3, the carrier Enterprise, commanded by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr., was some 1,900 miles west of Pearl Harbor. She was the flagship of a task force consisting of three heavy cruisers and nine destroyers. The force had left Pearl Harbor November 28 to deliver a dozen Marine fighter pilots in Grum and Wildcats to Wake Island. The pilots had received such short notice of their departure that some had reported aboard with only the clothes they were wearing. Halsey had enjoined radio silence and sailed with his ships darkened. Not until the second day out did the task force learn that its destination was Wake. On December 3 the Marines went into Ick and the Enterprise turned and headed back toward Pearl Harbor. Navy pilots aboard the carrier were flying scouting missions in all directions from the ship. A young officer aboard the Enterprise who was keeping an unofficial log noted, Vogt says he saw a large fleet at the end of his scouting leg, but it was hazy and his tanks were low, so he isn't sure. Some imagination. One whatever pilot Henson John H. L. Vogt, Jr., saw through the overcast will never be known. He may have sighted the main Jap striking force en route to Pearl Harbor. If so, it was far off its charted course. He may have seen part of Adam. Shimizu's advance expeditionary force, although that seems equally unlikely. He may have seen other Jap fleet units advancing for the attack on Wake. Because of radio silence, no report of Vogt's statement was sent to Pearl Harbor. At dawn on December 7 Vogt took off from the Enterprise and flew into a formation of enemy planes attacking Pearl Harbor. He was killed. There were other portents that something was afoot. The cruiser Boise, convoying American merchantmen 3,400 miles from Pearl Harbor, to the northeast of Guam sighted a darkened ship at about 16,000 yards on the night of November 27. The Boise challenged, but received no reply. On the following night the cruiser again sighted a darkened ship, hull down, at 5.33 pm she appeared to be Atago type, a class of Jap cruiser. 
The log stated dot battle stations were manned and the boys' speed and course changed on each occasion, but the identity of the strange ships was never confirmed, nor was any other action taken. The vessels sighted were 1,400 miles off the reported course taken by the Jap task force bound for Pearl Harbor. No report was radioed to the fleet base. Two on the night of December 6, the aircraft tender right sighted another unidentified ship without lights west of Hawaii, but again made no report because of orders to keep radio silence. The right, a unit of Halsey's task force, challenged the strange vessel between 8 p.m. and midnight, but the ship did not respond and slipped out of sight. It was later surmised that the vessel may have been a Japanese submarine. Three Navy Department records provide another mystery. On December 5, an American patrol ship was operating north of Hawaii directly in the path of the Jap striking force. The Navy's chart of ship locations for the following day omitted the patrol ship and no accounting has ever been made for its disappearance. For while all of these incidents together might have suggested some event out of the ordinary, they were not reported to Pearl Harbor before the attack. Other contacts made by naval ships in the fleet operating area about Pearl Harbor in the early morning hours of December 7 were reported. The first of these was made at 3.58 a.m., when the minesweeper Condor flashed a blinker signal to the destroyer ward that a suspicious object, believed to be a submarine, had been detected in the darkness westward of her sweep area. Five Lieutenant William W. Outerbridge, commanding the ward, sounded general quarters and combed a wide pattern for nearly an hour, but found nothing. Outerbridge returned to his bunk and Lieutenant, J. G. O. W. Gopner, a reservist from the Northwestern University Naval R. O. T. C took over as officer of the deck. At 6.37 a.m. Gopner awakened out a bridge and pointed out a submarine conning tower between the ward and the target ship Antares, towing her off to Pearl Harbor. A Navy PBY, returning from patrol, dropped a smoke bomb to mark the submarine's location. The silhouette of the conning tower was unfamiliar, and for a good reason. This was one of them. Shimizu's midget subs. At 6.45 the ward, on Gopner's order, opened fire from its number one gun in the bow. Number three gun from the waist then opened up and, at point blank range of 75 yards, scored with its first shot, striking the conning tower. The ward followed up with four depth charges dropped in pattern, but the number three gun had done for the sub. At 651, it was adjudged sunk, and outer bridge radioed Pearl Harbor. We have dropped depth charges upon sub operating in defensive area. In order to underscore this startling intelligence, Outer Bridge two minutes later sent a second message We have attacked, fired upon, and dropped depth charges upon a submarine operating in the defensive area. The operator at Bishop's Point Naval Radio Station acknowledged receipt. Six This was a full hour before the Japanese air attack on Pearl Harbor. Two messages which should have warned the forces ashore had already been dispatched, and a third report was now radioed by the PBY flying boat which had circled overhead. This message was received by Comdr. Nefla McGuinness, commander of patrol wing 1 at Canyo Naval Air Station. Alarmed lest an American submarine had been sunk, McGuinness was still checking up an hour later when planes bearing the rising sun insignia came in and shot up every one of his flying boats in the bay or on the ramps. Only three patrol planes still in the air escaped this first attack, and one was badly shot up in landing. Seven Outer Bridges message was received at 7.12 a.m. or earlier by the Pearl Harbor Base Watch Officer who immediately notified his chief of staff. No change to a higher condition of readiness, however, was ordered as a result of the report. The Army Board of Inquiry which investigated the disaster in 1944 observed, this was one of the most important of a succession of mistakes made during this fateful morning. The Navy admits that it did not advise Gen. Short as it should have done. Eight meanwhile, the ward, inbound to Pearl Harbor, sighted a motor-driven sampan which had no business in the restricted area. As the destroyer charged down upon this craft, three Japanese came to the rail, 
two with their hands in the air and the third waving a white flag. These were the attitudes of surrender. They suggested war. The sampan was taken in tow by a coast guard cutter, but no further warning was dispatched to shore. Nine. There was at least one other episode at sea which justified an all-out alert if word had been passed to the base. While the Enterprise was still 200 miles from Pearl Harbor, it launched its planes to fly into Oahu. One of the flyers who took off was Ensign Manuel Gonzalez, of Bombing Squadron 6. Somewhere the fringe of the flight intercepted the course of the Japanese attacking formation. Back on the carrier listeners heard the cry of Gonzalez over the radio, Don't shoot. This is an American plane. That was all. He was shot down. Again no warning was radioed to the fleet base. Ten assure there was a still more inexplicable failure. The Army radar aircraft warning system had been operating between 4 o'clock and 7 a.m., the hour when the stations were to shut down on December 7. Two privates, Joseph E. Elliott and Joseph L. Lockard, were manning the station at Opana, on Kuaku Point, clear across Oahu from Pearl Harbor, at the extreme north of the island. Lockard was operating the detector and Elliot was plotting the information. Between 6.45 and 6.59 a.m. Lockard and Elliot spotted 10 or more unidentified planes northeast of Hawaii and 100 miles or less distant. Elliot's recollection four years later was that these planes had been reported to the Army Information Center Comma 11 which that morning was in charge of Lieutenant Kermit A. Tyler, an Air Corps pursuit officer, but if there were no action was taken. When it was time for the two privates to go off duty, Elliot asked that the station be kept open for further operation after 7 a.m., so that he might learn to operate the detector. Lockard acquiesced and, while adjusting the machine to begin the instruction, noticed on the radar screen an unusual formation, suggesting the approach of a large number of planes. These unknown planes, picked up at 7.02 a.m., were 137 miles distant and approaching Oahu from 3 degrees east of north. 12 Lockard reported the discovery within seven minutes to the information center. Tyler was absent at the moment, but the switchboard operator located him, and Tyler, within two or three minutes, was listening to Lockard's report. Tyler's answer, the Army Board report stated, was disastrous. He said, in substance, forget it. Tyler's position is indefensible in his action, for he says that he was merely there for training and had no knowledge upon which to base any action, yet he assumed to give directions instead of seeking someone competent to make a decision. 30 Not only did Tyler fail to act, but the army neglected until two days after the attack to inform Adam Kimmel of recording the approach of the attacking force by radar. This threw Navy search planes completely off the track when they attempted to trail the Jap striking force. The search planes made their sweeps to the south and southwest, not knowing that the enemy planes had come in from the north. 14 Meanwhile, Lockhart and Elliott continued to follow and plot the approaching aircraft until they came within 20 miles of Oahu at about 7.35 a.m., when radar reception failed. From 15 to 20 minutes later the first enemy planes appeared over Hawaiian airfields and burst through the clouds upon the Pearl Harbor base. Tyler's subsequent explanation was that he believed that Lockhart and Elliott had picked up a flight of 12 B-17s which he knew were coming in from Hamilton Field, California. 15 Some of these planes did, in fact, arrive during the attack and were destroyed by the Japanese. But Tyler's defense took no account of the fact that if these had been the planes spotted by the two privates, they would have been flying 200 miles off their course at the time the formation was reported from Opana. The greatest error of all, however, was that the Army garrison and fleet base had not been alerted properly against attack. The Army on November 27 had put into effect its alert number one defense against sabotage and uprisings no threat from without. This was farthest removed from an all-out war footing of any of its three degrees of alert. 16 The Navy had instituted its number three condition of readiness, 
providing a means of opening fire with a portion of the anti-aircraft and secondary batteries in case of surprise encounter. This was the minimum degree of readiness possible under its three standing classifications.17 These limited conditions of readiness were in response to orders from higher authority in Washington and represented what the field commanders thought was required of them, but neither the Army nor Navy in Hawaii was prepared on December 7 to cope with a determined surprise attack in force. The Army's preparations against sabotage, in particular, played into the hands of the Japs, all of its planes, with a few exceptions, were lined up wing to wing, in order that they might be more easily guarded by a cordon of sentries. They presented a perfect target for bombs and machine gun bullets. The situation prevailing December 7 under the conditions of readiness in effect was thus summarized by the Army Board. No distant reconnaissance was being conducted by the Navy, the usual four or five PBYs were not out. The anti-aircraft artillery was not out on its usual Sunday maneuvers with the fleet air arm, the naval carriers with their planes were at a distance from Oahu on that Sunday, the aircraft were on the ground, were parked, both Army and Navy, closely adjacent to one another, the fleet was in the harbor with the exception of Task Forces 9 and 12, which included some cruisers, destroyers, and the two carriers Lexington and Enterprise. Ammunition for the Army was with the exception of that near the fixed anti-aircraft guns, in ordnance storehouses, and the two combat divisions as well as the anti-aircraft artillery were in their permanent quarters and not in battle positions. Everything was concentrated in close confines by reason of the, Army's, anti-sabotage alert number one. This made of them easy targets for an air attack. In short, Everything that was done made the situation perfect for an air attack and the Japanese took full advantage of it. 18 In addition to sending reconnaissance planes over Pearl Harbor one hour before the arrival of their attacking planes, the Japanese resorted to submarine reconnaissance for last minute information. The log of a Japanese two man submarine showed that the craft entered the harbor and made a complete run around Ford Island. Entry apparently was effected about 4.10 a.m., when the submarine net across the harbor mouth was open to permit a garbage scout to leave the harbor. The submarine commander roughed in the ships at their berths as well as he could in the uncertain pre-dawn light, but he failed to identify a single vessel correctly. He completed the circuit of the harbor at 4.30 and turned down the channel for the open sea. The submarine net had been opened again at 4.58 to permit the entrance of two minesweepers and remained open until 8.40, when it was closed by order as a result of the attack, so the submarine had no difficulty in getting out of the harbor.19 because the plottings of fleet units in harbor and the positions they occupied, as shown on the map of the submarine commander varied considerably from the ships actually in harbor December 7 and their true locations. There has been disagreement as to whether the submarine made its run in the hours directly preceding the attack, or on some day before December 7.20 Rear Adam. T. B. Ingalls, Chief of Naval Intelligence, doubted in 1945 that the submarine ever entered the harbor. He said there was confusion in translating the Japanese present and future tenses, and that the log may have shown what the Jap commander intended to do rather than what he had done.21 The Admiral's statement, however, fails to explain why the Jap officer, if he never made the harbor circuit, wrote at one point on his chart, I saw it with my own eyes, when he thought he had located the aircraft carrier Saratoga. 22 The carrier which he had erroneously identified was in reality the old battleship Utah, which had been stripped and converted into a target ship. The fact that it later received special attention from Jap Reading planes suggests that the enemy submarine not only did to a harbor, but communicated its findings by radio to the attacking force. Another Japanese sub was indisputably in Pearl Harbor on December 7. It entered some time after the anti submarine net was opened at 4.58. At 8.35 a.m., 40 minutes after the attack had begun, it came up for a look. Half a dozen ships opened fire on the conning tower, and the craft was finished off when it was rammed and depth charged by the destroyer Monaghan after surfacing under her bows. Later, 
the submarine, with its crew of two still inside, was used as part of the fill-in for a new landside pier at the Pearl Harbor Submarine Base. 23 The submarine believed to have made the circuit of Ford Island later ran on a reef in the open sea near Bellows Field, southeast of Kaneoa Bay. While it was stuck on the reef, a bomb dropped from a Navy plane knocked the submarine over to the other side of the reef. Gen. Short later said that Army troops threw a rope around the craft and pulled it ashore, capturing both members of the crew, 24. But Army intelligence four years after the attack acknowledged the capture only of the commander, Sub Lieutenant Kazuo Sakamaki. 25. The remainder of the five enemy midget craft all were lost as was confirmed by a subsequent Japanese citation granting posthumous promotion to all ten men of the crews. 26 Sunrise was at 6.26 a.m. on December 7 at Pearl Harbor. 27 At least three civilian planes were in the air early. Roy Vitozek, a lawyer, suddenly found himself in formation with strange planes. Cornelia Fort, a civilian instructor, was aloft with a student. James Duncan, member of a flying club, was taking a lesson from Thomas Bommelin, a commercial pilot. All three planes got down safely under pelting Jap machine gun fire. The attacking force made three approaches. One group from the north came directly across the island, attacking the Army's Wheeler Field on its way to assault Pearl Harbor. A second force from the east attacked the Navy's Canio Bay flying boat base, the Bellows Field Army Airdrome and Pearl Harbor. The third Japanese force made its approach from the south, attacking Pearl Harbor and Hickam Field, the adjacent Army Air Field. The Marine Air Base at Uwa Plantation was destroyed, apparently by the force which darted in from the east on Kanyo Air Station. The enemy opened fire at Kanyo about 7.50am.28 Five minutes later the attack hit Pearl Harbor. At Kanyo the Japs knocked out 27 flying boats and an observation plane. At Ford Island Naval Air Station 26 planes were destroyed on the ground, 19 patrol bombers, 3 scout bombers, and 4 fighters. Only 3 planes were later able to take to the air from Ford Island. At Uwa, the Marine Air Base, 9 fighters, 18 scout bombers, 3 utility planes, 2 transport and one training plane, 33, were destroyed. 29 at Hickam Field the Japs destroyed 4 B-17 bombers, 12 B-18 bombers, and 2 A-20 light bombers, 18 planes. 40 pursuit and 2 observation planes were destroyed at Wheeler Field, and an observation plane and 2 pursuit aircraft at Bellows Field. 11 planes of scouting squadron 8 which had flown in from the Enterprise were shot down over Pearl Harbor, and of 18 dive bombers which left the carrier and flew into the attack 5 were lost. 10 of the 16 carrier planes lost were believed to have been shot down or forced to crash by anti-aircraft fire from American guns. 30 The Hawaiian airfields were hit first in order to eliminate any possible interference in the air. The attack was concentrated on the aprons where the planes were parked, upon hangars, and upon repair shops. Almost 200 American aircraft were lost. 31 Only a few fighter aircraft at the Army's remote Haley War Field, which was apparently unknown to the Japs, escaped the enemy attack. A squadron was practicing short landings there on Sunday morning. 32 Two flights, each consisting of four P 40s and one obsolescent P 36, got into the air from this field to engage the Japs in combat. Major then 2nd Lt. George S. Welch and his wingman, 2nd Lt. Kenneth M. Taylor, both got their planes off the ground from Haley Wa, Welch shooting down 4 enemy planes and Taylor 2. Enemy planes appeared over the Pearl Harbor Fleet Base at 7.55 a.m., just as the morning signal flag was being broken out from the signal tower atop the Navy Yard water tank, calling for morning colors to rise in 5 minutes. From the tower all of Pearl Harbor was spread out before the signalman. That morning there were 94 ships in harbor, 8 battleships, 2 heavy cruisers, 6 light cruisers, 29 destroyers, 5 submarines, 1 gunboat, 8 destroyer mine layers, 1 mine layer, 
4 destroyer minesweepers, 6 minesweepers, and 24 auxiliaries. 33 The battleship Pennsylvania was in dry dock number 1 with the destroyers Cassin and Downs. To the left, in dry dock number 2, was the destroyer Sure. The light cruiser Helena was moored alongside 1010 dock, with the mine layer Oglala moored outboard of her. The light cruiser Honolulu was in one of the yard berths to the northeast of the Helena. In Battleship Row, on the south side of Ford Island, were drawn up in order the California, then Neosho, a 21,000 ton oiler, the Oklahoma and Maryland, tied up in a bear, the West Virginia and Tennessee, also bared, the Arizona and 9,400 ton repair ship Vestal, with the Arizona in board, and, finally, the Nevada. On the north side of the island were moored the light cruiser Raleigh and the target ship Utah, with the seaplane tender Curtis across from the Utah, off a peninsula point. Dot of these 19 ships, only the Neosho came through the Japanese attack unscathed. Dot most of the damage, both to aircraft and ships, was done in the first few minutes of the attack, which was over in one hour and fifty minutes. The attack developed in the following rough phases, I. 7.55 to 8.25 a.m. combined torpedo plane and dive bomber attack. 2. 8.25 to 8.40. Comparative lull. 3. 8.40 to 9.15. Horizontal bomber attack. 4. 9.15 to 9.45 dive bomber attacks. V. 9.45. Waning of attack and completion of raid. 3421 planes took part in the initial torpedo attack, covered by 30 dive bombers and 15 high level bombers. The Japanese torpedo planes had been assigned definite targets among the heavy fleet units and had been provided with torpedoes particularly adapted to the shallow waters of Pearl Harbor. The torpedoes were fitted with wooden vanes so that they would not sink too deeply when launched from the planes while detonators had been designed to operate after a short run so that they would be effective in the limited confines of the harbor. 35 The warheads of the Japanese torpedoes at that time were larger and more powerful than in any torpedoes in use by other navies of the world. All of the battleships moored outboard in Battleship Row were torpedoed, while one torpedo passed underneath the Oglala and exploded against the Helena, the blast caving in the side plates of the Oglala which capsized an hour later. On the north side of Ford Island the Raleigh was struck by one torpedo and the Utah turned turtle after taking two. All of these attacks were made by planes which came in at a height of 100 feet or less above the water and launched their torpedoes at very short distances. In the simultaneous dive bombing runs, one Jap pilot put a bomb down a stack of the Arizona, whose forward boilers and magazine blew up. Other successful attacks were made on the Pennsylvania, California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Helena, Shure, Curtis, and Oglala. High-level bombers scored on the California, Utah, Shure, and Navy Yard docks. During the comparative lull between 8.25 and 8.40 an estimated 15 planes continued dive bomber attacks, directed against the Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Maryland, Nevada, Honolulu, Helena, Cassin, Downs, Shure, and Oglala. The horizontal bomber attacks which followed were centered on the Pennsylvania, West Virginia, California, Helena, Oglala, and the three destroyers in Dry Dock. About 30 planes participated in these attacks, with 18 dive bombers also in action. The dive bombers registered hits on Dry Dock's numbers 1 and 2, Tennessee, West Virginia, Nevada, and the three destroyers. In the fourth phase, between 9.15 and 9.45, the three destroyers were again attacked, as was the Raleigh. Bombs also fell on installations on Ford Island, the battleships on the south side of the island, and destroyers and other ships moored north of the island. 27 dive bombers were estimated to have participated in this closing phase. All enemy planes had retired by 9 colon 45. In addition to the specially fitted torpedo, the enemy force was provided with another novel weapon which produced unexpectedly good results. 
This was a large armor-piercing shell of 15 or 16 inches, fitted for use by high-level bombers. Hits were scored with these improvised bombs on the battleships California and Tennessee and the light cruiser Raleigh. 36 One of these shells penetrated to the California's second deck, where a large part of the ship's company was assembled. Many of the men were killed and the explosion resulted in a raging fire between decks. Two more of these projectiles each struck main turrets of the Tennessee. One of the shells exploded and a fragment from it mortally wounded Captain Mervyn S. Benyon, commander of the nearby West Virginia. The other blew out its base plug and its detonating charge burned out on the deck without exploding. Despite these hits, only five men aboard the Tennessee were killed. The Raleigh was struck on the port side aft by a projectile which went through several decks and came out through the side of the ship to explode 50 feet away. The defenders, although surprised and off balance, fought the Japanese attack with great courage, but losses were high. The attack cost the lives of 2,326 officers and men. The Navy's losses were 2,086 dead and 749 wounded, while the Army suffered 240 dead and 360 wounded. Total casualties thus were 3,435.37 of 15 Congressional Medals of Honor for Heroism during the attack. 11 were posthumous awards. The damage to the fleet consisted of sunk, five battleships, the Arizona, Oklahoma, West Virginia, California, and Nevada, three destroyers, the Cassin, Downs, and Shore, the target ship Utah, the repair ship Vestal, the mine layer Oglala, and floating dry dock number two. Damaged but afloat, three battleships, the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee, three light cruisers, the Helena, Honolulu, and Raleigh, and the seaplane Tender Curtis. After the attack the Japanese estimated they had sunk four battleships and damaged four others and that they had wrecked about half of the 900 planes they estimated to be on Oahu.39 They were conservative in estimating warship losses but exaggerated the number of American planes destroyed. Damage to these vessels individually is given in Appendix.38 Chapter 4 The Scapegoats and the Excitement and Confusion On December 7, 1941, it was not immediately noticed that the leaders of the Roosevelt administration were frantically scurrying about proving their surprise and injury, shouldering the blame for the disaster at Pearl Harbor away from themselves. Events were moving too fast for citizens to detect that the disengaging tactics of the politicians were far more successful than had been those of the Pacific Fleet. The Japanese declaration of war was announced by Imperial Headquarters two hours and 35 minutes after the attack. Premier Shidehara explained after Japan's surrender four years later that an error in procedure prevented the declaration from reaching the State Department in Washington before the attack. One Nagano, commander of the combined imperial fleets, said the Japanese plan was to send notification to the United States at 7.30 a.m., Hawaii time, on December 7, 1941. The necessary time elapse, he explained, between dispatch of such a message, its decoding by the Japanese embassy in Washington, and its delivery to the State Department, would mean at best a notification virtually simultaneous with the attack. At first, Nagano said, we were going to give a one-hour notice before the attack, but the United States was fully prepared and its communications excellent, so it was shortened to 30 minutes notice. Two on Monday Mr. Roosevelt sent his message to Congress calling for a declaration of war. The declaration was approved by both houses with one dissenting vote, that of Representative Jeanette Rankin of Montana who had also voted against war with Germany in 1917.3 Britain, Canada, Australia, and Holland had already declared war against the Japanese. Four on Thursday, December 11, Germany and Italy, acting under their tripartite pact commitments to Japan, declared war against the United States. Five the same day Congress passed resolutions declaring the existence of a state of war with these two nations. Six after receiving a message in which President Roosevelt said, the long known and the long expected has taken place. 
7 This equivocal expression implied that Germany and Italy had long been meditating an attack upon the United States. Again the vote was unanimous for war, with the exception of Miss Rankin, who voted present in each instance. Meanwhile, there had been ominous reports of the losses at Pearl Harbor. The first Japanese claims were that the battleships West Virginia and Oklahoma had been sunk and that four other capital ships and four cruisers had been damaged. Eight, the first report from the American government came from the White House on December 8. About 3,000 casualties, equally divided between dead and wounded, were acknowledged by Roosevelt, while it was said that one old battleship had capsized, a destroyer had blown up, several other smaller ships had been seriously damaged, a large number of planes had been put out of commission, and several hangars destroyed in the bombing of Army and Navy airfields. Nine, the President on December 7 knew the true extent of the losses. Some of his alarm and dismay were communicated to the cabinet members and congressional leaders who attended him in the White House that night. Roosevelt told them the casualties, I am sorry to say, were extremely heavy. I cannot say anything definite in regard to the number of ships that have been sunk. It looks as if out of eight battleships, three have been sunk, and possibly a fourth. Two destroyers were blown up while they were in dry dock. Two of the battleships are badly damaged. Several other smaller vessels have been sunk or destroyed. The dry dock itself has been damaged. Now I think that is all there is in the way of information, but it has been suggested that the Army and Navy losses, and the rather definite statements I have made about these ships, could not be spoken of outside, because we must remember that detailed military information, such as the damage to ships, or even the loss of personnel, that information is of value to an enemy. I think that is a matter of discretion, which all of you will accept. Ten. The first official report on the damage was to come from Secretary Knox. At 8 a.m., December 9, Knox left Washington in his own plane, conscious, as Davis and Lindley put it, of his share in the blame for the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. The Secretary of the Navy regarded his mission as an expiation. 11 Upon his return to Washington, December 15, Knox hurried to the White House and conferred with Roosevelt. Later he called the press to his office and announced a total of 2,897 Army and Navy dead, 879 wounded, and 26 missing. The Arizona, Utah, Shure, Cassin, Downs, and Oglala, he said, had been sunk. The Oklahoma was capsized but salvageable, and other vessels had suffered damage requiring repairs of a week to several months. 12 Knox's published report had been prepared with the assistance of Comdr. Leland P. Lovett, whom the secretary found at Pearl Harbor, where Lovett was commander of Destroyer Division 5, which included the Cassin, Downs, and Shure, all of which had been wrecked in the Jap attack. 13 Lovett subsequently to be named Director of Navy Public Relations by Knox, was an officer author of some reputation. The statement which he and Knox drew up for submission to the public emphasized the heroism of the men at Pearl Harbor, but carefully refrained from giving the American people anything like a true accounting of the damage suffered by the fleet. More important than what Knox chose to tell the people was the decision which he and Roosevelt reached at their conference preceding the release of the report. It would not be known for another four years that, although Knox in a private report to Roosevelt at this very meeting did not impute exclusive or even specific blame to the Hawaiian commanders, 14 Kimmel and Short were then assigned the role of scapegoats for the disaster. Adam Stark, Chief of Naval Operations in 1941, testified at the Congressional investigation in 1945 that the first thing Knox did after conferring with the President was to issue orders for the removal of Adam Kimmel as commander of the Pacific Fleet. Asked whether Knox's action was based on orders from Roosevelt, Stark said, you always need the President's permission to remove a fleet commander. 15 at his press conference, however, Knox made no admission that any such action would be taken. The United States services were not on the alert against a surprise attack on Hawaii, his report stated. This fact calls for a formal investigation which will be initiated immediately by the President.
Further action is, of course, dependent on the facts and recommendations made by this investigating board. Knox sought to create the impression that any assessment of blame would await later investigation by an impartial commission. The impression he gave the press and the nation was wholly disingenuous. He and the president had already decided to put the onus on Kimmel and Short. The commanders were relieved of their posts, but the announcement was held up for two days, until December 17. Major Gen. Martin, commander of the Army Air Forces in Hawaii, was relieved at the same time. 16 On December 16, Roosevelt, moved by a rising tide of indignation in Congress which made it apparent that an investigation by that body was likely, forestalled independent inquiry by appointing his own investigating commission. 17 This was a five man board of inquiry headed by Associate Justice Owen J. Roberts of the United States Supreme Court who had been a proponent of war as a means of achieving world government. 18 The other members were two retired admirals, Rear Admiral William H. Stanley, former Chief of Naval Operations, and Rear Admiral Joseph M. Reeves, former Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, Major General Frank R. McCoy, retired, and Joseph T. McNaney, a Brigadier General on the active list of the Army Air Corps. McNaney later was promoted to the rank of four-star general, became deputy chief of staff, second only to Gen. Marshall in the army hierarchy, and, finally, commander of all occupation forces in Europe. The selection of these men was not accidental. Reeves was the first commander-in-chief of the fleet to take it to Pearl Harbor. He was therefore disqualified from criticizing the selection of Pearl Harbor as its base. Stanley retired in 1937, was recalled to active duty March 6, 1941, and would not be disposed to criticize the decisions of the Navy leadership in Washington, of which he had formerly been a ranking member as Chief of Naval Operations. McCoy, as President of the Foreign Policy Association, per se was a staunch supporter of Roosevelt's diplomacy. McNaney was a member of the Marshall clique which ran the War Department. Since 1939 he had been a member of the general staff, which was responsible for the failure to build up the defenses of Pearl Harbor and which withheld knowledge of Japanese designs and intentions from the field commanders. Four of these men later were the recipients of honor and favors from the Roosevelt administration. Five and one half years after his retirement with the rank of Rear Admiral, Reeves was promoted to Admiral on the retired list June 16, 1942. This was five months after he had signed the Roberts Report. Stanley was decorated by Roosevelt with the Distinguished Service Medal after signing the report, and was appointed ambassador to Russia, a post which he held in 1942 and 1943. McCoy was appointed chairman of the Far Eastern Advisory Commission when Allied control was established following the surrender of Japan. McNamee's meteoric rise in the army has been described. Roosevelt, in fixing jurisdiction, charged the commission with determining whether any derelictions of duty or error of judgment on the part of United States Army or Navy personnel contributed to such successes as were achieved by the enemy in the attack made by Japanese forces upon the territory of Hawaii. These instructions were intended to exclude consideration of the behavior of official Washington. Roosevelt had already tried the case. Without calling witnesses, he found Kimmel and Short guilty, condemned them, and carried out his sentence. He announced their removal from command the very day that the Roberts Commission assembled in Washington. Under the circumstances, it was hardly surprising that the President's hand picked commission should report findings to order. On January 24 it submitted a report to Roosevelt which held that Kimmel and Short were guilty of dereliction of duty. 19 The report ignored many vital considerations and its findings on points of major importance were contradicted in both the Army and Navy reports of a later day and in testimony before the Congressional Investigating Committee. In addition, the findings of the Commission were based upon misinformation and errors in fact. The Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, p. 3, remarks it is extremely unfortunate that the Roberts Commission report was so hasty, inconclusive, 
and incomplete. Some witnesses were examined under oath, others were not. Much testimony was not even recorded. The commission knew that Japanese messages had been intercepted and were available, prior to the attack, to the high command in Washington. The commission did not inquire about what information these intercepts contained, who received them, or what was done about them, although the failure of Washington to inform the commanders in Hawaii of this vital intelligence bears directly on the question of whether those commanders performed their full duties. Mr. Justice Roberts testified before this committee, I would not have bothered to read it, the intercepted Japanese traffic, if it had been shown to us, tr, volume 47, p. 8836. If it were necessary to do so, detailed examples of the many shortcomings of the Roberts Commission could be set forth. It should be noted, however, that Justice Roberts had sufficient legal experience to know the proper method of collecting and preserving evidence which in this case involved the highest interests of the nation. The facts were then fresh in the minds of key witnesses in Washington. They could not then have been ignorant of their whereabouts at important times or have forgotten the details of events and operations. No files would have been lost and no information would have been distorted by the passage of time. The failure to observe these obvious necessities is almost as tragic to the cause of truth as the attack on Pearl Harbor itself was a tragedy for the nation. For example, although the report did not mention that the United States had cracked the Japanese code months before Pearl Harbor, the Commission had been informed by the Chief of Naval Intelligence, Adam Wilkinson, that all of the information from Jap code intercepts had been sent to the Hawaiian commanders. In fact, only a few of the hundreds of these messages, and none of major importance, had been relayed to Kimmel and Short. Four years later, when he was examined by the Congressional Pearl Harbor Investigating Committee, Wilkinson corrected the statements he had given the Roberts Commission. 21 The report held that Short's alert against sabotage was not adequate, but had only the gentlest sort of criticism for his superiors in Washington who had been informed by him of the action he had taken and had not even responded, let alone ordered him to go on an all-out alert. It criticized Kimmel for not taking appropriate measures in view of war warnings, but held that in ordering attacks to be made upon Japanese submarines found in operating areas around Oahu, he had exceeded the authority given him by the Navy Department. The Commission greatly emphasized such information as could be construed to have given the Hawaiian commanders warning that war was imminent, but it withheld reference to the far more vital intelligence which was not transmitted to Hawaii. Of seven warning messages from Washington to Short and Kimmel which were recorded in the Roberts Report, no less than four referred to the danger of sabotage. Not one suggested the possibility of surprise air attack. These so called warnings were so qualified by hampering instructions that the Army Board of Inquiry, in its report, drafted in October 1944, called them doodunt messages. The actual effect of the messages was to transfer responsibility from Washington to the field commanders if anything went wrong, but so to tie the hands of the commanders and restrict the course of action open to them that they were in no position to meet the attack when it came. The Roberts report devoted no attention to the fact that Washington had definite and detailed intelligence in the days preceding the attack that war was coming within predictable limits of time and had ample reason to believe the Jap blow would fall on Pearl Harbor. On December 7, Gen. Marshall had opportunity to warn the Hawaii commanders that all evidence available to Washington indicated that an attack was coming. He sent a message but its transmission was so botched that it reached Jen. Short seven hours too late. The Roberts report stated that at about 6.30 a.m., Honolulu time, Marshall dispatched an additional warning message indicating an almost immediate break in relations between the United States and Japan. It continued, every effort was made to have the message reach Hawaii in the briefest possible time, but due to conditions beyond the control of anyone concerned, the delivery of this urgent message was delayed until after the attack. The message, the report said, was intended to reach both commanders in the field at about 7 a.m., Hawaii time, 
but the report adds that even if the message had reached its destination at the time intended, it would still have been too late because dispositions made by Kimmel and Short were inadequate to meet a surprise air attack. By such statements, the Commission glossed over Marshall's mishandling of a crucial dispatch which could have averted much of the damage suffered at Hawaii. The Commission, although charged with seeking derelictions of duty and errors of judgment only among Army and Navy officers, was at pains to state that Gen. Marshall, Adam. Stark, and Secretaries Hull, Stimson, and Knox had discharged their responsibilities. In conclusion 17, however, it implied that these officials did bear some responsibility, after all. It said that the dereliction of Kimmel and Short consisted of failing to consult and confer. Respecting the meaning and intent of the warnings dispatched from Washington, it need hardly be said that such action would not have been necessary if the warnings were clear and precise. By a curious exercise of inverted logic, the Commission also advanced the contention that because Washington was keeping them in the dark on the vital intelligence obtained from Japanese code intercept, Kimmel and Short by some process of clairvoyance should have realized the necessity of placing a more urgent degree of readiness in effect. The report said in this connection, both commanders were handicapped by lack of information as to Japanese dispositions and intent. The lack of such knowledge rendered more urgent the initiation of a state of readiness for defense. Kimmel and Short did not know until much later that Washington even possessed information of the character which was being withheld from them. Adam. Kimmel said that the Roberts Commission had informed him that he was not on trial. Kimmel, upon later inspection of the record of his own testimony, said that he found so many errors in the record that he spent two days correcting it, only to have the board refuse to change his statements as recorded originally. All that the investigators would do finally was to attach the corrected statement to the minutes. He said of the commission, it permitted me to testify, that's all. 22 Gen. Short said that upon his relief from command in Hawaii he had reached Oklahoma City when he read the report of the Roberts Commission in the press. He said when I read the findings of the Roberts Commission, I was dumbfounded. To be accused of dereliction of duty after almost 40 years of loyal and competent service was beyond my comprehension. I immediately called Gen. Marshall on the telephone. He was an old and trusted friend of 39 years standing. I asked him what I should do, having the country and war in mind should I retire? He replied, stand pat, but if it becomes necessary I will use this conversation as authority. Short said that, having faith in Marshall's judgment and loyalty, he wrote Marshall a personal letter and enclosed a formal application for retirement, to be used only if Marshall thought it desirable. His covering letter was not produced in evidence before the Congressional Committee, but a memorandum from Marshall to Secretary Stimson on January 26, 1942, reporting Short's telephone call of the day before, stated, I am now of the opinion that we should accept Jen. Short's application for retirement today and do this quietly, without any publicity at the moment. Adam. Stark has requested me to advise him if we do this as he proposes to communicate this fact to Kimmel in the hope that Kimmel will likewise apply for retirement. This correspondence demonstrates that, the day after reassuring Short, Marshall took steps in secret to get rid of him. The War Department's order accepting Short's application for retirement was drafted after Stimson consulted Attorney General Francis J. Biddle as to how it should be worded. As finally phrased. Short's retirement was accepted without condemnation of any offense or prejudice to any future disciplinary action. The implication of this language was that Short faced court martial action at some future date, and its effect was to seal his lips and to prevent him from making any defense of himself until he should be called for trial. 23 Once in possession of Short's resignation, Roosevelt, Knox, and Stimson proceeded to use it as a lever to induce Kimmel to retire. Adam. Stark notified him on orders from Secretary Knox that Short had asked to be retired. I took this as a suggestion and I submitted a similar request, Kimmel said. Up to that time I never considered retiring. It had not even entered my head, 
but I thought it over and decided that if the Navy wanted it that way, I would not stand in the way. Kimmel thereupon forwarded a request for retirement to Washington, but two days after sending his application was informed by Stark that the notification of Jen. Short's application was not meant to influence him. Although he then modified his request for retirement by telling the Navy he wanted to do whatever would best serve the country, he received a letter from Knox on February 16 peremptorily ordering him to retire as of March 1, also without condemnation of any offense or prejudice to future disciplinary action. Six days afterward, in a letter to Stark, Kimmel said of this qualifying clause, I do not understand this paragraph unless it is to be published to the country as a promise that I will be disciplined at some future time. I stand ready at any time to accept the consequences of my acts. I do feel, however, that my crucifixion before the public has about reached the limit. I am in daily receipt of letters from irresponsible people all over the country taking me to task and even threatening to kill me. I am not particularly concerned except as it shows the effect on the public of articles published about me. I regret the losses at Pearl Harbor just as keenly, or perhaps more keenly, than any other American citizen. I wish that I had been smarter than I was and able to foresee what happened on December 7, but I do think in all justice the department should do nothing further to inflame the public against me. 24 Gen. Short expressed similar resentment before the Congressional Committee. He said I do not feel that I have been treated fairly or with justice by the War Department. I was singled out as an example, as the scapegoat for the disaster. My relatively small part in the transaction was not explained to the American people until this Joint Congressional Committee forced the revelation of the facts. I fully appreciate the desire of the War Department to preserve the secrecy of the source of the so-called magic, cracking of the Japanese code, but I am sure that could have been done without any attempt to deceive the public by a false pretense that my judgment had been the sole factor causing the failure of the Army to fulfill its mission of defending the Navy at Pearl Harbor. I am sure that an honest confession by the War Department General Staff of their failure to anticipate the surprise raid would have been understood by the public, in the long run, and even at the time. Instead, they passed the buck to me and I have kept my silence until the opportunity of this public forum was presented to me. 25 Senator Ferguson asked him what meaning he wished to convey when he said he had been made the scapegoat. I meant just exactly what the common usage meant, that it was someone that they saddled the blame on to get it off of themselves. In other words, suggested Ferguson, they were in this position, that someone had to take some blame for what happened at Pearl Harbor, that certain people in Washington that you had named in your opinion were to blame, that they shifted that blame over to you as the commanding general at Hawaii, and therefore made you, in the common language, a scapegoat. That is exactly what I want to convey. 26 Thus the Pearl Harbor commanders were driven in disgrace from their professional careers having been identified thoroughly in the minds of the public as bearing the sole blame for the Pearl Harbor disaster. The leaders of the Roosevelt administration and of its Army and Navy High Command, who were in possession of the untold story of the catastrophe, saw to it that no hint of the concealed facts should leak out. Censorship and the pretext of national security enabled them for four years to suppress all facts which could damage them. These men never confessed that they were in any way at fault or that the slightest blame attached to them. None of them resigned, and in less than a year they went to the country in a national election with the slogan that any political opponent who had not been right before Pearl Harbor should be retired by the electorate. Representative Keefe in additional views appended to the majority report of the Joint Congressional Committee, Major, pp. 266Q to 266S, said of the process employed in retiring the Hawaiian commanders the President personally directed the method of handling the requests for retirement of Kimmel and Short. On January 29, 1942, he instituted a three-point program for dealing with the matter the Army and Navy were to act together. After a week's waiting they were to announce that Kimmel and Short had applied for retirement and that their applications were under consideration. After another week had passed, 
public announcement was to be made that the applications had been accepted with the condition that acceptance did not bar subsequent court-martial proceedings. Court-martial proceedings, however, were to be described as impossible without the disclosure of military secrets. The wording of the condition in the acceptance was troublesome to the administration. The President, Secretary Stimson, Secretary Knox, and Attorney General Biddle labored over the language, tr, pp. 8462, 8464, x. 171. The administration wanted to avoid public criticism for having barred court-martial proceedings. On the other hand, it did not wish to stimulate the public or the two officers to expect or demand court-martial proceedings, tr, p. 8464, 8467. Finally language as suitable as possible was agreed upon. The phrase to be used in accepting the retirement applications was without condemnation of any offense or prejudice to future disciplinary action. Adam. Kimmel and Jen. Short were each retired by letters so worded, dated respectively, February 16th and February 17, 1942. The Secretary of the Navy, in announcing the Navy's action, stated that he had directed the preparation of charges for court-martial of Adam. Kimmel alleging dereliction of duty. The public were informed that a trial could not be held until such time as the public interest and safety would permit. The public reaction was as planned. Kimmel and Short were considered solely responsible for Pearl Harbor. The Roberts report, considered by Justice Roberts as only an indictment, became, in effect, a conviction. The two officers were helpless. No court martial could be had. They had no way of defending themselves. They remained in ignorance of what evidence the Roberts Commission had heard. Adam. Stark wrote to Adam. Kimmel on February 21, 1942, pending something definite, there is no reason why you should not settle yourself in a quiet nook somewhere and let old father time help the entire situation, which I feel he will, if for no other reason than he always has, x. 121. The high civilian and military officials in Washington who had skillfully maneuvered Kimmel and Short into the position of exclusive blame knew at the time all the hidden facts about Pearl Harbor, at least as much and probably more than this investigation has been able to uncover. As the two-year statutory period for instituting court-martial proceedings was about to expire, Kimmel and Short were requested by the Secretaries of War and Navy to waive the statute of limitations. Adam. Kimmel did so but with the provision that any court-martial be held in open court, Exhibit 171. Gen. Short did likewise, tr. pages 8496-99. Similar requests were not made of other officers not even of those who before this committee publicly accepted responsibility for certain failures of the high command in Washington. In June of 1944 the Congress directed the Secretaries of War and Navy to conduct investigations into the Pearl Harbor attack. The War Department denied the Army Board of Investigation access to the intercepted messages. Gen. Miles, Director of Military Intelligence at the time of Pearl Harbor, was ordered by Gen. Marshall not to testify on the subject of the intercepts, tr, p. 11843. For a considerable period the Navy Court of Inquiry was denied access to the same material, Exhibit 195. After repeated demands by Adam. Kimmel, the Navy Department released this restriction upon its own court. The War Department finally followed the same course. For the first time, Late in the board's proceedings, army officers were permitted to testify before the army board as to all details regarding the intercepts, tr, p. 12,035. But many important army witnesses had already testified under the limitations previously ordered. In the fall of 1944 the army board and navy court made their reports to the secretaries of the war and navy. These reports were critical of the conduct of ADM. Stark and Jen. Marshall. The findings were not made public. The Navy Court exonerated Adam. Kimmel. Adam. 
Kimmel's request to read its report was refused by the Secretary of the Navy, T.R. P. 6811. The Secretaries of War and Navy instituted further secret investigations dispensing with the services of the three-man board and court previously established, and each entrusting the conduct of proceedings to a single officer. Adam. Kimmel's request to be present at the further Navy investigation, to introduce evidence, to confront and cross-examine witnesses, was denied by the Secretary of the Navy, T.R. P. 6812. The affidavits and testimony at the further investigations contain many instances where witnesses gave evidence materially different from that which they had previously sworn to before the Army Board and the Naval Court. These changes were especially marked in testimony of certain key witnesses on the subject of the dissemination and evaluation of the intercepted messages in Washington. Again, before this committee these same witnesses further changed their testimony from that sworn to twice previously, or pleaded lapses of memory. The record of the high military and civilian officials of the War and Navy departments in dealing with the Pearl Harbor disaster from beginning to end does them no credit. It will have a permanent bad effect on the morale and integrity of the armed services. The administration had ample opportunity to record and preserve all the facts about Pearl Harbor, even if their public disclosure needed to wait upon the war's end. This was not done. The policy adopted was to place the public responsibility for the disaster on the commanders in the field, to be left there for all time. The policy failed only because suppression created public suspicion, and the Congress was alert. At 6 a.m., December 8, Tokyo time, 10.30 a.m., December 7, Hawaii time, 4 p.m., December 7, e.s.t.n. Y. Times, December 8, 1st colon 2. The record of the Commission's proceedings and exhibits covers 2,173 printed pages.20 cf. Pages 238 to 39, 241, 253. CF. Pages 240 to 41. Dot chapter 5 The basing of the fleetway, and at whose command, was the Pacific Fleet based at Pearl Harbor, within reach of the air striking arm of the Japanese Navy? The American fleet was started westward to the Pacific after World War I by President Wilson. The creation of a separate Pacific Battle Fleet was first announced in June, 1919. At the time it was said that stationing a strong fleet in each ocean would stimulate a spirit of rivalry within the service, and thus promote the efficiency of the entire navy. But even then the notion seemed to be entertained that the fleet in the Pacific would constitute a deterrent to Japan, whose star was rising with the acquisition, under League of Nations mandate of the German islands north of the equator. By the end of 1919 the United States had assembled a fighting fleet of 200 units in the Pacific, a force almost as large as the entire Japanese navy of that day. Early in 1921 the Atlantic fleet was sent to the Pacific for joint maneuvers. In June of that year, after a Republican administration had returned to Washington, it was announced that it had been decided on the advice of naval authorities to station most of our fighting ships permanently in the Pacific, but to base them upon Southern California. In 1932, the security of the Pearl Harbor base was tested in Adm. Yarnell's mock attack. Yarnell's surprise should have resulted in serious misgivings as to the safety of the fleet while anchored in harbor. In 1936, However, the American fleet was again taken to Pearl Harbor by its commander, Rear Admiral Joseph M. Reeves, subsequently a member of the Roberts Commission. On May 27 the battleship divisions and supporting craft, a fleet of 165 ships, moved into Pearl Harbor for a test of the base as an anchorage for the entire fleet. Because the harbor entrance was being dredged, three carriers, the Lexington, Saratoga, and Ranger, were left offshore. The Roberts report, to which Reeves subscribed, recognized that there were diverse views respecting the basing of the entire fleet at Pearl Harbor, but stated, we feel that the national policy in this matter is one that has been settled by those responsible for such decisions and that it is not within our province. 
In 1939 the fleet shifted its war games from the west coast to the Caribbean in what was regarded as a gesture of warning to Hitler and Mussolini that the United States would stand behind the nations opposing their ambitions. While the fleet was on the east coast it was planned to hold a grand review in connection with the New York World's Fair. On April 16, 1939, however, the fleet unexpectedly was ordered back to the Pacific without explanation. This was about a month after Hitler had violated the Munich Pact by absorbing all of Czechoslovakia, and eight days after Mussolini had marched into Albania. The return of the fleet to the Pacific was regarded as evidence of an agreement with Britain under which the British fleet would safeguard the Atlantic in the event of war, while the American fleet stood watch over the Pacific. After its return from the Caribbean, the main body of the fleet remained at San Diego until January, 1940, when it proceeded to Hawaii for war games. On February 3rd the first step was taken to convert Pearl Harbor into the permanent base for a substantial number of fleet units. It was reported that the base would become the home port for a Hawaiian detachment consisting of 13 ships, the heavy cruisers Indianapolis, Northampton, Houston, Pensacola, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, Astoria, and New Orleans, the light cruiser Orly, the destroyer tender Dobbin, and the minesweepers Kingfisher, Partridge, and Turkey. On May 7, 1940, the Navy announced that the entire fleet would remain at Pearl Harbor indefinitely. This represented a radical departure in American naval policy. Until this time it had been the Navy's policy to keep the fleet on the west coast and to send it into blue water only in a period of tension. Not until the congressional investigation of 1945-46 would it be explained why this policy was abandoned and at whose behest. On May 10, three days after the announcement that the fleet would be concentrated at Pearl Harbor, the German Blitzkrieg in the west roared over the frontiers of Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. On the same day Winston Churchill succeeded Neville Chamberlain as Prime Minister. As the Germans surged on toward completion of the conquest of all Western Europe, it might have seemed to Mr. Roosevelt that he had his fleet in the wrong ocean. But he was inclined to dismiss the proposal for creation of a two-ocean navy as a crackpot idea. At his press conference on May 14 he said that a two-ocean navy was an entirely outmoded conception of naval defense. One he asked Congress for 50,000 airplanes authority to muster the National Guard into federal service, and appropriations of a billion dollars for the Army and Navy. After that, he said, Congress could adjourn. Congress, however, insisted on staying in session. It voted $5 billion for defense and, on July 19, authorized a two-ocean navy. The Atlantic forces rapidly grew so large that a separate Atlantic fleet was created. But, to bowls to this fleet, which was soon to enter into an undeclared war against Germany by executive order, the Pacific Fleet was stripped of many of its major units. Steadily weakened, it still remained at Pearl Harbor, a temptation to Japan when the time would be ripe. This policy of splitting the fleet was severely criticized in 1941 by Captain W. D. Pulston in his book, The Armed Forces of the Pacific. Until the two ocean navy is completed, Pulston said, the navy should be concentrated in one fleet and kept in one ocean. At their present strengths the Pacific and Atlantic fleets would need to be brought together before undertaking a major campaign in either ocean. 2 In June, 1940, national attention was focused on the Pacific fleet when it made a sudden and mysterious dash from its space. It is now known that the high command in Washington, after losing radio contact with the Japanese fleet, which unaccountably had gone into radio silence, had secretly alerted the Hawaiian garrison against the possibility of a Trans-Pacific raid. Gen. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, ordered the troops of Gen. Heron's Hawaiian command to go on an all-out alert, occupying field positions with full equipment and ammunition. The fleet, under command of Adm. J. O. Richardson, had put to sea, not only to increase its security through freedom of maneuver, 
but to intercept any enemy fleet which might be approaching. At the end of a week the fleet returned to Hawaiian waters. The only explanation offered for its unexpected departure was that it had been engaged in routine training exercises. The army, however, maintained its alert for more than six weeks, although the fact was not made public for more than a year. The congressional investigation in 1945 disclosed that the 1940 alert was based on the premise that an attack at any time on Hawaii by Japan could not be ruled out because a large part of the fleet was based there. This estimate had been submitted to Chief of Staff Marshal by Major General George V. Strong, Chief of Army War Plans in 1940.3 It reduced to its simplest terms the obligation of the High Command to put Hawaii on a full alert whenever available information indicated that there was a possibility of a sudden stroke against the fleet. Wherever the fleet was, so Gen. Strong reasoned, there would the danger be greatest. The conclusion was obvious. For it persuaded Gen. Marshall in 1940, for he promptly directed an all out alert. Why, in November and December, 1941, when he knew the danger to be far greater, he did not follow a similar course is one of the unanswered mysteries. Gen. Strong's view as to the inevitability of the place of attack was echoed by Captain A. H. McCullum head of the Far Eastern Section of Naval Intelligence. He testified before the Congressional Committee that he had felt for many years that the Japanese would open hostilities by attacking our fleet wherever it was. Five. The story of who sent the fleet to Pearl Harbor and why it was ordered there was first explained in testimony before the Congressional Committee in November, 1945, by Adm. Richardson. Six Richardson had taken up his duties as Commander in Chief of the United States Fleet on January 5, 1940. The fleet at that time was based at the California ports of San Diego, San Pedro, and Long Beach. It proceeded to sea on spring maneuvers, arriving at La Haina Roads in Hawaii on April 10. It was supposed to depart on May 9. But two days before the scheduled date Richardson was notified by Adm. Stark that there would be a delay of two weeks. In explaining this decision, Stark wrote Richardson just hung up the telephone after talking with the president and by the time this reaches you, you will have received word to remain in Hawaiian waters for a couple of weeks. When the fleet returns to the coast, and I trust the delay will not be over two weeks, but I cannot tell. The president has asked that the fleet schedule be so arranged that on extremely short notice the fleet will be able to return concentrated to Hawaiian waters. Seven Stark explained that, with Italy expected to enter the European war at any moment, nobody could guess what lay ahead, and that the decision to retain the fleet at Pearl Harbor was related to the uncertainties of the situation. The letter shows that Roosevelt, using his commander in chief powers, was making decisions for the Navy, and that the order to keep the fleet at Oahu was his. Richardson, in response to this communication, wrote Stark, It seems that, under present world conditions, the paramount thing for us is the security of the Western Hemisphere. This, in my opinion, transcends everything, anything certainly in the Far East, our own or other interests. South America is the greatest prize yet remaining to be grabbed. Until the outcome in Europe can be more clearly seen, security in the Western Hemisphere seems to be the most important consideration to us. I feel that any move west, toward Japan and Asia, means hostilities. I feel that at this time it would be a grave mistake to become involved in the West, where our interests, although important, are not vital, and thereby reduce our ability to maintain the security of the Western Hemisphere which is vital. If the fleet is to go west it can only start, properly prepared, from the west coast where it can be docked, manned, stocked and stripped, and a suitable train assembled. Eight on May 22, still at Pearl Harbor, Richardson sent another letter to Stark demanding to know why the fleet was being kept in Hawaii. He asked are we here primarily to influence the actions of other nations by our presence, and if so, what effect would the carrying out of normal training have on this purpose? Dot. Are we here as a stepping off place for belligerent activity? If so, we should devote our time and energies to preparing for war. 
This could more effectively and expeditiously be accomplished by an immediate return to the West Coast. As it is now, to try to do both, train and prepare for belligerent action, from here and at the same time is a diversification of effort and purpose that can only result in the accomplishment of neither. Stark on May 27 replied to the question of why Richardson was in the Hawaiian area by saying, you are there because of the deterrent effect which it is thought your presence may have on the Japs going into the East Indies. You would naturally ask, suppose the Japs do go into the East Indies? What are we going to do about it? My answer to that is, I don't know and I think there is nobody on God's green earth who can tell you. On June 22 Stark advised Richardson that the fleet was to remain tentatively in Pearl Harbor. Richardson continued his protests against retaining the fleet in Hawaii. On September 12 he filed a memorandum with Stark listing his objections as follows colon 1. Difficulty, delay, and cost of transporting men, munitions, and supplies. Two. Inadequacy of La Hainu as operating anchorage because of lack of security. Three. Inadequacy of Pearl Harbor as an operating anchorage because of difficulties of entry, berthing, and departure of large ships. Four. Congested and restricted operating areas in the air and on the surface. Five. Inadequate facilities for fleet services, training, recreation, and housing. Six. Prolonged absence from mainland of officers and men in time of peace adversely affects morale. 7. In case of war, necessary for fleet to return to mobilization ports on west coast or accept partial and unorganized mobilization measures, resulting in confusion and the net loss of time. Richardson continued If the disposition of the fleet were determined solely by naval considerations, the major portion of the fleet should return to its normal Pacific Coast bases because such basing would facilitate its training and its preparation for war. If factors other than purely naval ones are to influence the decision as to where the fleet should be based at this time, the naval factors should be fully presented and carefully considered, as well as the probable effect of the decision on the readiness of the fleet. In other words, is it more important to lend strength to diplomatic representations in the Pacific by basing the fleet in the Hawaiian area, than to facilitate its preparation for active service in any area by basing the major part of it on normal Pacific coast bases? In case our relations with another Pacific nation deteriorate, what is the State Department's conception of our next move? Does it believe that the fleet is now mobilized and that it could embark on a campaign directly from Hawaii or safely conduct necessary training from the insecure anchorage at Lahaina, which is 2,000 miles nearer enemy submarine bases than our normal Pacific Coast bases? Adam. Richardson felt so strongly about these matters that when he was called to Washington, he took them up directly with the president. On October 8 he was received by Roosevelt for a White House luncheon conference. Admiral William D. Leahy, then Governor of Puerto Rico, who later became Presidential Chief of Staff, was also present. Richardson had felt for a long time that the President's disposition to ignore competent professional advice and formulate his own war strategy was dangerous to the nation and to the fleet. On January 26, before the fleet was ordered to Pearl Harbor, he had expressed himself vehemently in a private letter to him. Stark I strongly feel that you should repeatedly impress on the boss that an orange, Japanese, war would probably last some years and cost much money, my guess is 5 to 10 years, 35 to 70 billion dollars. We ought not to go into a thing like this unless we expected to see it through. I hesitate to write to you because the written word is so easily misunderstood. Also I do not know what your ideas are, what you are telling the boss. What is the meaning of our diplomatic moves, or our senators talks, or our neutrality patrol? But you are the principal and only naval advisor to the boss and he should know that our fleet cannot just sail away, lick orange, and be back home in a year or so. Also the probable cost of any war should be compared, to the probable value of winning the war. All of this letter may be needless, but I know that if you do not tell the boss what you really know and feel about the probable cost and duration of an orange war, nobody will. 
asked before the Congressional Committee who the boss was, Richardson retorted, the President of the United States, known by, SICK, the Constitution as the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. Nine Stark, in response to these promptings, made a half-hearted attempt to talk sense to the Commander-in-Chief, but was rebuffed. Describing his lack of success, he said, I asked the President several times what our Navy's role would be if Japan made war on British possessions. He just didn't answer. Once he said, don't ask me those questions. I don't think he knew the answer. Ten Richardson was well aware when he came to Washington that no one else had been able to deter Roosevelt from his career as a one-man general staff, working through intuition. He determined, however, to make one last attempt himself. The Admiral said my mission was primarily to find out what was back of our intentions in the Pacific and to ascertain the duration of the stay of the fleet in Pearl Harbor. I took up with the President the question of returning to the Pacific Coast all of the fleet except the Hawaiian Detachment. The President stated that the fleet was retained in the Hawaiian area in order to exercise a restraining influence on the actions of Japan. I stated that in my opinion the presence of the fleet in Hawaii might influence a civilian political government, but that Japan had a military government which knew the fleet was undermanned, unprepared for war and had no train of auxiliary ships, without which it could not undertake active operations. Therefore, the presence of the fleet in Hawaii could not exercise a restraining influence on Japanese action. I further stated we were more likely to make the Japanese feel that we meant business if a train were assembled and the fleet returned to the Pacific coast, the complements filled, the ships docked and fully supplied with ammunition, provisions, stores, and fuel and then stripped the war operations. The President said in effect, despite what you believe, I know that the presence of the fleet in the Hawaiian area has had and is now having a restraining influence on the actions of Japan. I said, Mr. President, I still do not believe it and I know that our fleet is disadvantageously disposed for preparing for or initiating war operations. The President then said, I can be convinced of the desirability of returning the battleships to the west coast if I can be given a good statement which will convince the American people and the Japanese government that in bringing the battleships to the west coast we are not stepping backwards. Later I asked the president if we were going to enter the war. He replied that if the Japanese attacked Thailand, or the Krapan Peninsula, or the Dutch East Indies, we would not enter the war that even if they attacked the Philippines he doubted whether we would enter the war, but that they could not always avoid making mistakes, and that as the war continued and the area of operations expanded, sooner or later they would make a mistake and we would enter the war. Eleven within a month the nation would vote on Roosevelt's third term aspirations. He was telling Adam Richardson that in the end Japan would make a mistake and we would enter the war, but three weeks later he would address the parents of the nation and, in his Boston broadcast, make his famous pledge, I have said this before, but I shall say it again and again and again, your sons are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. 12 Although he was now telling his fleet commander that the United States would not even fight in defense of the Philippines, an American possession, let alone in defense of Siam or the British and Dutch colonies, Within three months he would commission his army and navy high command to initiate staff conversations with the British and Dutch which committed this country to fight in defense of their colonies. He was frank only when he expressed belief that some Japanese mistake would serve as the Casus Billy. Two days after this meeting at the White House, Adam Richardson learned more about Roosevelt's plans concerning the Pacific Fleet. He was summoned to a conference in the office of Secretary Knox together with Adam Stark, Admiral Royal Ingersoll, Deputy Chief of Operations, Captain C. M. Cook, of Stark's staff, and Comdr. Vincent R. Murphy, Richardson's aide. Richardson related the Secretary stated that he had important information bearing on the employment of the fleet. He stated that he had just talked to the President and that the President was concerned about the Japanese reaction to the British decision to reopen the Burma Road October 17th. In the event of drastic Japanese action, Knox said, 
The president was considering shutting off all trade between Japan and America and establishing a patrol of light ships in two lines, one from Hawaii west to the Philippines, and the other from Samoa to the Dutch East Indies. The question was raised whether this included stopping Jap ships as well as others. The view was expressed that this would be an act of war. I asked if the president was considering a declaration of war. The secretary said the president hadn't said. All I know is what I've been told, the secretary said. I was amazed at the proposal. I said the fleet was not prepared to put such a plan into effect and war would be the certain result of such a course of action. I said we would be certain to lose many ships. There was further discussion that such a line of ships would disperse the units and leave them exposed to destruction. It was said that the best way to control shipping would be to control the source of the trade by control of the relatively few ports involved. I, in particular, protested. The secretary appeared displeased at the general reaction, and mine in particular, and said, I am not a strategist. If you don't like the president's plan, draw up one of your own to accomplish the same purpose. The interview ended with Adam. Stark and I agreeing to draw up a tentative plan of operations in connection with the reopening of the Burma Road. 13 The plan drafted by Stark and Richardson provided for the transfer to the Pacific of an aircraft carrier, planes, one or two cruisers, and some destroyers. Adam. Stark, said Richardson, was not prepared to approve the plan. He said he would talk with the president and let me know later. When the plan was completed, both Secretary Knox and the President were away from Washington. All I ever heard of the plan after that was a directive from Adam Stark to send a copy of it to Adam Hart, commander of the Asiatic Squadron. This astonishing scheme to put Japan under blockade was advanced by Roosevelt three weeks before his again and again and again speech and a month before the national election. He could not have been unaware that it inevitably would have led to war. Yet, while keeping such projects secret from the country, he was busy assuring the electorate that he firmly intended to stay out of war. The plan shows Roosevelt as a reckless amateur naval strategist who thought that ships could be disposed about the oceans in the way that a child places dominoes on a board. If the plan had ever been put into effect, Japan would have been able to destroy the fleet piecemeal, for it would have been so dispersed that no warship could support any other. Hitler at his intuitive worst never engaged in such fantasies. While in Washington, Richardson related, he was subjected from many sides to the theory that the fleet at Pearl Harbor was a deterrent to Japan. The State Department, it seemed to him, was the leading exponent of this school of thought. Secretary Hull, he said, felt we should take a very strong position in regard to Japan and he felt that the retention of the fleet in Hawaii reflected that strong attitude. Adam Richardson said he gathered the impression from his Washington visit that Dr. Stanley Hornbeck, then advisor to the State Department on Far East relations and now ambassador to Holland, was regarded by the administration as the unofficial commander-in-chief of the fleet. The admiral said were they wrong or not. After talking with Dr. Hornbeck I was distinctly of the impression that he was exercising greater influence over the disposition of the fleet than I was. In my notebook at the time I wrote my impression that he was the strong man on the Far East and the cause of our staying in Hawaii, where he will hold us as long as he can. He was, however, unwilling to accept the responsibility for the retention of the fleet in Hawaii. I told him he was completely wrong even though he was the State Department's advisor on foreign affairs and had written many books on the subject. 14 The evidence is abundant that the State Department, together with Roosevelt, was running the Navy, although it did not trouble to take the field commanders who would be forced to bear the brunt of the consequences of its action into its confidence by keeping them abreast of diplomatic developments. Adam. Stark said that a year before the war began the State Department wanted to extend its policy of using the Navy as a deterrent to Japan by sending a naval detachment to the Philippines. He said that facilities were lacking in the Philippines to maintain a sizable naval force. The Navy, he said at the time, already is faced with enough difficulty maintaining the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. In letters to Adam. Kimmel. He referred to State Department suggestions as childish. 
15 Stark said, however, that he did agree to a scheme cooked up in combination by Roosevelt and the State Department to keep naval vessels popping up at various points in the Western Pacific so that the Japs would be left guessing. Did the State Department want to use the Navy in a diplomatic way? Stark was asked. They wanted to use it in supporting diplomacy in any way they thought effective, the Admiral replied. 16 In a letter to Richardson on March 15, 1940, Stark indicated that the State Department had had a hand in sending the original Hawaiian detachment of 13 warships to Pearl Harbor. I still think that the decision to send the detachment to Hawaii under present world conditions is sound, he asserted. No one can measure how much effect its presence there may have on the orange foreign policy. The State Department is strong for the present setup and considers it beneficial, they were in on all discussions, press releases, etc. Some Noels, Under Secretary of State said that the only discussion of Pearl Harbor in numerous State Department conferences was of its strategic position in the Pacific. No one in the department, he said, regarded Pearl Harbor as an object of attack, but he said he recalled conversations with Richardson in which the fleet commander expressed grave concern because the fleet was not secure in the base. He said the State Department opposed Richardson's suggestion that the fleet be moved to the Pacific coast because such a step in the opinion of department officers, would have given the Chinese the impression that we were withdrawing from the Pacific and would have been an invitation to the Japanese to move in. When he talked to Richardson, Wells said, he did not believe that Pearl Harbor was in danger of attack. That, he said, was a question for the President and the Navy Department to decide. So the President had the Navy Department and State Department views before him and it was up to him to make the decision about moving the fleet basing it on the information before him? Wells was asked. That is correct, Wells said. 17 Joseph C. Grew, former ambassador to Tokyo, also echoed the State Department opinion that the fleet, in Hawaii, was a deterrent. He said that he hadn't been consulted on the subject of basing the fleet at Pearl Harbor, but that he did think he'd had a restraining influence on Japan and was more or less useful there. What restraining influence did it have on December 7, 1941? Gru was asked. Definitely no effect, he replied. Gru explained that he did not know that the fleet was undermanned, undersupplied, and totally unprepared for war, as Richardson testified, and that keeping it bottled up in harbor would have no effect in deterring Japan from aggressive action. 18 Under examination by members of the Congressional Committee, Adm. Richardson was asked, was the fleet in Pearl Harbor a restraining influence, as the president contended? I didn't think so when I was talking to him and I haven't changed my mind. Richardson responded. Did the Japs know the deficiencies of our navy? I never had any doubt that they did, Richardson replied. The secretary of the navy told me the Japs knew more about our fleet than I did. Was any definite order issued to keep the fleet in Pearl Harbor after it arrived there from fleet maneuvers in May, 1940? There was never a definite order, Richardson replied. We just gradually drifted into staying. After your argument with the President in October, 1940, over the basing of the fleet, when did you next hear from him? I never heard from him again, the Admiral said. I never saw him again. 19 Returning to Hawaii, Richardson wrote a memorandum to Stark from Bremerton, Washington, in which he said that he wanted to stress his firm conviction that neither the Navy nor the country was prepared for war with Japan. He stated it now appears that more active, more open steps aimed at Japan are in serious contemplation and that these steps, if taken now, may lead to hostilities. The present Orange Plan, for attack against Japan, is believed beyond the present strength of the United States fleet and beyond the present resources of the United States Navy. The strength of the fleet is not sufficient. We cannot at this time, even with Great Britain assuming responsibility for our Atlantic interests, denude the ocean of sufficient forces to protect our coastal trade and to safeguard our more vital interests in South America.
nor can we neglect the protection of our own and the interdiction of Japanese trade in the southeastern Pacific. The army is not now prepared and will not in the future be prepared to support our western advance. The fleet marine force is not sufficient to support the necessary operations alone. Twenty a month later, on November 22, Stark wrote Richardson a letter which was significant in that it conceded that the fleet at Pearl Harbor was vulnerable. Much is being done by the Army, and by the Navy in support of the Army, to maintain security of the Panama Canal, the Chief of Naval Operations stated. Of at least equal importance is the security of our fleet against sudden destructive attack. And the fleet is, as usually must be the case, in a more exposed situation. Adam. Richardson remained in his command only four months after he took issue with Roosevelt. On February 1, 1941, after only 13 months in a post where the normal tour of duty was two years, he was relieved. His successor, Adam Kimmel, was designated not only Commander-in-Chief of the United States Fleet, but Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, a new command created with his accession. Richardson reported in Washington to Secretary Knox on March 24, 1941. When I saw the Secretary, he related, I said, in all my experience in the Navy, I have never known of a flag officer being detached in the same manner as I, and I feel I owe it to myself to know why. The Secretary said the President would send for me and talk the matter over. Did the President ever send for you? Richardson was asked. He did not. Did you seek a meeting with the President? By no means. Did anything the secretary say to you indicate to you why you had been detached? He told me, the last time you were here you hurt the president's feelings. 21 Adam. Richardson was not alone in the belief that the fleet at Oahu served no sensible purpose, that it could neither act as a deterrent to Japan, as the administration believed, nor take the offensive from its Pearl Harbor base. Adam. Stark, said Richardson, supported him. The ousted commander said it is my belief that had Adam Stark been uninfluenced by other considerations, he'd have agreed wholeheartedly with me on that point. His letters show that in many instances, when I was given permission to return one third of the fleet at a time to the Pacific coast for replenishment of supplies and obtaining additional men, Adam Stark said that he gave the order with great pleasure. 22 Stark, when called to testify, said that he agreed with Richardson originally on the inadvisability of basing the fleet at Pearl Harbor, but by the time Kimmel was appointed commander he was inclined to believe that the fleet, at Hawaii, was a deterrent to Japan. He said that he had had one conversation with Roosevelt in which the question of withdrawing the fleet was discussed. One view, he said, was that withdrawal to the coast, followed by a return to Hawaii, would have diplomatic repercussions. Whenever I'm in doubt and don't know what is best, Stark quoted Roosevelt as saying, I find it best to sit tight. 23 Roosevelt sat tight and the fleet stayed at Pearl Harbor. Adam Kimmel, who inherited command from Richardson, said in his testimony before the Roberts Commission I knew that the Navy Department and the administration in Washington insisted on keeping the fleet out here. I knew of the vulnerability of the fleet here. I thought it was appreciated in the Navy Department as well as by me, but it was one of the things I felt was beyond my power to change. I had the choice of saying I would not stay and to get another commander in chief, or to remain. Naturally, I wish I had taken the other course at the present time, but I did not. 24 Adam Lee he testified that he was in complete disagreement with the school of thought which contended that the fleet, in Hawaii, could exercise a restraining influence on Japan. It was certainly not a restraining influence, Lee he said, if it was not ready for war. I'm in complete agreement with Adam Richardson on that. 25 Adam Kimmel said that, because of the depletion of fuel oil reserves, and because he possessed no air cover which would safeguard the fleet if it put to sea. He had no option except to keep his ships in harbor after dispatching his two carrier forces to Wake and Midway Islands on orders from Washington just before the Japanese surprise. It was also necessary to keep the ships in harbor, he said, 
so that they could be altered in line with current war experiences. 26 Adam Stark, in turn, said he had no criticism of Kimmel for keeping the remainder of the fleet, including eight battleships, in harbor. There was a difference of opinion in naval circles, he said, as to whether the fleet was safer at sea or in port, where there were harbor defenses and short-range fighter planes for protection. 27 From this testimony, it is apparent that the fatal mistake was in sending the fleet to Oahu in the first place. That decision was Roosevelt's. The Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, pages 49 to 53, observed the decision to base the fleet at Pearl Harbor was made by the President in March 1940, over the protest of Admiral Richardson. When this decision to base the fleet at Pearl Harbor was made, certain definite facts in relation to such base must be presumed to have been fully known and appreciated by the responsible command at Washington. The base is a shallow water base with limited base mobility with no chance for concealment or camouflage and without enough air beaches to properly park the necessary defensive air equipment. Entrance to the base is by a narrow winding channel requiring sorties at reduced speed, and in single file, and presenting the possibility of a blockade of the base by an air or submarine attack on the entrance. The base is surrounded by high land immediately adjacent to the city of Honolulu thereby affording full public familiarity with installations and movements within the base at all times. The base is located on an island where the population was heavily Japanese, and where, as was well known, Japanese espionage was rampant, and making it probable that any defensive insufficiency of any kind or nature would be open to Japanese information. All of the fuel for the base must be transported, by tanker, from the mainland more than 2,000 miles away, thus intensifying the necessity for complete defensive equipment and supplies for the base. The waters about Oahu are of a depth facilitating the concealed movement of submarines, and the near approach of submarines to the shore, thereby favoring such methods of hostile attack. The approaches to Oahu cover a full circle of 360 degrees with open sea available on all sides. The situation thus confronting the Pacific fleet upon reaching its Pearl Harbor base seems entirely clear. Before the base could be a safe base, it must be supplied with adequate defense facilities, which facilities must be in kind and amount in relation to the physical characteristics of the base above referred to. An absence of adequate defensive facilities directly increased the peril of the fleet. Since the decision to base the fleet at Pearl Harbor was made at Washington, the responsibility for providing proper base defense for the fleet rested primarily upon Washington. See Stark Letter, November 22, 1940, TR, Volume 5, pp. 706 ff. The record discloses that with full knowledge of the defense necessities inherent in the defense of the Pearl Harbor base, and with full knowledge of the dangers and peril imposed upon the fleet while based at the Pearl Harbor base, and with full knowledge of the equipment essential to a proper protection of the fleet at such base, it was decided by President Roosevelt to remove the fleet from the mainland bases and base it at Pearl Harbor. We are forced to conclude, therefore, that in view of the obligations assumed by the government in other military theaters, and the consequent inability of the government to properly contribute to the safety of the fleet at Pearl Harbor, that the only alternative left which might have relieved the fleet from the resultant peril would have been to have changed the original decision to base the fleet at Pearl Harbor, and thereupon return the fleet to its several mainland bases. It appears obvious that the safety of the fleet would have been helped by such removal. The perimeter of a defense at a mainland base would only be 180 degrees instead of 360 degrees, thus permitting distant patrol reconnaissance by one half as many planes. The transportation and supply facilities to the mainland base would be immensely improved, as would all necessary communication facilities. The mobility of the fleet at a mainland base would have been improved and the concentration of the fleet in a single limited base would have been avoided. We therefore are of the opinion that the fleet should not have been based at Pearl Harbor unless proper base defenses were assured. Since no such change in policy was approved, and the fleet remained based at Pearl Harbor without the necessary defense equipment to which we have referred, 
plus the fact that the precise status of the defense weakness must be assumed to have been open to the unusual Japanese espionage operating in Hawaii, and therefore that the Tokyo War Office must be assumed to have been cognizant of the status of affairs at Pearl Harbor, we are forced to conclude that the failure to remove the fleet from Pearl Harbor to the mainland must be viewed as an important relevant factor necessarily involved in the success of the Japanese attack on December 7. When asked before the Congressional Committee whether he thought the fleet, at Hawaii, was a deterrent to Japanese aggression, Adam Kimmel said the Jap attack on the fleet was a sufficient answer to this theory. They made an attack, he said. The facts speak for themselves. 28 CF. Pages 17 to 18. CF. P. 246. The two words were capitalized and underscored. CF. Pages 104 to 16, 367 69. The irresponsibility of the State Department in military matters is reflected in the statement in the Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, P. 29. The State Department seemed to labor under the impression that the United States could defeat Japan in a few weeks. The minority adds that the same kind of thinking permeated the annual report of Secretary of the Navy Knox, released December 6, 1941. The minority report of the Joint Congressional Committee, p. 54, states, the fuel reserves were insufficient, limiting full use of the fleet at sea required constant augmentation from the mainland, and the location of such fuel supplies was such as to make them vulnerable to any raiding attack. The fleet was required to come into the base at frequent intervals to refuel. The facilities at the base made such refueling slow. The fleet was without a sufficient supply of fast tankers to permit refueling at sea, and there was ever present the inescapable fact that a destruction of the fuel supply would necessarily immobilize the entire fleet. Chapter 6 Blueprint for Defeat Fleet suffered a crushing disaster on December 7, 1941, but the Japanese attack produced one unexpectedly advantageous result. With eight battleships knocked out, the fleet was forced to rely on carriers and fast cruisers. The change which the battleship admirals had rejected nine years before after Adam. Yarnell's simulated carrier attack on Oahu was thrust upon them by circumstances. At the time, however, few high officers viewed the matter in this light. In fact, a kind of paralysis seized the high command, and with the exception of a carrier raid by Adam. Halsey's task force in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands on January 31, 1942, the Pacific Fleet saw almost no action for many months to come. The attack on Pearl Harbor had demonstrated many flagrant errors in the traditional concepts held by the Army and Navy. Pearl Harbor in itself was valuable only as an advance fleet and air base from which American forces could sally forth to seek out an enemy and, as a collateral effect, protect the security of the mainland. Lying 2,091 miles west of San Francisco and 3,397 miles from Yokosuka Naval Base at Yokohama, it was strategically placed to serve as a springboard against Japan. Aside from the thesis of President Roosevelt and the State Department that the fleet at Pearl Harbor served as a deterrent to the Japanese. The fleet was at Hawaii for no other reason than to be able to take the offensive immediately war was declared and to advance against the Japanese fleet and Japanese outposts in the Pacific. It was necessary, of course, to prevent the Hawaiian Islands from falling into the hands of the enemy and especially to safeguard the fleet while it was in harbor. The division of responsibilities in achieving these purposes as outlined under the Joint Army-Navy Coastal Frontier Defense Plan which was approved April 11, 1941, was as follows a joint task to hold Oahu as a main outlying naval base, and to protect shipping in the coastal zone. B. Army task to hold Oahu against attacks by sea, land, and air forces, against hostile sympathizers, and to support the naval forces. C. Navy task to control the coastal zone and to control and protect shipping therein, 
and to support the army forces. One, the protection of the base and of the fleet was primarily the duty of the army, and for this purpose Oahu was garrisoned on December 7 by 40,469 men and 2,490 officers. Two, the army operated the coast defense guns, all anti aircraft batteries except those on naval ships, most of the pursuit aircraft on the island, an insure air patrol extending 20 miles to sea and the aircraft warning service. To the Navy was assigned distance reconnaissance extending from 200 to 600 miles to sea. Three, The very fact that the fleet was in harbor increased the responsibilities of the Army, because the fleet when tied up was not in a position to support the Army forces, either by reconnaissance or by being at sea on an operational basis in the waters adjacent to the islands. When in harbor, the fleet was temporarily immobilized and at its most vulnerable. The Army and Navy had, as they thought, made adequate provision for the protection of the base and fleet, but latent in the thoughts of the High Command was the belief that Pearl Harbor was itself invulnerable. This outlook was reflected in an aid memo on the defense of Hawaii, which Gen. Marshall delivered to President Roosevelt May 3, 1941. This memorandum stated flatly the island of Oahu, due to its fortification, its garrison, and physical characteristics, is believed to be the strongest fortress in the world. For the memorandum went on to say that any enemy force would be under constant attack from the time it approached within 750 miles of Oahu. This estimate presupposed that Hawaii had the necessary planes for long-range reconnaissance and was using them for that purpose, whereas neither fact was true. Kimmel took command of the Pacific Fleet on February 1, 1941. He was astounded at the then existing weakness of the Pearl Harbor defenses. Five, he consulted on these problems with Adam Richardson, whom he relieved as commander, and as a result, a letter under Richardson's signature was forwarded on January 25, 1941, to Secretary of the Navy Knox, who brought it to the attention of Henry L. Stimson, the Secretary of War. The most flagrant deficiencies pointed out in this letter were, a, the critical inadequacy of AA guns available for the defense of Pearl Harbor, necessitating constant manning of ships AA guns while in port. b, the small number and obsolescent condition of land-based aircraft, necessitating constant readiness of striking groups of fleet planes and use of fleet planes for local patrols. C. Lack of suitable local defense vessels for the 14th Naval District, etc. D. Lack of aircraft detection devices assured. 6. Although Washington promised to remedy these shortcomings, very little was done in the months leading up to the Japanese attack. Gen. Short also repeatedly complained to Washington of deficiencies in the resources allotted him. From February 7 to December 7, 1941, he made requests to Washington for 22,953,697 dollars to be used on projects to improve the Hawaiian defenses. He proposed to use this money for the installation of bunkers, military roads and trails, a battery for Kaneohe Bay, the construction of 10 airports, the improvement of Wheeler Field, camouflaging airfields, bomb-proofing the air depot at Hickam Field and for materials necessary to these projects. Of this requested sum, he was allowed by the War Department only $350,000 for roads and trails. This grant represented only one and one-half percent of what he had asked. Seven other difficulties were put in the way of the Army in organizing an effective defense. This was especially demonstrated in Short's struggle to obtain appropriate sites for the location of radar stations. On March 6, 1941, Short wrote Chief of Staff Marshall begging for prompt action in supplying modern aircraft detection units. He said that the detection range of equipment then available was only 5 miles. Eight, he reiterated the critical shortage of long range detector devices in a second letter to Marshall on March 15. The Chief of Staff on March 28 promised delivery of radar units in April or May. Nine three permanent radar sets were delivered on June 3 and six mobile radar stations on August. L. Ten five of the mobile stations were in operation December 7. 
but towers on which the permanent units were to be placed were still lying on the docks at Oakland, California, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, so that these three fixed sets were not operating December 7.11 Mela Guardia and Mrs. Roosevelt, running the Office of Civilian Defense, had been staging practice blackouts in New York and other cities and crying up the danger of transoceanic air raids on major American cities. One effect of this was that modern radar units were installed in New York, San Francisco, and Seattle before they were provided for the Bastion of Hawaii. Twelve additional obstruction was encountered from Secretary Harold Delick's Interior Department. The Park Service, which was a branch of this department, was more concerned with preserving the beauty of the landscape than with enabling Hawaii to defend itself. When Gen. Short proposed to place a radar station on Mount Hale Kala, the National Park Service withheld approval of the request. Short protested against Interior Department delays in his letter of March 6 to Marshall, saying, I believe that this matter is sufficiently important to be brought to the attention of the Secretary of War to see if permission cannot be obtained from the Secretary of the Interior to construct the Hale Kala installation without the necessity of submitting detailed plans for consideration by the National Park Service. 13 On March 15 Marshall wrote short, it will be necessary to comply with certain fixed regulations in those cases where facilities are to be established on lands pertaining to the Department of the Interior. The National Park Service officials are willing to give us the temporary use of their lands when other lands are not suitable for the purpose, but they will not waive the requirements as to the submission of preliminary building plans showing the architecture and general appearance. They are also very definitely opposed to permitting structures of any type to be erected at such places as will be open to view and materially alter the natural appearance of the reservation. 14 X department also got in the way of the Navy when it was endeavoring to construct a radio monitoring station at Wintu Harbor, Maine, in order to intercept secret Japanese code messages. The Winter Harbor station was on national park land and, as with the radar facilities in Hawaii, the Park Service would not permit trees to be cut down or the landscape to be otherwise altered. As a consequence, the Winter Harbor Station was handicapped by high trees around its antenna. 15 five radar stations, however, were operating on Oahu the morning of December 7. Although the stations had been operating every day from 4 o'clock to 7 a.m., with continued operation of three sets for training for a large portion of the day, they were ordered to close down on December 7 at 7 o'clock. Through one of those coincidences which bulked so large in the all-around lapse of defenses on December 7, a Signal Corps Second Lieutenant, Grove C. White, had obtained permission from the control officer the preceding day to close down the stations at that hour. 16 Another failure of equal concern was the absence of distance reconnaissance from Hawaii on the morning of the attack. This was a Navy task. The Army on December 7 had only six B-17s in flyable condition, 17 while 180 were required under its plans for search and attack upon the enemy. The Navy had 49 patrol planes in flyable condition. 18 All of these planes had arrived during the preceding four weeks. They were experiencing the shakedown difficulties of new planes. New engine sections which had cracked up required replacement. A program for the installation of leak proof tanks and armor was underway. There were no spare parts and no relief crews. Kimmel testified before the Congressional Investigating Committee to ensure an island base against a surprise attack from fast carrier based planes. It is necessary to patrol the evening before to a distance of 800 miles on a 360 degrees arc. This requires 84 planes on one flight of 16 hours. Of course, the same planes and the same crews cannot make that 16 hour flight every day. For searches of this character over a protracted period, a pool of 250 planes would be required. It is clear that I did not have a sufficient number of planes to conduct each day a 360 degree distance search from the island of Oahu. A search of all sectors of approach to an island base is the only type of search that deserves the name.
the Secretary of the Navy in his endorsement of the record of the Naval Court of Inquiry has stated, there were sufficient fleet patrol planes and crews, in fact, available at Oahu during the week preceding the attack to have flown, for at least several weeks, a daily reconnaissance covering 128 degrees to a distance of about 700 miles. This statement assumes that I could have used all the patrol force for this type of search alone without keeping any planes in reserve for emergency searches or to cover movements of ships in and out of the harbor and in the operating area. If I instituted a distant search of any 128 degrees sector around Oahu on and after November 27, within the foreseeable future I would have deprived the Pacific Fleet of any efficient patrol plane force for its prescribed war missions. 19 Kimmel emphasized that he had twice been directed to be prepared to carry out raids on the Marshall Islands under the Navy's war plan, which would become effective the moment that hostilities began and that his patrol planes were required for extended use from advance bases under this plan. He had to decide what was the best use of the patrol planes in view of the war tasks confronting him. Had he directed their use for intensive distant reconnaissances from Oahu, he faced the peril of having them grounded when the war plan was executed. His decision was to conserve the planes in order that he might go on the offensive in compliance with his standing orders under the war plan. 20 The Naval Court of Inquiry, which investigated the Pearl Harbor disaster in 1944, submitted this estimate of the decision reached by Kimmel. The task assigned the commander in chief, Pacific Fleet, was to prepare his fleet for war. War was known to be imminent, how imminent he did not know. The fleet planes were constantly being used in patrolling the operating areas in which the fleet's preparations for war were being carried on. Diversion of these planes for reconnaissance or other purposes was not justified under existing circumstances and in the light of available information. If so diverted, the state of readiness of the fleet for war would be reduced because of the enforced suspension of fleet operations. The value of the fleet patrol planes to the fleet would be reduced seriously after a few days because of the inability of planes and crews to stand up under the demands of daily long-range reconnaissance. The omission of this reconnaissance was not due to oversight or neglect. It was the result of a military decision, reached after much deliberation and consultation with experienced officers and after weighing the information at hand and all factors involved. 21 These were the reasons why Kimmel was not conducting distant reconnaissance on December the 6th to the 7th. First, he did not have the planes to do so. Second, the planes available to him were earmarked for tasks with the fleet under a predetermined war plan. On December 7 only a few planes were up on the dawn patrol, all of them to the south and west of Oahu, in the fleet operating area. If Kimmel had possessed the requisite number of planes, both for reconnaissance from Oahu and for patrol duty with the fleet, his task would have been simple. The danger to be expected from air attack had clearly been foreseen in at least two prophetic estimates. The first was the product of General Hugh A. Drum former commander of army forces in Hawaii. In 1935 he submitted a memorandum to the War Department in which he warned that Pearl Harbor, with its oil and ammunition storage and air installations on the island of Oahu, was extremely vulnerable to air attack. He further warned that the first enemy hostile action will be attempted as a surprise. One Oriental power, Gen. Drum wrote is strong enough in surface vessels and aircraft to execute successful air attacks against these objectives unless intercepted in sufficient time and with sufficient strength to defeat the attacks. Gen. Drum asserted that first information of approaching carriers must be obtained when they were at least 300 miles at sea to permit bombers to attack them before they could launch their planes. He recommended the establishment of airfields on the islands surrounding Oahu in order to reduce the flight time of intercepting bombers. 22 A reply from Major Gen. E. T. Conley, then Adjutant General of the Army, drafted in April, 1936, estimated that enemy carriers could approach within 600 to 900 miles of Oahu by dusk of the day preceding the attack, and then, after making a fast night run, 
launch their planes from between 275 and 330 miles of the target. Gen. Conley said that long-range search planes, not available at that time in sufficient numbers, accordingly would have to patrol an arc with a perimeter of 4,000 miles and would be faced with the difficult task of tracking the carriers at night. 23 radar for the detection of approaching aircraft had not yet been developed. The plan of attack which Gen. Drum outlined in 1936 was followed almost exactly by the Japs on December 7. The second prevision of the Jap attack was produced by Major General Frederick L. Martin and Vice Admiral Patrick N. L. Bilina, commanders of the Army and Navy Air Forces on Oahu at the time of Pearl Harbor. In an estimate drafted April 9, 1941, they said in the past Orange, Japan has never preceded hostile action by a declaration of war. A successful, sudden raid against our ships and naval installations on Oahu might prevent effective defensive action by our forces in the Western Pacific for a long period. It appears possible that Orange submarines and or an Orange fast trading force might arrive in Hawaiian waters with no prior warning from our intelligence service. Orange might send into this area one or more submarines and or one or more fast raiding forces composed of carriers supported by fast cruisers. It appears that the most likely and dangerous form of attack on Oahu might be an air attack. It is believed that at present such an attack would most likely be launched from one or more carriers, which would probably approach inside of 300 miles. In a dawn air attack there is a high probability that it would be delivered as a complete surprise in spite of any patrols we might be using and that it might find us in a condition of readiness under which pursuit would be slow to start. 24 This estimate also contained the significant line, any single submarine attack might indicate the presence of a considerable undiscovered surface force, probably composed of fast ships accompanied by a carrier. A submarine was, in fact, detected and sunk outside of Pearl Harbor by the destroyer ward a full hour before the attack, but the report of this action failed to produce a justified general alarm. On April 14 Martin and Bellina transmitted to Gen. Marshall their estimate of the danger from surprise air attack, which the Army Pearl Harbor Board termed prophetic in its accuracy and uncanny in its analysis of the enemy's intention. This document stated the Hawaiian Air Force is primarily concerned with the destruction of hostile carriers in this vicinity before they approach within range of Oahu where they can launch their bombardment aircraft for a raid or attack on Oahu. Our most likely enemy, Orange, can probably employ a maximum of six carriers against Oahu. The early morning attack is, therefore, the best plan of action open to the enemy. The most favorable plan of action open to the enemy and the action upon which we should base our plans of operation is the early morning attack in which the enemy must make good the following time schedule, 1, cross circle 881 nautical miles from Oahu at dawn of the day before attack. 3, launch his planes 233 nautical miles from Oahu at dawn the day of the attack. The sole purpose of the existence of the military establishment on Oahu, ground, and air, is for the defense of Oahu as an outlying naval base. Then, in a sharp comment on Gen. Marshall's memorandum to the President on the assumed strength of Oahu, the Martin Billiner report remarked, It has been said, and it is a popular belief, that Hawaii is the strongest outlying naval base in the world and could, therefore, withstand indefinitely attacks and attempted invasions. Plans based on such convictions are inherently weak and tend to create a false sense of security, with the consequent unpreparedness for offensive action. 25 If Martin and Bilin had had the Japanese operations orders before them, they could not have predicted the attack more accurately. Their report proposed to forestall the enemy by employment of long range bombardment aviation to intercept a surface fleet. This, as William Bradford Huey has pointed out in the case against the admirals, was the very act which the Baker Board appointed to survey the Army Air Corps in 1934 had proclaimed could never be performed, the very doctrine under which the General Headquarters Air Force had struggled to develop the B-17, the very principle which the Navy Command had railed against for twenty years and which they refused to accept even then in 1941. 
26 Martin and Billiner explained, the key to this plan is found in the provision for, first, a complete and thorough search of the Hawaiian area daily during daylight, secondly, an aerial attack force available on call to hit a known objective located as a result of the search, and thirdly, if the objective is a carrier, to hit it the day before it can steam up to a position offshore of Oahu where it could launch its planes for an attack. The report proposed a force of 180 B 17 flying fortresses for both search and attack. It was said that this plane was suitable for both functions and that, with 180 B 17s, all possible approaches could be swept every day up to a radius of 800 miles. The Admiral and General also asked for 36 long-range torpedo planes to supplement this force. The report said our leading tacticians and strategists here concur in the opinion that this plan will solve the defense of the Hawaiian Islands, and in our knowledge it is the best and only means that can be devised to locate enemy carriers and make attacks thereon before said carriers can come within launching distance of Oahu. We must ferret out the enemy and destroy him before he can take action to destroy us. We must be prepared for D-Day at any time. It is believed that a force of 184 motored aircraft with 36 long-range torpedo airplanes is a small force when compared with the importance of this outpost. This force can be provided at less cost to the government than the cost of one modern batship. 27 What happened to this plan in Washington? The Army Air Force endorsed it, the Navy refused even to consider it. Since 1935 the Navy had fought the Flying Fortress with every weapon it possessed. It had imposed a limitation that the Army should have no bombers capable of going more than 300 miles to sea. It had thrown the weight of the Navy lobby against every appropriation for land-based bombardment planes. The plan reached Washington at a time when the Navy was seeking huge appropriations for its new battleship program. Accordingly, the Navy sought to prevent the plan from being circulated among even the higher echelons of the War and Navy departments, let alone the responsible committeemen in Congress. Gen. Martin was sacked after the Pearl Harbor disaster at the same time as Gen. Shortened Adam. Kimmel, but when the Roberts Commission uncovered the Martin Billiner plan, they realized they had the wrong man for their purposes. Martin was hastily restored to duty and no further word of censure was breathed against him. Thus, the responsibility for failure to provide the means of reconnaissance and counterattack which would without question have saved Hawaii again comes home to Washington. Although aircraft production was lagging in 1941, there was a sufficient number of patrol planes to have assured the safety of Hawaii. If the planes had gone to Hawaii, instead of to Britain and other countries under the Roosevelt administration's policy. While the Hawaiian air commanders were clamoring for planes to safeguard the base, 1,900 patrol planes were being lend leased to foreign countries between February 1 and December 1, 1941. Of these, 1,750, or almost 10 times the number which would have rendered Oahu safe went to Great Britain. 28 Lend Lease was also the reason why Oahu was short of anti aircraft weapons. Gen. Short had available 82 3 inch anti aircraft guns on December 7, while 98 were required by defense plans. He had 20 37 mm anti aircraft guns, with 135 required. He had 109.50 caliber machine guns. With 345 required, he pointed out that the .50 caliber was the most effective weapon against planes coming in low over the water. Other weapons could not be depressed sufficiently to fire effectively on low flying planes. A year after the attack, Short said, Hawaii was equipped with more than seven times the number of these weapons he possessed. 29 replying to requests by Short for anti aircraft weapons, Gen. Marshall on March 15, 1941, said that 16 3-inch anti-aircraft guns were not slated for arrival in Hawaii until December, and that 115 37 mm anti-aircraft guns would not arrive until February, 1942.30 Despite this shortage of weapons, 
the army had 60 mobile guns and 26 fixed guns, in addition to its 37mm and .50 caliber anti-aircraft guns.31 The fact is, however, that only four of the army's 32 anti-aircraft batteries ever opened fire on the Japs, according to the army board, and the first of these to get into action, the detachment at Sand Island, did not fire its first shots until 20 minutes after the raid had begun. The next battery to get into action was Battery G at Fort Weaver, which began to fear 35 minutes after the raid started. It was followed by Battery U at Fort Kamamiya 39 minutes after the beginning of the raid and Battery F at Fort Kamamiya one hour after the raid had begun. The only battery which claimed any enemy planes was that at Sand Island, which shot down two, while with the exception of these four batteries no other was in position ready to fire until well after the departure of the last of the Japanese raiders.32 The principal reason for this general ineffectiveness was that ammunition had not been issued because the Ordnance Department objected to having it out convenient to the guns for fear that it might get dirty. Thus none of the 16 mobile guns was supplied with ammunition on December 7th. It required about six hours to get the ammunition broken out and distributed. The mobile guns had to obtain their ammunition from Malia Manu Crater, two to three miles from Army headquarters at Fort Shafter. Although the fixed batteries had their ammunition in boxes adjacent to the guns, few of them got into action because they were not manned. The Army Pearl Harbor Board found that most members of the two army divisions on Oahu were in their quarters when the attack began, and that it took them a number of hours to move out after the raid to their positions.33 The lack of ammunition was illuminated by the statement of Major General Henry T. Bergen, commander of the Coast Artillery, that it was almost a matter of impossibility to get your ammunition out because in the minds of everyone who has preservation of ammunition at heart it goes out, gets damaged, comes back in, and has to be renovated. The same was especially true here. It was extremely difficult to get your ammunition out of the magazines. We tried the ordnance people without results. General Max Murray and myself went personally to Jen. Short. Jen. Murray bled for his ammunition for the field artillery. I asked for ammunition for the anti-aircraft. We were put off, the idea behind it being that we would have our ammunition in plenty of time, that we would have warning before any attack ever struck.34 in this hope gen. Bergen was destined to be disappointed, but the ultimate responsibility for the failure to give warning in sufficient time rested with Washington, rather than with his immediate superiors. As it was. The failure to supply the guns with ammunition cannot be excused. The only utility of the guns in being in Hawaii at all was to be able to meet an attack where and when it developed. It is evident that the commanders thought if there were to be any attack, it would come in the form of an attempted landing in force, and in this event they would have sufficient time to move the guns and troops into position and to break out the ammunition. Like the Navy. The last thing the army was looking for was an air attack. The anti-aircraft guns of the fleet were in a better state of readiness to meet a surprise attack than were those of the army, but there was still room for improvement. Although Battle Report, the Navy's semi-official account of the Pearl Harbor attack, stated that American guns were firing before the first of the invading planes had cleared the scene of attack, 35 this was true only of a limited number of guns. For example, the officer of the deck on the light cruiser Helena, after sounding the general alarm, cried in the same voice, break out service ammunition. 36 The minimum of ready guns aboard fleet units was placed at 2.50 caliber guns, and, in most instances, two 5-inch dual-purpose guns.37 Secretary Knox, in a secret report after the attack said that it was about four minutes before the first anti-aircraft fire from the Navy began.38 The battleship Nevada, which was probably more successful than any other ship in getting its guns into action quickly, had four ready machine guns, two forward and two aft, which were able to open fire at once. They were joined shortly by the ship's five-inch anti-aircraft and broadside batteries, and, in combination, 
these weapons claimed five enemy planes.39 while putting up a comparatively more heavy curtain of fire than most of the other warships in Pearl Harbor, the Nevada could not avoid taking one torpedo and six bomb hits. This damage was sustained although the Nevada was the only warship in harbor to move away from the docks. A naval reservist, Lieutenant Comdre Francis J. Thomas, who was the senior officer aboard, is to be credited with this attempt to save the Nevada by getting her to open water where she could maneuver, but in the end the heavily damaged ship grounded near floating dry dock number 2. She was moved from that position by tugs and run aground in the shallow across from hospital point. As to volume of fire, the battleship Pennsylvania was credited with firing more than 50,000 rounds of .50 caliber ammunition during the attack, but, with this expenditure, could claim no more than two Japanese planes and four probables.40 in the confusion attending the attack, American anti-aircraft crews fired upon their own planes. Adam Kimmel told of six planes from the Enterprise being fired on as they came into Ford Island, and Rear Admiral Robert A. Theobald said that 18 scout bombers from the same carrier were fired upon late in the evening of December 7.41 American planes seeking the Japanese striking force after the attack also mistakenly bombed the cruise at Portland which was west of Pearl Harbor, believing it to be a Jap carrier but fortunately damage was slight. 42 The Navy Board of Inquiry said of the general state of preparedness aboard ship, on all ships inside Pearl Harbor a considerable portion of the anti-aircraft guns was kept manned day and night and with ammunition immediately at hand, but it qualified this finding with the statement, the anti-aircraft batteries installed on ships in Pearl Harbor were incapable of a volume of fire at all comparable to that of the batteries of the same ships today. 43 The primary reason for this was that the admirals had not yet awakened to the danger of air attack, but in part the lack of weapons was the result of administration policy which diverted material from our own forces and sent it to other nations, particularly Great Britain and Russia, under Lend Lease. While the Pearl Harbor commanders were appealing for anti aircraft, 1,900 anti aircraft weapons were sent to other nations between February and December. 1941, 1,500 of them to the British. 44 The underlying failure of the defences on December 7 must be attributed to the fact that the Army and Navy, both the High Command in Washington and the forces in the field, had still to catch up with the lessons of modern war as demonstrated in Europe after September 1, 1939. As usual, they were prepared to fight the war before last. The early success of the Japanese grew out of the fact that they, far more than our own services, had been willing to abandon obsolete concepts and fight a 1941 war in 1941. As was observed by the Associated Press reporter, Clark Lee, the Pearl Harbor attack was a psychological blow to many of our admirals. They had put their faith in those elephants, the battleships. Stripped of their battleships they were as lost as a man suddenly deprived of his trousers in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Their instinct was to cover up, to assume the defensive rather than to seek out the enemy for a finish fight. 45 At the time of the Pearl Harbor assault, despite a number of estimates that the principal danger to the fleet would come from surprise air attack, the Army was worried about sabotage and the Navy about training and danger from enemy submarines. Officers of both services undoubtedly felt that the fleet, behind a submarine net and with its own guns supplementing those of the base defenses, was safe. The admirals still held that the primary function of airplanes was to serve as the eyes of the fleet and to subserve battleships, scouting for them and protecting them while their 16 inch guns destroyed the enemy. Even with the lessons of war in the Mediterranean before them, the admirals were still accustomed to say that planes could inflict no great damage to battleships and were useful only in the degree that they could serve as spotters and increase the accuracy of battleship fire. No one in the American services had been warned of the danger of aerial torpedo attack, although the British in their assault on the Italian fleet at Taranto on November 11, 1940, had demonstrated the deadly results which could be obtained with this weapon. British torpedo planes taking the Italian fleet by surprise, had sunk or seriously damaged two battleships, two cruisers, 
a destroyer, and several supply ships. On January 24, 1941, Secretary Knox had listed an air torpedo plane attack as one of the possible forms of hostile action against Pearl Harbor. 46 Subsequently, Adam Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, forwarded to the Pacific Fleet and Adam Block, Commandant of the 14th Naval District, detailed technical advice which practically eliminated from consideration an air torpedo attack as a serious danger to ships moored in Pearl Harbor. The shallowness of the water in the harbor, which was 30 feet or less, except in the channels, where it was generally 45 feet, was thought to exclude an attack of this kind. On February 15, 1941, Stark wrote Kimmel with reference to the advisability of installing anti-torpedo baffles for protection of the ships in harbor. Stark said it is considered that the relatively shallow depths of water limit the need for anti-torpedo nets in Pearl Harbor. A minimum depth of water of 75 feet may be assumed necessary to successfully drop torpedoes from planes. 150 feet of water is desired. The maximum height of planes at present experimentally dropping torpedoes is 250 feet. Launching speeds are between 120 and 150 knots. The desirable height for dropping is 60 feet or less. About 200 yards of torpedo run is necessary before the exploding device is armed, but this may be altered. In this letter, Stark emphasized that the depths of water in which torpedoes were launched in the attack at Taranto were between 14 and 15 fathoms, that is, 84 to 90 feet of water. 47 Stark expressed these opinions despite the fact that on November 22, 1940, just after the Taranto attack, he had written Adam. Richardson, since the Taranto incident, my concern for the safety of the fleet at Pearl Harbor, already great, has become even greater. 48 On June 13, 1941, Stark sent another letter to Kim Mullandam. Block reaffirming his belief that Pearl Harbor was safe from torpedo attack. 49 The Naval Court of Inquiry concluded that the torpedoes launched by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor constituted, in effect, a secret weapon unknown to the best professional opinion in Great Britain and the United States at the time. 50 Adam King, wartime commander in chief of the fleet, said in his endorsement of the findings of the court, it is evident in retrospect that the capabilities of Japanese aircraft torpedoes were seriously underestimated. 51 Secretary of the Navy Forrestal noted, however, that in April, 1941, an intelligence report had been circulated in the Navy Department describing demonstrations in England in which torpedoes equipped with special wings had been launched in 42 feet of water, about the same depth as in Pearl Harbor. 52 No word of these findings ever was sent to Adam Kimmel, nor was Adam Stark impressed by them as he should have been. Despite these facts, Forrestal, in overruling the findings of the Navy Board and putting the blame on Kimmel, said that a due appreciation of the possible effects of an air attack should have induced Adam Kimmel to take all practical precautions to reduce the effectiveness of such an attack. Among the measures which Forrestal said were reasonably open to Kimmel was to install anti-torpedo nets to protect the larger vessels in port. 53 In other words, Forrestal wanted Kimmel to display a prescience which was not possessed either by the Chief of Naval Operations or the Navy Department in general, and wanted him, moreover, to procure and install anti-torpedo nets or baffles which the fleet in Hawaii did not have the facilities to manufacture. On February 15, 1941, Stark informed Kimmel that existing torpedo nets were so cumbersome that their installation at Pearl Harbor would interfere with the movement of ships and ability of the fleet to get away on short notice. He said, there is apparently a great need for the development of a light efficient torpedo net which could be laid temporarily and quickly within protective harbors, and which can be readily removed. 54 Kimmel was later to state that if such a net was ever developed by the Navy Department, he never heard of it or received it. That neglect in taking proper precautions against torpedoes was attributable to the Navy Department, rather than to Kimmel, was admitted by Adam King when he said in his endorsement of the Navy Board's report, 
the decision not to install torpedo baffles appears to have been made by the Navy Department. 55 There was a great deal of wisdom after December 7 on the part of responsible officials in Washington, but very little before the attack. Secretary Knox, for example, in his report to President Roosevelt upon his return from an inspection trip to Pearl Harbor following the attack, said that the principal fear of the Army had been sabotage and that of the Navy submarine attack, and that neither was expecting or sufficiently prepared to defend against air attack. The only specific measure of protection against air attack taken by the Navy was to disperse the ships in harbor so as to provide a field of fire covering every approach from the air.56 Despite the many mistakes of the mission and commission at Oahu on December 7, the main deficiency of the Pearl Harbor defense was the absence of a proper state of readiness to meet attack. These conditions of readiness in Hawaii on December 7 were known to Washington and had its tacit approval. They were not countermanded, nor were more forcible orders sent. The commanders in Hawaii had been denied access to intelligence available in Washington which, as the Army Board points out, conclusively established a condition of known impending war. If the degree of readiness prevailing at Oahu did not satisfy the government and high command, they had recourse to a simple remedy. All they needed to do was to issue orders directing the Hawaiian commanders to institute an all-out alert. No such orders ever were sent. Four years after Pearl Harbor this ultimate responsibility on the part of Washington was finally admitted by Gen. L. T. Jiro, Chief of Army War Plans in 1941. He conceded that Gen. Short was justified in assuming his defense alert number one had the full approval of the Army High Command. This admission followed the reading to the Congressional Committee of Excerpts from the Staff Officer's Field Manual, stating that the General Staff is responsible for making sure its instructions to field commanders are understood and for enforcing execution of such instructions. 57 CF. Minority Report of Joint Congressional Committee, p. 55, the installation of the radar in Hawaii was inexcusably delayed. It was a method of defense peculiarly essential in Hawaii. It was known that there were insufficient planes and insufficient guns to protect the base, and this made the availability of radar all the more necessary. It seems we could have priority for radar protection in New York and other mainland points, where no attack was probable, but none in Hawaii where radar information was essential. The result was that fixed radio installations were not accomplished at all prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, and such fixed installations would have furnished the most distant services. The mobile sets available had, by reason of the delay, been operating only on a short experimental basis. There was a scarcity of trained operators. The operators were trying to learn and operate at the same time. The selected hours of operation, which proved of vast importance, were not wisely fixed. Service stopped at 7 a.m., the very time when the danger was acute. Major General Maxwell Murray commanded the 25th Infantry Division. There were 780 naval anti-aircraft guns, all ship-based, Major P. 67. Chapter 7 Backdoor to War For years before Pearl Harbor Mr. Roosevelt had talked of peace. For months he had schemed for war. His deeds belied his words. These are some of the things he said, and some of the things he did at Chautauqua, New York, August 19, 1936, he said, I hate war. One at the dedication of the Chicago Outer Drive Bridge on October 5th. nineteen thirty seven he proposed a quarantine of aggressors two to students of the University of North Carolina on December fifth nineteen thirty eight he denied that you and your little brothers would be sent to the bloody fields of Europe three on January fourth nineteen thirty nine he urged repeal of the arms embargo and resort to methods short of war but stronger than words to deter aggressors four in the same month he told the Senate Military Affairs Committee the American frontier is on the Rhine. 5 On April 15, 1939, he said that the only excuse for war was self-evident home defense. Which, does not mean defense thousands and thousands of miles away. 6 In June, 
1939, he received King George VI and Queen Elizabeth of Great Britain at the White House when they made an unprecedented visit to the United States three months before war began in Europe. On October 26, 1939, almost two months after the start of the European War, he described as one of the worst fakes in current history protests against sending the boys of American mothers to fight on the battlefields of Europe. 7 On November 4, 1939, after his fourth appeal to Congress in a year, neutrality legislation was revised to permit cash and carry shipments of arms to belligerents. 8 On June 10, 1940, when Belgium and Holland had capitulated, the British Army had fled from Dunkirk, and France was collapsing. He described Italy's declaration of war as a stab in the back of France. 9 On June 20, he enrolled the erstwhile Republicans, Frank Knox and Henry L. Stimson, in his cabinet as secretaries, respectively, of Navy and War, in order to further his third term aspirations and suggest coalition support of his war policy. 10 During June, he stripped American arsenals to re equip the British Army which had abandoned its arms at Dunkirk. 11 On August 18, 1940, he executed a defence pact with Canada, 12 a belligerent, encouraging Prime Minister Churchill of Britain to observe two days later that the Empire and America were somewhat mixed up together. 13 On August 28, Roosevelt mustered the National Guard into federal service. 14 On September 2, 1940, by executive decree, he transferred 50 American destroyers to Britain for rights to bases in British possessions in the Western Hemisphere. 15 On September 16, he signed the first peacetime conscription bill in America's history, under which 42 million men were enrolled October 16 for military duty. 16 At Boston, October 30, 1940, campaigning for the third term, he assured parents, I have said this before but I shall say it again and again and again, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. 17 On November 8, 1940, after his re-election, he allocated half of American war production to Britain. 18 The effect of the third term victory upon Britain was described by Adam Stark in a letter November 12, 1940, to Adam Hart, Commander-in-Chief of the Asiatic Fleet. Stark reported, Gormley. Vice Admiral Robert L. Gormley, naval observer in London, tells me that the British expected us to be in the war a few days after the re-election of the President, which is merely another evidence of their slack ways of thought and of their non-realistic views of international political conditions and of our own political system. 19 On December 17, 1940, Roosevelt proposed Lend-Lease to eliminate the silly foolish old dollar sign in paying Britain's war bills. 20 On December 29, 1940, he announced that the United States was to become the arsenal of democracy, but told the people they could nail any talk about sending armies to Europe as deliberate untruth. 21 Churchill on February 9, 1941, echoed, Give us the tools, and we will finish the job. 22 On January 24, 1941, Roosevelt ignored protocol by hastening to Annapolis to greet Lord Halifax, the new British ambassador, who had arrived on the battleship King George V. 23 On March 11, 1941, he signed the Lend-Lease Act, which made the United States, to all intents and purposes, a belligerent. 24 More than $49 billion in aid was to be granted under Lend-Lease. 25 On April 9, 1941, Mr. Roosevelt transferred ten Coast Guard cutters to the British and assumed a protectorate over Greenland. 26 On May 29, 1941, he permitted British airmen to train here. 27 On June 14, 1941, he froze German and Italian funds and, on June 16, ordered consular staffs of the two nations out of the United States. 28 On June 22, he promised Russia support in its new war with Germany. 2 On July 7, 1941, he ordered American Marines into Iceland to relieve the British garrison. 30 During the same month, thousands of American workers streamed into London Derry, North Ireland, to build a great American naval base. 31 On August 14, 1941, 
Roosevelt and Churchill proclaimed the Atlantic Charter after a meeting at sea off Newfoundland. 32 The Selective Service Act was extended on the same day and the previous limitation that not more than 900,000 men should be in training at one time was removed. 33 On September 11, 1941, after torpedoes were fired at the destroyer Greer near Iceland, Roosevelt issued an order to the Navy to shoot on sight if German or Italian warships were encountered. 34 On October 27, 1941, in his Navy Day speech, Roosevelt announced to the country that the shooting has started and we Americans have cleared our decks and taken our battle stations. 35 On November 17, 1941, Roosevelt received authority to arm merchant ships. 36 On November 24, he sent troops to occupy Dutch Guiana, source of the bauxite for 60% of America's aluminium production. 37 These were the things he was doing and saying openly. Here are some of the things that he was doing secretly on April 21, 1941. He directed units of the Atlantic Fleet to trail German and Italian merchant and naval ships and aircraft and to broadcast their movements in plain language at four-hour intervals for the convenience of British and Allied warships and planes. 38 On May 22, 1941, he ordered them. Stark to prepare an expedition of 25,000 men to seize the Azores from neutral Portugal. 39 Plans to seize Martinique. French possession in the Caribbean, were laid at the same time. 40 On August 11, 1941, at the Atlantic Conference, he revived the plan to seize the Azores, which had been left in abeyance. Prime Minister Churchill agreed at the same time that Britain would seize the Canary Islands from Spain and the Cape Verde Islands from Portugal. 41 On August 25, Roosevelt ordered the Atlantic Fleet to destroy surface raiders. 42 On September 13, 1941, he ordered the fleet to protect ships of any nationality between American ports and Iceland, and to escort convoys in which there were no American vessels. 43 On September 14, the crew of the Coast Guard cut a Northland seized a German trawler in Greenland waters and took the first prisoners of a war not yet acknowledged. 44 On September 26, Roosevelt promulgated Western Hemisphere Defense Plan No. 5, which, while assigning new tasks to the fleet, stated that it must be recognized that the United States is not at war in the legal sense, and hence would have no belligerent rights under international law. 45 On October 11, 1941, he implemented this Hemisphere Defense Plan with an order assigning American warships to operations under British and Canadian Naval Command and placing 60 British Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy destroyers and corvettes engaged in convoying under the strategic direction of the United States. 46 On November 7, 1941, a month before Pearl Harbor, Adam Stark, referring to this non-declared war, wrote to Adam Kimmel, whether the country knows it or not, we are at war. 47 Stark told the Congressional Investigating Committee that he was thinking of the interchange of command among American, British, and Canadian warships and orders he had issued at the President's direction to fire on German submarines. He said his own opinion was that the time had come for us to get in the war. 48 Representative Gerhardt asked Stark, it was because of action which the President was directing from day to day against the Germans and the consequent exchange of fire with German submarines that caused you to state we were at war in the Atlantic before Pearl Harbor? 49 That is correct, Stark replied. Technically, or from an international standpoint, we were not at war, inasmuch as we did not have the right of belligerence because war had not been declared. But actually, so far as the forces operating under Adam King in certain areas, it was war against any German craft that came inside that area. They were attacking us and we were attacking them. 50 He said that American warships were considered to be enforcing the congressional will to deliver land lease supplies. And there was no limit upon their belligerent rights in so far as serving that objective, was there? Gerhardt inquired. It was not all out, said Stark. It was limited, but it was effective and it was war, to my mind. 
when you are shooting at the other fellow and he is shooting at you, it to all intents and purposes is war, even though of a restricted nature. We were not, for example, flying planes over Germany. 51 Citing the President's Navy Day speech, in which Roosevelt recounted that 11 members of the crew of the destroyer Kearney had been killed by submarine action, Gerhardt said, that shows that they were making war on us, too, doesn't it? Yes it does, Stark said. I am simply trying, I know, Gerhardt interrupted. You are trying to point out the legalistic differences. Stark conceded under further examination by Senator Ferguson that the orders for the non-declared Atlantic war came from Roosevelt. Where we state, the president directs, it was his directive, the admiral said. No one but the president, I would say, could direct us to take the action indicated in those plans. 52 that would indicate, though, suggested Ferguson, that congressional approval was not considered necessary for an overt act. I do not know that you would call an act an overt act if you considered it in self-defense or in defense of carrying out the congressional will of getting material abroad, Stark responded. Long before Pearl Harbor other high officers were also proceeding on the assumption that we would inevitably be fighting beside the British before long. In an undated memorandum in the summer of 1941, Gen. Marshall informed Roosevelt, Britain is reaching the limit of usable manpower. We must supplement her forces. Germany cannot be defeated by supplying munitions to friendly powers and air and naval operations alone. Large ground forces will be required. 53 Madge. General Sherman Miles, former Chief of Army Intelligence, said that throughout 1941 he considered that the European war represented a much bigger picture than any threat from Japan. 54 His intelligence estimate for November 29, 1941, stated, the United States is contributing powerfully to the decision in the Battle of the Atlantic by direct naval action. On December 5, two days before the Pearl Harbor attack, his estimate contended that American naval power and economic blockade are primary deterrents against Japanese all-out entry into the war. 55 Adam. Ingersoll agreed that in the fall of 1941 the Navy knew it was committing overt acts which could provoke Germany to declare war. 56 In that he echoed the statement of Adam. Stark, who, on October 8, 1941, in a memorandum to Secretary Hull, said that Hitler has every excuse in the world to declare war on us now if he were of a mind to. 57 Vice Adam. Smith said that Washington thought that the war was in the Atlantic. 58 As the Atlantic war mounted, the Pacific fleet was stripped of important units and trained personnel to support the operations in the other ocean. When the Azores seizure was first planned in May, 1941, Practically all of the trained and equipped marines on the west coast, six transport, and some other small craft, were transferred from the Pacific to the Atlantic. 59 Gen. Marshall withheld 14 flying fortresses from Hawaii for the same operation. 16 April and May, 1941, one aircraft carrier, three battleships, four cruisers, and 18 destroyers. Approximately one fourth of the fighting ships of the Pacific Fleet were transferred to the Atlantic. Stark described these fleet units as the first echelon of the Battle of the Atlantic. 61 in June, 1941, when he visited Washington, Adam Kimmel intervened personally with Roosevelt to save three more of his battleships, four cruisers, two squadrons of destroyers, and an aircraft carrier. 62 according to Rear Adam. Ingalls, the United States had 105 fighting craft in the Pacific before the transfers in May, 1941, compared to 162 in the Jap fleet. 63 On December 7, Ingalls said, American fleet dispositions were as follows Vessel Atlantic Pacific Asiatic battleships 690 carriers 430 heavy cruisers 5,121 light cruisers 12101 destroyers 975413 submarines 582329 mine layers 090 mine sweepers 37266 patrol vessels 51314 totals 224159 
1964 although the computation of Adam Ingalls showed 159 units in the Pacific Fleet, we were actually outnumbered in the major categories of surface craft, 162 to 78. On December 7th, the comparison follows vessel U.S. Japan battleships 910 carriers, 38 light and heavy cruisers, 2,235 destroyers, 54109. Almost all of the naval officers who testified before the Congressional Committee conceded that because of transfers of fleet units and lend lease diversions to Britain and other nations, the defences of Pearl Harbor were seriously impaired and the fleet in any encounter with the Japanese, would have been defeated. The Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, Conclusion 17, pages 49 to 50, says on this point high authorities in Washington failed to allocate to the Hawaiian commanders the material which the latter often declared to be necessary to defense and often requested and no requirements of defense or war in the Atlantic did or could excuse these authorities for their failures in this respect. The first part of this conclusion calls for no special citations of authority. In reports of the President's Commission, of the Army Pearl Harbor Board, and of the Navy Court of Inquiry, three points in this respect are accepted as plain facts. 1. The ultimate power to allocate arms, ammunition, implements of war, and other supplies was vested in the President and his aide, Harry Hopkins, subject to the advice of Gen. Marshall and Adam. Stark, to, Gen. Short and Adam. Kimmel made repeated demands upon their respective departments for additional material, which they represented as necessary to the effective defense of Pearl Harbor, and, three, Washington authorities, having full discretion in this regard, made decisions against Gen. Shortened Adam. Kimmel and allocated to the Atlantic Theater, where the United States was at least nominally at peace, materiel, especially bombing and reconnaissance planes, which were known to be absolutely indispensable to efficient defense of Pearl Harbor. See Exhibits 106 and 53, Request for Materials. The second part of this conclusion may be arguable from the point of view of some high world strategy but it is not arguable under the Constitution and laws of the United States. The President, it is true, had powers and obligations under the Lease Lend Act of March, 1941. But his first and inescapable duty under the Constitution and laws was to care for the defense and security of the United States against a Japanese attack, which he knew was imminent, and, in the allocations of materiel, especially bombing and reconnaissance planes, he made or authorized decisions which deprived the Hawaiian commanders of indispensable materiel they could otherwise have had and thus reduced their defensive forces to a degree known to be dangerous by high officials in Washington and Hawaii. In a secret report to Roosevelt December 15, 1941, Secretary Knox said that lack of an adequate number of fighter planes to defend Hawaii against air attack is due to the diversion of this type before the outbreak of the war to the British the Chinese, the Dutch, and the Russians. He said there had been a dangerous shortage of anti-aircraft artillery, the next best weapon against air attack, through no fault of Gen. Short.64 As has been seen, the United States in the ten months before Pearl Harbor lend leased 1,900 patrol planes and 1,900 anti-aircraft guns of which 1,750 planes and 1,500 guns went to the British. In February, 1941, when this country was deficient 10,000 planes in its 14,000 plane program, Britain was asking America to deliver 50,000 planes in 1942. At the time this request was made, Army plans called for the dispatch of only 81 fighter planes to Pearl Harbor. 65 Col. Melvin W. Maz, of the Marine Corps Reserve, former Minnesota congressman, said that when 250 patrol bombers necessary to bring Hawaii up to required minimum strength of 300 planes came off the production lines, Washington ordered them sent to Britain. When protests were made to Roosevelt, he referred the admirals to Harry Hopkins, in charge of allocating war materials. Hopkins received them as he lay in bed, nonchalantly smoking a cigarette, 
said Maz. He listened to them, then told them the interview was over and that he had already made the allocation. Adam. Kimmel told me if those 250 patrol planes had been sent to Hawaii, the December 7th attack could never have succeeded, and probably would never have been attempted. 66 Prime Minister Churchill made some acknowledgement of the effect of Lend-Lease in handicapping American defense when, in an address to the United States Senate December 26, 1941, he said, if the United States has been found at a disadvantage at various points in the Pacific Ocean, we know well that it is to no small extent because of the aid which you have been giving us in munitions for the defense of the British Isles and to the Libyan campaign, and above all, because of your help in the Battle of the Atlantic. 67 Capt. Edwin T. Layton, intelligence officer of the Pacific Fleet, asserted that if the fleet had been able to spot the approaching Jap force before December 7 and had gone out to meet it, we would have been beaten. Our battleships, he said, were too slow to have brought the Jap vessels under gunfire, and the remainder of our fleet would have suffered severe damage if not defeat by reason of the great enemy superiority in the air. 68 Although Secretary of War Stimson promised to rectify Hawaii's deficiencies in patrol bombers, fighter planes, anti-aircraft guns, and aircraft warning equipment by June, 1941, Rear Adm. Block, Pearl Harbor Base Defense Officer, complained four months after the Secretary's deadline had passed that the only increment that had been made to the local defense forces during the last year, exclusive of, harbor, net vessels, was the USS Sacramento, an old gunboat of negligible gun power and low speed. 69 Adm. Kimmel forwarded Adm. Block's letter on October 17, 1941 with a complaint of his own concerning the reluctance or inability of the Navy Department to provide him the vessels he asked. A fleet, tied to its base by diversions to other forces of light forces necessary to its security at sea is, in a real sense, no fleet at all, Kimmel said. 70 Not only had the light screening units been diverted to patrol duty in the Atlantic, and 50 highly useful overage destroyers given to the British by Roosevelt been lost to our fleet, but Kimmel had only 11 tankers when 75 were necessary to keep his fleet at sea. 71 This fact, together with Washington's failure to maintain adequate fuel deliveries for the fleet, condemned the Pacific commander to a policy of keeping a substantial part of the fleet in harbor like sitting ducks. Thus President Roosevelt weakened the Pacific fleet and the Pearl Harbor defenses to sustain the non-declared war into which he had plunged in the Atlantic. Although he was itching to get into the war in Europe, Hitler would not oblige him with an incident of sufficient gravity to take the nation to war. Grand Admiral Karl Dennitz, testifying at the Nuremberg war crimes trials, told the International Tribunal that Hitler was so anxious to keep the United States out of the European war that he overruled the Admiral's plans to mine North Atlantic shipping lanes carrying land-lease supplies to Britain. Dennett said a 300-mile safety zone was even granted to America by Germany when international law called for only a 3-mile zone. I suggested minefields at Halifax and around Iceland, but the FWA rejected this because he wanted to avoid conflict with the United States. When American destroyers in the summer of 1941 were ordered to attack German submarines, I was forbidden to fight back. I was thus forced not to attack British destroyers for fear there would be some mistake. 72 The President's dilemma was frankly discussed by his sympathizers of the War Party. As early as June, 1941, Joseph Falsop and Robert Kintner, a pair of columnists favored by the White House, Alsop was a relative of the president, wrote, in the last week, he, the president, has been repeatedly urged to order immediate action. He has been warned that to delay is to court disaster. He has been able to act, for all the preparations for meeting the Germans threat in the Battle of the Atlantic have at last been completed. Yet he has not acted because he hopes to drive the Germans to shoot first. The problem was mentioned in this space in a recent discussion of the Atlantic Patrol, in which it was pointed out that the President and the men around him privately hoped that the patrol would produce an incident.
No man can doubt the German High Command will do everything possible to avoid shooting first. The writers attributed the president's hesitation to his many pledges to stay out of war. He does not feel he can openly violate them, they said. But he can get around them the smart way. 73 The smart way was to provoke an attack. The Pact of Berlin, signed September 27, 1940, suggested a method to the president. It pledged Germany, Italy, and Japan to assist one another with all political, economic, and military means when one of the three contracting parties is attacked by a power at present not involved in the European war or the Sino Japanese conflict. Germany was then committed to its uneasy non-aggression treaty with Russia, while Japan had specifically accepted Russia from application of the treaty. Inasmuch as the United States was the only other remaining power that need be reckoned with, the Pact of Berlin obviously was directed against it. The tripartite pact had, in the eyes of Roosevelt, a utility which its authors had not intended. It offered a means of entering the war in Europe by the back door for war with Japan also meant war automatically with Germany and Italy under the terms of the pact. Thus, while the attention of the nation was almost wholly trained by official acts and utterances upon the war in Europe, the president simultaneously precipitated a crisis with Japan. The idea of a Japanese-American conflict was not viewed unsympathetically in Berlin. The Nazis had doubts about the dependability of their Asiatic ally. They did not want to chance Japan's response under its tripartite pact commitments by initiating a war with America themselves. But if Japan could be induced to attack the United States, Hitler could hope that the natural sense of outrage in the United States would divert America's major effort to the Pacific, leaving him free to complete his unfinished business. On July 6, 1941, shortly after Germany went to war with Russia, Ambassador Gru stated Hitler's strategy, it is generally held that what Germany most wants Japan to do is to take steps which will tend to divert America's attention from Europe and that she is not pressing Japan to intervene in Soviet Russia. 74 Accordingly, the Nazis began attempting to work a confidence game on their Asiatic allies. These efforts to hoodwink the Japs were continued unrelentingly up to the very moment that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor but they might not have been attended with success if American diplomacy had not finally presented the Japanese with the choice between fighting and capitulating. On November 29 Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister, was found using all of his power of persuasion upon Major Gen. Oshima, the Japanese ambassador in Berlin. Ribbentrop said, it is essential that Japan effect the new order in East Asia without losing this opportunity. There never has been and never will be a time when closer cooperation under the tripartite pact is so important. If Japan hesitates at this time, and Germany goes ahead and establishes her European new order, all the military might of Britain and the United States will be concentrated against Japan. If Japan reaches a decision to fight Britain and the United States, I am confident that that will not only be in the interest of Germany and Japan jointly, but would bring about favorable results for Japan herself. Is your excellency indicating that a state of actual war is to be established between Germany and the United States? Oshima asked. Ribbentrop was reluctant to promise that his country be the first to dive off the deep end. Roosevelt's a fanatic. He cautiously replied, so it is impossible to tell what he would do. 75 The view that a wary Germany employed all possible cunning to entice Japan into an attack upon the United States is fully supported by the verdict of the International War Crimes Tribunal at Nuremberg. The court found that Germany repeatedly urged Japan to attack the British in the Far East after the Nazi attack upon Russia. It was further stated in the verdict it was clear, too that the German policy of keeping America from the war if possible did not prevent Germany from promising support to Japan even against the United States. The court referred to Ribbentrop's representations to Oshima and said that the Nazi foreign minister was overjoyed when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Hitler, the court stated, 
expressed approval of Japan's tactics in striking without a declaration of war. 75 A in Rome Mussolini promised that Italy would give every military aid she had at her disposal if Japan were to fight Britain and America. 76 to stiffen Japan's resolution, Hitler worked a huge military fraud upon the Japanese. On December 6 Berlin was heralding the imminent fall of Moscow. On December 8, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hitler's forces were in full retreat to a predetermined winter line. Seventy-seven the Japs were taken in, with Germany unwittingly assisting the president in attaining his objective. Davis and Lindley wrote, the question perplexing many high officials was how, in the absence of a direct Japanese attack on the American flag, to summon the nation, divided as it then was on questions of foreign policy, to the strong action which they believed essential. There had been considerable discussion of possible methods. It was commonly supposed that the Japanese were too smart to solve this problem for the president by a direct assault on the American flag, especially at Hawaii, which even the extreme isolationists recognized as a bastion of our security. The Japanese were not smart enough. 78 On November 29, 1941, at Warm Springs, Georgia, Roosevelt had given intimations of war to come. In days like these, he said, our Thanksgiving next year may remind us of a peaceful past, it is always possible that our boys in the military and naval academies may be fighting for the defense of these American institutions of ours. 79 This was a pallid statement of the realities which he then knew to exist. He knew for a certainty that war was not a matter of months or a year, but of days. He knew that not only our boys in the military and naval academies would be called to arms, but all able bodied young men. And he knew that the war would start, not in the Atlantic, but in the Pacific. Our stake in the Far East was not great. In recent years, less than 3% of our foreign trade had been with China, including the British colony of Hong Kong, and trade with China amounted to less than half of our trade with Japan, which had been America's third best customer taking 7.7% .7 of total American exports in 1938. The United States, in turn, was Japan's best customer, 6.5% of our imports coming from the dot 80. The interests threatened by Japan in Asia and the Southwest Pacific were, with the exception of China, almost wholly the interests of the Western empires, Britain, France, and Holland. None of them was capable by the final month of 1941 of defending its colonial holdings. It was clear to these nations long in advance of Pearl Harbor that the United States was their one hope in resisting a Japanese rape of their colonies. By December 7, 1941, we had tolerated Japan's war against China for 53 months. We might not like it. But the conflict was not regarded as of sufficient concern to send America into battle. It was only when Japan began to impinge upon the prerogatives of the Western imperialisms that the president began to display symptoms of the moral outrage he usually reserved for Hitler and Mussolini. On September 22, 1940, three months after the collapse of France, the Japanese began to move in on the Western empires. Japanese troops were marched into French Indochina and the colonial authorities acceded to Japan's demands for air bases. 81 On July 21, 1941, France acquiesced when Japan demanded military control of Indochina. 82 This action was defended on the grounds that it was necessary to provide for Japan's military security and to assure Japan a supply of rice and other foodstuffs and raw materials. In Washington Ambassador Nomura pleaded the severity of the food situation. Japan's production of rice in 1941 was estimated at 297 million bushels, against an annual consumption of 400 million bushels. 83 Britain had embargoed the export of rice from Burma, 84 while lack of fertilizer normally obtained from Germany had cut down Japan's domestic production. As a result, Japan was compelled to look to Indochina for its supple dot In answer to these representations, some Noels, Under Secretary of State, 
told Nomura on July 23 that there was no basis for pursuing further the diplomatic conversations which had been in progress since March looking toward a peaceful settlement of America's differences with Japan. Wells said that the United States must assume that the Japanese government was taking the last step before proceeding upon a policy of totalitarian expansion in the South Seas and of conquest in the South Seas through the seizure of additional territories in that region. 85 relations between the United States and Japan had been deteriorating for four years before the seizure of Indochina. Afterward the process continued at an accelerated rate. The successive steps follow on December 12, 1937, three months after Roosevelt's quarantine speech, Japanese warplanes bombed and sank the American gunboat Panay in the Yangtze River. 86 on July 1, 1938, after the Japanese had bombed Nanking, Canton, and other defenseless Chinese cities, the State Department asked for a moral embargo on sales of aircraft which might be used in attacks on civilians. 87 On July 26, 1939, Roosevelt gave notice that the Japanese American Commercial Treaty of 1911 would be abrogated as of January 26, 1940. 88 Ambassador Gru remarked of this developing economic warfare. I have pointed out that once we started on a policy of sanctions we must see them through and that such a policy may conceivably lead to eventual war. 89 Further American action manifested the intention of seeing them through. On July 2, 1940, Roosevelt licensed exports of machine tools, chemicals, and non ferrous metals. 90 On July 25, he licensed exports of oil products and scrap metal. 91 On July 31, he licensed exports of aviation gasoline beyond the Western Hemisphere. 92 On September 25, 1940, he granted China a $25 million loan for currency stabilization. 93 On September 26, he imposed an embargo, effective October 16 on all exports of scrap iron and steel except to Britain and nations of the Western Hemisphere. 94 Between 1933 and 1940, 10.16 million tons of scrap had been shipped from this country to Japan. 95 Japan termed the embargo an unfriendly Act 96 and stated that further trade restrictions would make relations between the two countries unpredictable. 97 On October 8, 1940, American nationals were warned to leave the Far East. 98 On November 30, 1940, an additional $100 million loan was made to China. 99 Wednesday. Nomura came here as Japan's new ambassador early in 1941. He said that he doubted that Japan would extend military operations beyond their present sphere unless the policy of increasing embargoes by this country should force his government, in the minds of those in control to take military action. 100 On March 11, 1941, with the enactment of Lend-Lease, material aid was granted the Chinese as well as the British. 101 On April 26, 1941, the United States announced a monetary stabilization accord with China. Lao Klin Curry, the president's administrative assistant, was dispatched to China to help straighten out its finances. 102 On July 25, 1941, four days after Japan occupied Indochina, Roosevelt froze Japanese assets of $130 million in the United States, thus ending trade relations. 103 Britain followed suit the next day. 104 On July 26, the president nationalized the Filipino army which became part of a new command known as the United States Army Forces in the Far East. 105 On August 26, 1941, an American military mission under General John A. Gruder was sent to China. 106 American Army, Navy, and Marine flyers were permitted to fight for China as an American volunteer group under Brigadier General Chen Al. 107 American engineers were sent to reorganize traffic over the Burma Road in order to speed supplies to China. 108 Generalissimo Kaishak, on the President's recommendation, accepted Owen Latimore as his political advisor. 109 The Panama Canal was closed to Japanese shipping. 110 This series of actions finally made it extremely doubtful that the peace could be kept. 
The only avenue remaining open was that of negotiation. While Secretary Hull and Ambassador Nomura were exploring the possibilities, Dr. E. Stanley Jones, a widely known missionary of long experience in the Orient, served as an unofficial mediator between the Japanese and the White House. Dr. Jones contradicts the Roosevelt administration thesis, advanced by Hull in particular, that there never was any hope of keeping the peace. He says, the idea that all the Japanese officials and people were united in their approval of aggression and their plans for further conquests in the Orient, even to the point of war with the United States, is commonly held. It has been carefully nurtured by propaganda. The American citizen is supposed to believe that a united Japan undertook world conquest, with no inhibitions and no internal opposition. But the idea is disastrously false. From the time of the attack upon China, the Japanese nation went through a deep struggle of mind and soul. It was a titanic grapple between the war party and the peace party. It was touch and go as to which way the situation would swing. The struggle continued to the fall of 1941. Then the militarists triumphed. Had we been wiser we would have outplanned the militarists. If we had lent aid and encouragement to the peace party in their efforts to prevent war, we could have made Japan an ally instead of an enemy. Certainly our course played into the hands of the war party. 111 As to the American attitude, Dr. Jones says, I was not sure whether the highest officials in the executive branch of our government really wanted peace. From the time of the Atlantic Conference between President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill in August, 1941. The official attitude toward Japan had stiffened, bordering on belligerency. The attitude of some of our officials seemed to be, well, we have Japan by the throat by this oil embargo and we'll strangle her. If she kicks and there is war, well, we'll send a few planes over from Vladivostok, burn up her inflammable cities, and it will be all over in a few weeks. They felt that Japan was mired in China that she was at the end of her resources, and that this anxiety for peace on the part of her Washington representatives was because she was weak and helpless in our hands. Azadm. Namura said to me one day, everything I propose is suspected as weakness. Dr. Jones found that much of the agitation for war came from the British, the Chinese, and the Dutch. When he suggested to Dr. Hu Xi, the Chinese ambassador, that it was one thing for America to feel sympathy for China and to endeavor to help China, but another thing for us to be dragged into war because of China's refusal of mediation, Doctor Who replied, this is all nonsense. You are already at war. Dr. Jones continued Great Britain was obviously trying to get us into the European war, as Mr. Churchill later openly said, and was not adverse to getting us in by the back door of a Pacific war. When I urged Lord Halifax to mediate between us and Japan and help avert a war in the Pacific, he replied, you will find my views in the enclosed speech I have made. The whole tenor of the speech was, America must fight. The Netherlands shared that attitude. The real issue of the war, Dr. Jones contends, was empire. The Japanese suspected the United States of being willing to fight in order to preserve the white empires of the Pacific. That was correct, as time so amply proved. We did not go to the defense of China when she was attacked by Japan. In fact, we continued to send Japan our scrap iron and oil. But the moment Japan threatened Indochina, a French possession, we were aroused. That touched a sensitive nerve. The prerogatives of the white nation's colonial possessions in the East. Dr. Jones's own solution was to give Japan some unexploited area where it could dispose of its surplus population. His choice was New Guinea, a huge island owned by the British and Dutch, who had made no real attempt to develop it and who did not need it for emigrants. The island had a population of only 300,000 natives of low culture, but with proper development, Dr. Jones thought, could sustain from 20 to 40 million people. Dr. Jones proposed that the United States pay $100 million to Holland and Australia to compensate such landowners as might be dispossessed. He found the Australian minister in Washington sympathetic. 
if we don't do something now about Japan's surplus population, the minister said, we shall have to do it within 10 years. When Dr. Jones interviewed the Dutch minister, however, he was told, no part of the Dutch Empire is for sale. On November 18, 1941, three weeks before the Pearl Harbor attack, Maxwell H. Hamilton of the State Department's Far Eastern Section submitted the plan to Secretary Hull.112 instead of considering this face-saving method of persuading Japan to abandon the program of the militarists. Hull handed Nomura and Kuresu the President's 10-point statement of November 26, which, says Dr. Jones, could have no other interpretation than that of an ultimatum. Even when confronted with the American demands, Dr. Jones says that the Japanese representatives did not abandon hope that we would grant them the means of reaching a peaceful solution. Two days after the Hull ultimatum, Councillor Therese Aki of the Embassy, in a note transmitted to Roosevelt by Dr. Jones, pleaded, don't compel us to do things, but make it possible for us to do them. If you treat us in this way, we will reciprocate doubly. If you stretch out one hand, we will stretch out two. And we cannot only be friends, we can be allies. There was no response, nor any relaxation of the pressure. As Dr. Jones says, our ultimatum put Japan in a box. She had to knuckle under or else fight us. In retrospect, Dr. Jones suggests that almost until the very end Japan and the United States were very close to peace. During the negotiations he was told by a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it has all boiled down to two air bases in North China, Japan wants to retain two air bases and we want her to get out of China. Whether we were within two air bases of peace Dr. Jones says he does not know for certain, but in one of their last conversations, Nomura told him that it would be absurd for us to go to war over two air bases in North China. It would be very expensive for both of us. In listing the causes of the war, Dr. Jones says a principal cause was the pressure of a war party that surrounded the president. A Supreme Court justice said to us during the negotiations, we have a war party as well as Japan. They are surrounding the president and making it more and more impossible to see him. If it was surrounding him, Roosevelt was also the center of it. The testimony of Sumner Wells before the Congressional Committee investigating Pearl Harbor showed that it was Roosevelt who was running the show. Asked whether, when the fleet was moved to Hawaii, the Navy was not being made an arm of the diplomatic negotiations with Japan, Wells replied, it was done as an integral part of the overall policy. You can't divorce the diplomatic field from the military field. It was a policy moving along parallel roads. Who made the overall policy decisions? The president, of course, Wells replied. 113 for a comprehensive and illuminating account of the foreign policy of the United States as defined for public consumption by Roosevelt, Hull, Wendell Wilkie, and other politicians, see Charles A. Beard's American Foreign Policy in the Making, 1932 1940, New Haven, Yale University Press. 1946. Dennett's received the lightest sentence of any of the 22 Nazi defendants at the Nuremberg war crimes trial. The International Military Tribunal imposed a term of 10 years imprisonment on him. This comparatively lenient treatment may, or may not, reflect the court's belief in the credibility of his testimony. Chapter 8 uh, B. C. Among the most important of the President's decisions was to consummate secret war alliances with the British and Canadians in the Atlantic and with the British and Dutch in the Pacific. News that the United States was a partner in a full blown war alliance before a shot had been fired burst upon the American people on December 6, 1941, one day before the Pearl Harbor attack. A New York Times dispatch from Melbourne, Australia, stated. The Australian government has completed preparations, in concert with Britain, the United States, and the Netherlands Indies, for action in the event of a Pacific conflict. The four plan to match Japanese action, move by move. The report warned of powerful American squadrons in the rear of any southward Japanese expedition.
One the Australian Associated Press said of the agreement, following 11th hour conversations between the ABCD powers, a declaration has been drawn up setting out their attitude to any Japanese aggression. This declaration reaffirmed the necessity for the four allies to continue to stand together. We are fully alive to the Japanese threat and are not afraid of it, the statement was reported as saying. Two in Washington the State Department said it did not know of any joint declaration. Three this secret war alliance, so casually sprung upon the American people, and denied by that people's own government, had been developing for years and had been in being for more than eight months. It had not been executed, as the Constitution provides all treaties must be, with the advice and consent of the Senate, nor had it been drafted as an executive agreement, a means of bypassing the Senate which Roosevelt on occasion was not reluctant to invoke. The President had been sufficiently prudent not even to initial it. While Holland and China were listed among the ABCD powers, Britain was the important partner taken under the American wing. Collaboration between the two nations in the Pacific had begun at the Washington Naval Conference in 1922, when Britain terminated its 1902 alliance with Japan. Disregarding Japanese opposition, nine battleships, six cruisers, 34 destroyers, and 13 auxiliary units of the American fleet visited Australia and New Zealand in 1925 to signalize the new Anglo-American bonds. This visit was the precursor to another call by four American cruisers to Australia in 1938. From the three of the cruisers proceeded to Singapore at the invitation of the British Foreign Office to attend ceremonies opening Britain's new naval base. No other foreign warships attended. The visit was obviously a demonstration of American-British solidarity for the benefit of Japan. In March, 1938, Roosevelt suddenly rediscovered Canton and Indabri Islands in the Phoenix Group, 1,900 miles southwest of Hawaii. He asserted formal claim on the basis of century-old American discovery. Britain had taken formal possession of the islands a year before Roosevelt's proclamation of American sovereignty. In August, 1938, the islands were placed under joint Anglo-American control, and in April, 1939, the condominium was extended for 50 years. Members of Congress asserted that the supposed dispute between Roosevelt and the British was merely a screen for collusive action to intermingle the affairs of the two countries so that America would be bound to Britain in the event of an Asiatic war. In February, 1946, Adam Ingersoll confirmed charges in Congress at the time of the Canton and Debris deal that an agreement had been reached as early as 1938 looking forward toward a Pacific War alliance with the British. In December, 1937, when he was Director of Navy War Plans, he was called to the White House and directed by Roosevelt to go to London to explain to the British what the United States could do in a war with Japan and to determine what contribution Britain could make. For a letter from Adam Richardson to Adam Stark on January 26, 1940 indicates that the Ingersoll conversations produced a secret understanding for joint Anglo-American use of the Singapore base against Japan when the China incident started and on every opportunity until after I left the job as Assistant Chief of Naval Operations, I used to say to Bill Leahy, be sure to impress on the boss that we do not want to be drawn into this business unless we have allies so bound to us that they cannot leave us in the lurch. There is a possibility that this constant repetition had something to do with the trip of Ingersoll. When this understanding was reached, it had some value, but under present conditions it has little value, as it affords us the use of a base in exchange for an obligation to protect about two and one half continents. Five Chief of Staff Marshall, however, stated before the Congressional Committee that the British first advanced the project of using Singapore as a joint fleet base in November. 1941. The British wanted us to base a number of vessels at Singapore, Marshall said. They felt that if we would base part of our navy there it would greatly strengthen Britain's position in the Pacific without reducing her naval forces in the Atlantic War with Germany. The General and Adam Stark refused the invitation on tactical grounds. They thought that American vessels, if moved to Singapore, 
would be too far removed from supply sources and would be vulnerable to air attack. Six Ingersoll said that his conversations in London in 1938 were rendered obsolete when, in the spring of 1941, a new understanding was reached between the United States and Britain. The British seem to have begun agitating for a firmer alliance in the Far East as their troubles multiplied in the European War. Thus, Adam Stark, writing to Adam Hart on November 12, 1940, remarked of Britain's overtures they have been talking in a large way about the defence of the Malay barrier, with an alliance between themselves, us, and the Dutch, without much thought as to what the effect would be in Europe. But we have no idea as to whether they would at once begin to fight were the Dutch alone, or were we alone, to be attacked by the Japanese. Then again, the copy of the British Far Eastern War Plan obtained at Singapore shows much evidence of their usual wishful thinking. Furthermore, though I believe the Dutch colonial authorities will resist an attempt to capture their islands, I question whether they would fight if only the Philippines, or only Singapore, were attacked. Seven at length, however, Stark succumbed to British pressure and agreed to convoke a joint staff conference in Washington. I did not ask the President's permission or that of Col. Knox he told the Congressional Committee. There was some dynamite in the fact that we were holding conversations with the British. I informed, the President, in January, after the committee was here, that I was going ahead with those conversations. I told him that I would prefer to be panned for not being ready rather than be reproved when the time came and I was not ready, and he let it go at that. What did he say? Well, he did not pan me. Later on all those conversations, that is, the boil down and the plans, were shown to him. Eight the American representatives at the secret staff conversations, held from January 29th to March 27th, were Major General Stanley Diembic, representing the Joint United States-Canadian Defense Board, Brigadier General Sherman Miles, Chief of Intelligence for the Army General Staff, Brigadier General Leonard T. Giro, War Plans Officer, General Staff, Colonel Joseph T. McNanny, subsequently a member of the Roberts Commission, representing Army Aviation, Rear Admiral Robert M. Gormley, American Naval Observer in England, Rear Admiral Richmond K. Turner, Naval War Plans Officer, Captain A. G. Kirk, Chief of Naval Intelligence, and Captain Dewitt C. Ramsey, representing the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics. The British representatives were Rear Admirals R. M. Bellairs and V. J. Dunkwitz, Major Gen. E. L. Morris, Air Vice Marshal J. C. Slesser, and Captain A. W. Clark. Nine. The staff conference assumes, its report said, that when the United States becomes involved in war with Germany, it will at the same time engage in war with Italy. In these circumstances, the possibility of a state of war arising between Japan and an association of the United States, the British Commonwealth, and its allies, including the Netherlands East Indies, must be taken into account. The important word was when. There was no if. Since Germany is the predominant member of the Axis powers, the document continued. The Atlantic and European area is considered to be the decisive theater. The principal United States effort will be exerted in that theater, and operations in other theaters will be conducted in such a manner as to facilitate that effort. The United States was to use its fleet to weaken Japanese economic power and to support the defense of the Malay barrier by diverting Japanese strength away from Malaysia, principally by raids into the Marshall Islands. Not only was Malaya to be protected, but the British stipulated that they did not intend to let go of any of their Asiatic holdings. A cardinal feature of British strategic policy, this provision held, is the retention of a position in the Far East such as will ensure cohesion and security of the British Commonwealth. The plans for a war with Japan provided that the United States should be responsible for the defense of a vast stretch of the Pacific the ocean areas from the coast of North and South America westward to a short distance from the coast of Australia, and north of the equator to a line extending to the westward of the Marianas up to latitude 30 degrees north, 
where the area was extended to include the reaches of the ocean all the way to the Asiatic continent. A second staff conference was held in Singapore April the 21st to the 27th to draft an American-British Dutch war plan for the Pacific in conformity with the master plan for global war laid down at the Washington Staff Conference. The American representatives were Captain W. R. Purnell, Chief of Staff of the Asiatic Fleet, Col. A. C. McBride, Assistant Chief of Staff of Gen. MacArthur's Forces in the Philippines, Captain A. M. R. Allen, Naval Observer at Singapore, and Lieutenant Col. F. G. Brink. Military observer at Singapore. The principal British representatives were Rear Chief Marshal Sir Robert Brooke Popham, Commander in Chief, Far East, and Vice Admiral Sir Geoffrey Layton, Commander in Chief, China. There were six Australian representatives, six Dutch delegates, three New Zealanders, and one representative from India and from the British East Indies. Ten on the basis of the previous Washington Agreement. The United States Pacific Fleet was to operate against the Japanese mandated islands and Japanese sea communications. The Asiatic Fleet at Manila was to employ only its submarines and its naval air and local naval defense forces in support of the American Army in its defense of Luzon. While cruisers and destroyers were to report at Singapore to operate under strategic command of ADM. Leighton. Submarine tenders, destroyers, tankers, and flying boats were to be dispatched to Singapore before the commencement of hostilities. Most of them. Hearts cruisers and destroyers were eventually lost fighting in defense of the British and Dutch colonial empires. The security of Luzon was termed of subsidiary interest to the security of Singapore and of sea communications. The Singapore Plan envisioned loss of the Philippines. Upon the ultimate defense area, which includes Corregidor and the entrance of Manila Bay, becoming untenable, the agreement said, all remaining naval and naval air forces retaining combat value will retire southward, passing under the strategic direction of the Commander-in-Chief, China. Chief of Naval Operations Stark testified before the Congressional Committee that there was general agreement with the conclusion that the Philippines could not be held. He related that, in conversations with the Japanese ambassador, Adam Namura, he had predicted that the Japanese would score many early successes in a Pacific war, but that they would eventually be beaten down. I'm inclined to think Namura agreed with me, Stark said. Did you think we would lose the Philippines? I hoped we could put up a good fight, but I always conceded we would lose them. Did you discuss this with the president? Yes. He was thoroughly familiar with the picture. 11 The primary reason why the Philippines, and with them Guam 12, were written off at Singapore, however, was that the Pacific was considered a secondary front. The staff conference agreed that to ensure that we are not diverted from the major object of the defeat of Germany and Italy, our main strategy in the Far East at the present time must be defensive. Clark Lee, in They Call It Pacific asserts that the dead of Badan would have still been living if the United States had not decided that the Pacific was a secondary front. 13 The defense of the Roosevelt administration later for entering a war alliance through the Washington and Singapore staff agreements was that the commitments assumed were not binding. The Washington Agreement nowhere provided for ratification by the Senate or even that notification be given Congress that any such alliance existed. The Singapore Agreement, while disclaiming that any political commitment was implied, specified that the agreement was to implement the war plan previously adopted in Washington, which provided for no congressional approval. The Washington Agreement on the Master War Plan was approved by Secretary Knox on May 28 and by Secretary Stimson on June 2. One forum. Stark appeared before the Congressional Committee with a prepared statement saying that the plan was approved by the two secretaries and by the President, but deleted the reference to Roosevelt. He said he had learned to his surprise just recently that while the President had full knowledge of the military agreements, he had not ratified them. 15 Stark added, however, that the President had approved these plans, 
except officially. Lieutenant Colonel Henry C. Clausen, who had taken a world tour in 1944 to look for evidence in support of Secretary Stimson's thesis that blame for the Pearl Harbor disaster solely attached to the commanders on the spot, told the Congressional Committee that his inquiries led him to the White House but that he was discouraged from entering. Clausen said that the statements of army leaders convinced him there was an informal agreement but not a binding agreement on the part of the United States to fight Japan if the British or Dutch were attacked. That may make sense to you, it didn't to me, he told the committee. I suggested that the inquiry would lead to the White House, but I was told that it was beyond the scope of my function to investigate there. He said that he was so informed by Colonel William J. Hughes, assistant to the Army Judge Advocate General. 16. However, strenuously it might be denied that the intention of Roosevelt was to circumvent constitutional imitations, 17. The indisputable fact is that as soon as the staff agreements were drafted, the Army and Navy drew up supplementary Pacific War plans of their own designed to carry out master strategy in concert with the British and Dutch. The Joint Army and Navy Basic War Plan, which bore the short title Rainbow No. 5, was approved by Stimson and Knox on the same dates upon which they approved the report on the Washington Staff Conversations, which bore the short title ABC 1. 18 On the basis of Rainbow 5, the Navy Basic War Plan, known as WPL 46, was promulgated May 25. The Pacific Fleet's plan to support the Basic Navy plan was distributed on July 25 and approved September 9 by the Chief of Naval Operations. It was known as WP Pac 26. The Army also drew up a plan of operations to supplement Rainbow 5. This was approved by Chief of Staff Marshal on August 19. 19 the objectives of the Joint Army Navy plan were described by Adam Turner. Navy War Plans Officer, in the following words the plan contemplated a major effort on the part of both the principal associated powers against Germany initially. It was felt in the Navy Department that there might be a possibility of war with Japan without the involvement of Germany, but at some length and over a considerable period this matter was discussed and it was determined that in such a case the United States would, if possible, initiate efforts to bring Germany into the war against us in order that we would be able to give strong support to the United Kingdom in Europe. We felt that it was incumbent on our side to defeat Germany, to launch our principal efforts against Germany first, and to conduct a limited offensive in the Central Pacific, and a strictly defensive effort in the Asiatic. 20 The statements of other high-ranking American officers were equally illuminating concerning the practical effects of the staff agreements. They suggested that the reluctance of the American people to be pulled into war was the real reason why the agreements were drafted in secret and why they were kept secret from Congress. Thus, while asserting that America's broad military objective was the defeat of Germany, Marshall and Stark, in their instructions to American representatives at the Washington Staff Conference, warned that the American people desired to stay out of war. 21 The same conclusion was voiced by Lieutenant Colonel George W. Bicknell, assistant to Gen. Shorts G2. In an intelligence estimate on October 17, 1941, Bicknell said that there was no known binding agreement between the British and Americans for joint military action against Japan because the American public is not yet fully prepared to support such action. 22 In questioning short, Senator Ferguson referred to Bicknell's phrase no known binding agreement and asked, what do you understand by binding agreement? Do you mean by treaty? To be binding, it should be approved by the Congress, as I understand it. Short replied. He might have meant simply any agreement that had been made and approved by the President, and not made public. What was your understanding about that part of it that the American public is not yet fully prepared to support such action? I felt at that time, Short responded, that the American public would not have been willing to have an agreement ratified that we would go to war to defend the Netherlands, East Indies, or Singapore. 23 Adam. Kimmel testified that he was no better informed than Jen. Short about American commitments to the British and Dutch. He said that he had tried to find out what the United States would do if the Japanese moved towards Singapore, Thailand, or Borneo, 
but all the enlightenment he received was in a letter from Stark on November 25, 1941, mentioning reports that the Japanese were planning aggressive moves in the Southwest Pacific. I won't go into the pros and cons of what the United States may do, Stark said, I will be damned if I know. 24 Stark himself testified before the Congressional Committee that his honest opinion was that no one knew the answers to such questions. 25 Under questioning of Senator Ferguson, he admitted that there was not so much difference between the informal war alliance with Britain in the Atlantic and the similar arrangement with the British and Dutch in the Pacific. We did not come to Congress, he said of both. Nor did he dispute Ferguson when the Senator pointed out that in the Atlantic, with what you call technical war, we went in without Congress. 26 Gen. Marshall was shown a memorandum in which he and Stark advised Roosevelt on November 27, 1941, to take military action if Jap forces moved into western Thailand or advanced southward through the Gulf of Siam. Did you feel, asked Ferguson, that a Japanese move against British territory would inevitably involve the United States in war? Yes said Marshall.27 In carrying out its engagements under the Singapore Pact, Marshall admitted, the army was building landing strips and accumulating bombs, gasoline, oil, and other material before December 7 at Port Moresby, New Guinea, Darwin, Australia, Rabaul, New Britain, Balikpapan, Borneo, and Singapore.28 Even after the drafting of ABC1, Rainbow No. 5, WPL 46, WP Pack 46, and the Army Plan of Operations for the Pacific, new joint war plans were being worked up with the British and approved by Washington almost to the very hour of the December 7 attack. On November 11, for instance, Stark advised Adam Hart that previous joint plans were considered dead. Hart was instructed to confer with Admiral Thomas V. Phillips who was coming to Singapore as commander of the British Far Eastern Fleet, in drawing up a new joint naval operating plan. 29 Hart subsequently reported that he and Phillips, after a secret conference in Manila, had made an agreement to enlarge the harbour at Manila for use as a base by British naval units. Phillips had brought out the battleship Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser Repulse both to be sunk in a Jap air attack in the South China Sea on December 8 and Manila could not accommodate such large units. The agreement was reported by Hart on December 6 and approved by Stark just before the attack upon Pearl Harbor the following day. Although Hart was charged with perfecting joint war plans in the Far East, even he did not know the full extent of aid which the White House was pledging to the British. On December 7, a few hours before the attack on Oahu, Hart sent a message to Stark saying, Learn from Singapore we have assured British armed support under three or four eventualities. Have received no corresponding instructions from you. 34 years later Hart told the Congressional Committee that he had been informed of these undertakings by Captain John Creighton, American naval attaché at Singapore, who had been told of them by Air Marshal Brooke Popham. Hart said that the attack at Pearl Harbor intervened before he received any clarification from Washington. Captain Creighton, following Hart before the committee, produced the message which Brooke Popham had received from London setting forth the terms for American aid. It read We have now received assurance of American armed support in cases as follows A. We are obliged to execute our plans to forestall Japanese landing isthmus of Grau take action in reply to Nip's invasion any part of Siam. B. If Dutch are attacked and we go to their defence. C. If Japs attack us. The British therefore without reference to London put plan in action if, first, you have good info Jap expedition advancing with the apparent intention of landing in Kra, second, if the Nips violate any portion of Thailand. If any I attacked, put into action operation plans agreed upon between British and Dutch. 31 These contingencies did not provide that American aid should be dependent upon a Japanese attack on any American possessions. The conditions had the effect of giving the British commanders at Singapore a blanket authorization to call American forces into war any time the Japanese moved against British or Dutch possessions or even against Siam. 
it is not known who in the British government sent word to Brooke Popham outlining the conditions under which the United States would enter the war, but it is impossible to believe that Britain would have instructed its commander-in-chief for the entire Far East of such conditions if they had not been agreed upon. Once the United States signed the Washington and Singapore staff agreements, the British, Australians, Dutch, and Chinese proceeded on the assumption that this country was an outright ally and increased their pressure to hasten the day when America should be formally at war. Secretary Hull described their attitude in a memorandum of a conference on November 24 with Lord Halifax, British Ambassador, Richard G. Casey, Australian Minister, Hu Xi, Chinese Ambassador, and A. Loudon, Netherlands Minister. Hull noted they seemed to be thinking of the advantages to be derived without any particular thought of what we should pay for them, if anything. I remarked that each of their governments was more interested in the defense of that area of the world, Southwest Pacific, than this country, but they expected this country, in the case of a Japanese outbreak, to be ready to move in a military way and take the lead in defending the entire area. 32 Senator Ferguson asked Adam Stark, isn't that exactly what happened, just what Mr. Hull prophesied would happen? that we would have to defend the whole area and we would have to have the war for the whole area? We would have the major role, Stark replied. 33 Japanese diplomatic messages show that America's role as a partner of Britain, China, and Holland in a Pacific War alliance was not lost upon the Japanese. Two messages sent by Ambassador Namura from Washington in the last month before hostilities began demonstrate that the Japanese had suspected or somehow learned of this joint military program. On November 10 Namura advised Tokyo colon 1. I sent, Frederick, Moore, legal advisor to the Japanese embassy, to contact Senator, Elbert D. Thomas, of Utah, of the Senate Military Affairs Committee and Hull. His report reads as follows, the United States is not bluffing. If Japan invades again, the United States will fight with Japan. Psychologically the American people are ready. The Navy is prepared and ready for action. 2. Yesterday evening, Sunday, a certain cabinet member, discarding all quibbling, began by saying to me, you are indeed a dear friend of mine and I tell this to you alone. Then he continued, the American government is receiving a number of reliable reports that Japan will be on the move soon. The American government does not believe your visit on Monday to the president or the coming of Mr. Kurosu will have any effect on the general situation. I took pains to explain in detail how impatient the Japanese have grown since the freezing, how they are eager for a quick understanding, how both the government and the people do not desire a Japanese-American war and how we will hope for peace until the end. He replied, however, well, our boss, the president, believes those reports and so does the Secretary of State. 34 again, on December 3rd, Nomura notified Tokyo, judging from all indications, we feel that some joint military action between Great Britain and the United States, with or without a declaration of war, is a definite certainty in the event of an occupation of Thailand. 35 other Japanese diplomatic messages showed that the Japanese had a clear appreciation of Mr. Roosevelt's role as a protector of Britain, Holland, and China. On November 24, a message from Tokyo to Washington described the American president as acting as a spokesman for Chiang Kai-shek. 36 America's protective occupation of Dutch Guiana on November 24 aroused Japanese fears that Roosevelt contemplated similar action in the Dutch East Indies. On November 27 Nomura expressed belief to Tokyo that, depending upon the atmosphere at the time the Japanese U.S. negotiations break off, Britain and the United States may occupy the Netherlands East Indies. 37 Foreign Minister Togo, on December 6, drew a sardonic parallel between America's occupation of Dutch Guiana and Japan's conduct in Indochina. Based on an agreement with France, he said, we penetrated southern French Indochina for joint defense. Scarcely were our tracks dry, when along comes good old nonchalant America and grabs Netherlands Guiana. If she needs any of the American countries for her own interests, hiding under the camouflage of joint defense, 
she will take them, as she has just proven. 38 in two speeches after the Pearl Harbor attack had brought the United States into the war, Prime Minister Churchill made it clear that it had been his constant policy to entangle the United States in any conflict Japan might bring upon Britain, and that in this object he had the eager assistance of Roosevelt. His remarks show that the staff agreements were considered binding by both Roosevelt and himself, and that the President had fortified their effect with additional personal assurances. On January 27, 1942, in a speech to the House of Commons, Churchill said, it has been the policy of the cabinet at almost all cost to avoid embroilment with Japan until we were sure that the United States would also be engaged. But as time has passed the mighty United States, under the leadership of President Roosevelt, from reasons of its own interest and safety but also out of chivalrous regard for the cause of freedom and democracy, has drawn ever nearer to the confines of the struggle. And now that the blow has fallen it does not fall on us alone. I have explained how very delicately we walked, and how painful it was at times. How very careful I was every time that we should not be exposed single-handed to this onslaught which we were utterly incapable of meeting. On the other hand, the probability, since the Atlantic Conference, at which I discussed these matters with Mr. Roosevelt, that the United States, even if not herself attacked, would come into the war in the Far East, and thus make final victory sure, seemed to allay some of these anxieties. That expectation has not been falsified by the event. As time went on, one had greater assurance that if Japan ran amok in the Pacific, we should not fight alone. It must also be remembered that over the whole of the Pacific brooded the great power of the United States fleet, concentrated at Hawaii. It seemed very unlikely that Japan would attempt the distant invasion of the Malay Peninsula, the assault upon Singapore, and the attack upon the Dutch East Indies, while leaving behind them in their rear this great American fleet. 39 again, on February 15, Mr. Churchill crowed in Commons, when I survey and compute the power of the United States and its vast resources and feel that they are now in it with us, with the British Commonwealth of Nations altogether, however long it lasts till death or victory, I cannot believe that there is any other fact in the whole world which can compare with that. This is what I have dreamed of, aimed at, and worked for, and now it has come to pass. 40 The most straightforward estimate of Roosevelt's policy was provided by Captain Oliver Lyttelton, British Production Minister in Churchill's cabinet. Speaking June 20, 1944, before the American Chamber of Commerce in London, he asserted that America provoked Japan to such an extent that the Japanese were forced to attack Pearl Harbor. It is a travesty on history ever to say that America was forced into war. Forty-one later he apologized for speaking the embarrassing truth that their will to get into war came from this side of the water, from the White House. See Note 17, Appendix. Italics supplied. The percentage of Americans favoring entry into the war from October, 1939, until May, 1941, the month that the Washington Master War Plan and the Joint Army-Navy War Plan were approved, was shown by the Gallup poll to be as follows October, 1939, 5%, June 2, 1940, 16%, June 14, 1940, 19%, July 6, 1940. 14%, July 19, 1940, 15%, October, 1940, 17%, December, 1940, 15%, February 2, 1941, 15%, March, 1941, 17%, April, 1941, 13%, May, 1941, 19%. Chapter 9 Meeting at Sea as early as February. 1941, Prime Minister Churchill had begun to press Mr. Roosevelt to take the lead in deterring Japan from seizing British possessions in the Far East. He besought the President then to instill in Japan anxiety that any Japanese move towards Singapore would mean war with the United States. One to the Atlantic Conference in August, he brought renewed proposals that Roosevelt throw down the gauntlet to Japan. 
although Britain's hand in the Orient was so weak that Churchill had been forced to shut down the Burma Road only a year before in order to appease Japan, the Prime Minister euphemistically referred to the proposed course as parallel action by Britain and the United States. More than four years after the Atlantic Conference, Sumner Wells told the Congressional Committee investigating Pearl Harbor the detailed story of the conference. Wells's notes of conversations between the two leaders on August 10 and 11 provided the fullest first hand account of the charter meeting yet made public. Two Wells dealt at length with the so called parallel declaration to be made by the United States, Britain, and Holland warning Japan against further aggression in the Far East. On Sunday, August 10, Wells wrote, he accompanied Roosevelt to a conference with Churchill aboard the battleship Prince of Wales. Sir Alexander Cadogan, British Permanent Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, told me before lunch that in accordance with the conversation which was had between the President, the Prime Minister, Sir Alexander, and myself at the President's dinner last night, he had made two tentative drafts covering proposed parallel and simultaneous declarations by the United States and British governments relating to Japanese policy in the Pacific and of a proposed joint declaration to be made by the President and the Prime Minister when their present meeting was terminated. The draft of the parallel declaration to Japan read as follows Declaration by the United States Government that colon 1. Any further encroachment by Japan in the southwestern Pacific would produce a situation in which the United States government would be compelled to take countermeasures even though these might lead to war between the United States and Japan. Two. If any third power becomes the object of aggression by Japan in consequence of such countermeasures or of their support of them, the President would have the intention to seek authority from Congress to give aid to such power. Identical declarations were to be made by Great Britain and the Netherlands, with the names of those nations and appropriate references to their governments substituted for the United States and the President. Annotation at the bottom of the document read Keep the Soviet government informed. It will be for consideration whether they should be pressed to make a parallel declaration. Wells's memorandum continued, as I was leaving the ship to accompany the President back to his flagship, Mr. Churchill. Impressed upon me his belief that some declaration of the kind he had drafted with respect to Japan was in his opinion in the highest degree important, and that he did not think there was much hope left unless the United States made such a clear-cut declaration of preventing Japan from expanding further to the south in which event the prevention of war between Great Britain and Japan appeared to be hopeless. He said in a most emphatic manner that if war did break out between Great Britain and Japan, Japan immediately would be in a position through the use of her large number of cruisers to seize or to destroy all of the British merchant shipping in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific and to cut the lifelines between the British Dominions and the British Isles unless the United States herself entered the war. He pled with me that a declaration of this character, participated in by the United States, Great Britain, the Dominions, the Netherlands, and possibly the Soviet Union, would definitely restrain Japan. If this were not done, the blow to the British government might be almost decisive. On the following day, Churchill was received by Roosevelt aboard the cruiser Augusta. Churchill again brought up the subject of the parallel declaration. Wells noted the Prime Minister then said that he desired to discuss the situation in the Far East. He had with him a copy of a draft memorandum, of which he had already given the President a copy, and which suggested that the United States, British, and Dutch governments simultaneously warn Japan that further military expansion by Japan in the South Pacific would lead to the taking of countermeasures by the countries named, even though such countermeasures might result in hostilities between them and Japan, and, second, provided that the United States declare to Japan that should Great Britain go to the assistance of the Netherlands East Indies as a result of aggression against the latter on the part of Japan. The President would request from the Congress of the United States authority to assist the British and Dutch governments in their defense against Japanese aggression. After further discussion of proposals submitted by Ambassador Nomura in behalf of the Japanese government to Secretary Hull, all of which, Churchill remarked, 
were particularly unacceptable Roosevelt said that he would ask Hull by radio to inform Nomura that he was returning to Washington the following Saturday or Sunday and that he desired to see the Japanese ambassador immediately upon his return. The president, Wells recorded, stated that in this interview he would inform Nomura that if the Japanese would pledge themselves to keep hands off the Southwest Pacific and to withdraw the troops they then had in Indochina. The United States would in a friendly spirit seek to explore the possibilities inherent in the various proposals made by Japan for the reaching of a friendly understanding between the two governments. Roosevelt, however, was unwilling to assent to Japan's proposals that, as conditions to any such pledge undertaken by Japan. The United States abandon economic and financial sanctions, take no further military measures in the Southwest Pacific in concert with the British and Dutch, and use its good offices for the initiation of direct negotiations between the Japanese government and the Chiang Kai-shek regime for the purpose of a speedy settlement of the China incident. The President, Wells continued, announced that he would for the state that should Japan refuse to consider this procedure and undertake further steps in the nature of military expansions. The president desired the Japanese government to know that in such event in his belief various steps would have to be taken by the United States, notwithstanding the president's realization that the taking of such further measures might result in war between the United States and Japan. Churchill, Wells reported. Immediately declared that the procedure suggested appeared to him to cover the situation very well. He said it had in it an element of face-saving for the Japanese and yet at the same time would constitute a flat United States warning to Japan of the consequences involved in a continuation by Japan of her present course. Churchill's satisfaction was understandable. The position which Roosevelt announced he intended to take was that Japan must clear out of China and guarantee immunity to the British and Dutch colonial holdings without getting anything in return except a promise that the United States would continue to explore the possibilities of a settlement. Such terms obviously would be unacceptable to Japan. Therefore, the bite was at the finish of Roosevelt's proposed lecture to Nomura, if the Japs moved against British and Dutch territory, they would have a war with the United States on their hands. The discussion then turned to whether the threat of American action should be broadened to cover any aggressive steps by Japan against Russia. Wells suggested that the real issue which was involved was the continuation by Japan of its present policy of conquest by force in the entire Pacific region and regardless whether such policy was directed against China against the Soviet Union, or against the British Dominions or British colonies, or the colonies of the Netherlands in the Southern Pacific area. I said it seemed to me that the statement which the President intended to make to the Japanese government might more advantageously be based on the question of broad policy rather than be premised solely upon Japanese moves in the southwestern Pacific area. The President agreed to this comprehensive enlargement of the warning. Roosevelt, in calling for the withdrawal of Japanese troops from Indochina proposed that that country and Thailand be neutralized by a general agreement to which Japan should be a party. He said that Japan might more readily acquiesce in this proposal if he could state that he had been informed by the British government that Great Britain had no aggressive intentions whatever upon Thailand. Wells suggested the addition that the British government had informed the United States government that it supported wholeheartedly the President's proposal for the neutralization of Indochina and of Thailand. Churchill authorized these statements, by means of which Roosevelt undertook to carry the diplomatic ball for Britain. The president expressed the belief, Wells said, that by adopting this course any further move of aggression on the part of Japan which might result in war could be held for at least 30 days. Churchill said that the procedure gave a reasonable chance that Japanese policy might be modified. The 30 day estimate is at variance with that given by Lindley and Davis who said that Roosevelt, in endeavoring to check Churchill's impetuous desire to bring a showdown with Japan at once, had asked, wouldn't we be better off in three months? Churchill agreed, but when he still professed doubt whether the respite would be forthcoming, Roosevelt was quoted as saying in an airy, offhand way, leave that to me. I think I can baby them, the Japs, along for three months.
3 whether it was one month or three, the president by either reckoning was manifesting a conviction that war was inevitable. Once he had taken that position, it is difficult to see what meaning attached to the negotiations for a peaceful settlement which were to go on in Washington for another four months between Hull and Namura. The decisions which Roosevelt and Churchill reached at their meeting at sea virtually precluded any constructive resolution of the problems between the United States and Japan. Having decided to warn Japan that further moves in any direction meant a war with America, the conferees indulged in a curious parley as to how much of this the Chinese should be permitted to know. Wells relates I said that while I felt very definitely that every effort should be made to keep China closely informed of what was being done in her interest by Great Britain and by the United States, I wondered whether telling China of what the president intended to state to the Japanese government at this particular moment would not mean that the government at Chongqing for its own interests would make public the information so received. If a publicity resulted, I stated I feared the extreme militaristic element in Tokyo and that portion of the Tokyo press which was controlled by Germany would immediately take advantage of the situation so created to inflame sentiment in Japan to such an extent as to make any possibility remote, as it might anyhow be, of achieving any satisfactory result through negotiation with Japan. Kadogan, said Wells, was entirely in accord and would be governed by these views. He said, of course, I realized how terribly persistent the Chinese were and that the present ambassador in London, Dr. Wellington Koo, would undoubtedly press him day in and day out to know what had transpired at the meeting between the Prime Minister and the President with regard to China. He said he felt that the best solution was for him merely to say in general terms that the two governments had agreed that every step should be taken that was practicable at this time for China and its defense and avoid going into any details. Accordingly, the Chinese were left as completely uninformed about what went on at the Atlantic Conference as the American public. Having disposed of Japan to his satisfaction, Churchill tackled the problem of getting Roosevelt to sign an acknowledgement of Anglo-American alliance in the Atlantic which could be waved in Hitler's face. Roosevelt assented without making difficulties. The Atlantic Charter was the product. For on August 17, upon his return to Washington, Roosevelt summoned Adam Namura to the White House and there read him what was tantamount to an ultimatum. After reviewing Japanese penetration of Indochina and charging Japan with having continued its military activities and its disposals of armed forces at various points in the Far East, the president said such being the case, this government now finds it necessary to say to the government of Japan that if the Japanese government takes any further steps in pursuance of a policy or program of military domination by force or threat of force of neighboring countries, the government of the United States will be compelled to take immediately any and all steps which it may deem necessary toward safeguarding the legitimate rights and interests of the United States and American nationals and toward ensuring the safety and security of the United States. Five, the oral warning which the President gave Namur followed the Churchill draft only as far as the beginning of the clause compelled to take countermeasures even though these might lead to war. Wells said that Roosevelt's revisions constituted a watering down of the original statement. But the two instruments meant the same thing in diplomatic language? asked Senator Ferguson. That is correct, said Wells. 6. No public announcement was made by Roosevelt of the Joint Action Agreement, although he addressed Congress August 21 on his meeting at sea, nor was it announced that the President had submitted an ultimatum to Japan. Roosevelt reserved his confidences for Churchill alone. On the day after addressing his statement to Namura, he advised the Prime Minister that he had warned the Japanese ambassador against further moves by Japan in the Pacific. I made to him, Roosevelt said, a statement covering the position of this government with respect to the taking by Japan of further steps in the direction of military domination by force. The statement made to him was no less vigorous and was substantially similar to the statement we had discussed. 7. Under the Parallel Action Agreement, Churchill and the Dutch government were also obligated to follow Roosevelt in addressing ultimatums to Japan, but they seem to have been content to let the United States threaten the Japanese. 
State Department files do not show that either Churchill or the Dutch gave warnings in the same manner or form as the President had, although Churchill approached a parallel declaration in his radio speech of August 24, when he reported on the Atlantic Conference. After reviewing Japan's military adventures and discussing the potential Japanese threat to Singapore, Siam, and the Philippines, he said, it is certain that this has got to stop. Every effort will be made to secure a peaceful settlement. But this I must say, that if these hopes should fail we shall of course range ourselves unhesitatingly at the side of the United States. 8 On November 10 Churchill returned to this theme, stating that it is my duty to say, that, should the United States become involved in war with Japan, the British declaration will follow within the hour. 9 In Tokyo, Ambassador Gru was much gratified. It does one's heart good, he remarked, to hear such an unqualified statement by the British Prime Minister, leaving nothing to the imagination. 10 The only evidence that Churchill ever went beyond his public speeches in taking parallel action against Japan is provided in a memorandum written November 27, 1941, by Dr. Stanley Hornbeck. 11 Hornbeck reviewing America's relations with Japan, said, by August of 1941 the situation had become definitely threatening. Toward the end of that month, the British government and the American government served on Japan a strong warning against further extending of her courses of aggression. When Senator Barclay, chairman of the investigating committee, observed that if such a protest or representation was made by Great Britain, the document itself would prove what it contained, Senator Ferguson reminded him, Mr. Chairman, it is clear that the British papers are not subject to our examination. 12 That the effect of the Roosevelt warning of August 17 was that of an ultimatum is attested by Wells, Captain R. E. Sherman, the Navy's liaison officer on diplomatic relations, and by the Japanese themselves. Senator Ferguson read Wells a press report from Tokyo dated August 13, while Roosevelt and Churchill were meeting at sea, stating that Japanese political sources believed America would match Japan move for move and that the Japanese had no doubt what the next move would be. Doesn't that indicate parallel action had been taken? asked Ferguson. Those would be the implications of the Atlantic Charter, Wells replied. Didn't the parallel declaration by Churchill and Roosevelt at the Atlantic Conference commit us to take the lead in the war? It envisaged a possible conflict, conceded Wells. My understanding of the document is that if Japan continued its aggression, the United States would be obliged to take the necessary steps, which would include military action. 13 Capt. Schuerman characterized the Roosevelt statement at a meeting on November 5, attended by Gen. Marshall, Adam, Stark, and other high-ranking officers, as an ultimatum to Japan that it would be necessary for the United States to take action in case of further Japanese aggression. 14 The Japanese also viewed the statement as an ultimatum. On November 28 Adam, Namura cautioned Tokyo, what the imperial government must, of course, consider is what Great Britain, Australia, the Netherlands, and China egged on by the United States, will do in case the imperial forces invade Thailand. Even supposing there is no armed collision with British forces, in the oral statement of President Roosevelt on the 17th he prophesied that suitable action would be taken immediately in case Japan carries on any further penetration beyond Indochina. 15 The President's statement was not the first ultimatum addressed by American spokesmen to the Japanese, nor would it be the last. The first had come from Councillor Eugene Duman of the American Embassy in Tokyo, who, on February 14, 1941, had informed Chiuichi Oashi, the Japanese Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs, it would be absurd to suppose that the American people, while pouring munitions into Britain, would look with complacency upon the cutting of communications between Britain and the British, dominions and colonies overseas. If, therefore, Japan or any other nation were to prejudice the safety of those communications, either by direct action or by placing herself in a position to menace those communications, 
she would have to expect to come into conflict with the United States. 16 Ambassador Gru said he approved this statement. 17 The impression had been created in Japan, he told the Congressional Committee, that the United States was isolationist, pacifistic, and too divided to fight a war. The controlled press, he said, played up anti war speeches and strikes in the United States. Duman was in the United States during the 1940 presidential campaign, said Representative Keefe of Wisconsin. Were his speeches played up in Japan? I cannot recollect, said Gru. Well, said Keefe, during that campaign there were a lot of speeches made by non isolationists, including the president himself, indicating that we did not want to fight a foreign war. 18 A second warning was given Japan by Adam. Turner, Navy Chief of War Plans. Meeting Ambassador Nomura in July, 1941, Turner told Nomura he thought Congress would declare war if Japan attacked the Dutch East Indies or the British in Malaya. The Admiral said that his report of the conversation was relayed to Roosevelt. 19 Wells's statement to Nomura on July 23 that Japan, by occupying Indochina, had removed the basis for a peaceful settlement with the United States, had suggested that the only remaining alternative was a solution by resort to force. 20 The striking fact is that all of these statements promised Japan war with the United States if the Japanese attacked territory not belonging to the United States. Duman threatened war in behalf of Britain and its dominions and colonies. Turner threatened war in behalf of Dutch and British colonies. Wells ruled out prospects of a peaceful settlement because Japan moved against Indochina, then the property of Vichy France. Roosevelt was thinking of the British Empire lifeline when he gave his all-inclusive warning. And, as will be seen, Secretary Hull acted at the insistence of the Chinese when he abandoned his own device to keep the peace and submitted terms to Japan which brought on the Pearl Harbor attack and the war. It was in this strange climate of the United States conducting its foreign relations in the interest of everybody else that diplomatic negotiations proceeded in the hope of averting a war between the United States and Japan. As to the effect of this warning, the minority report of the Joint Congressional Committee says, in his statement to the Japanese ambassador on Sunday, August 17, immediately following his return from the Atlantic Conference, President Roosevelt warned Japan against further attempts to dominate neighboring countries, not merely the possessions of the United States, and used diplomatic language which, according to long-established usages, had only one meaning, namely, that such further attempts would result in a conflict with the United States. Minutes, p. 15. Chapter 10 The last of the Japanese moderates with preparations for war cut and dried, and the war itself already fairly underway in the Atlantic, diplomatic negotiations supposed to preserve peace in the Pacific went on in Washington. Ambassador Gru, in a moment of optimism some two months before the Pearl Harbor attack, had given a description of the mission of diplomacy. After reviewing America's differences with Japan, he said in facing these difficult and highly complicated problems, let us not forget that diplomacy is essentially our first line of national defense, while our navy is but the second line and our army, let us hope, the third line. If the first line, diplomacy, is successful, those other lines will never have to be brought into action even although that first line is immeasurably strengthened by the mere presence of those other lines, the reserves behind the front. It is the first line, diplomacy, that must bear the responsibility for avoiding the necessity of ever using those reserves, and it is in that light that I look on my duties here in Japan. One American diplomacy, however, did not accomplish this purpose. It failed even to delay the coming of war until the nation was prepared. The Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, p. 3, said of American-Japanese diplomatic negotiations the question of the wisdom of the foreign policy pursued by the government of the United States is excluded by the terms of the committee's instructions. In any case, to go into this issue would involve the committee in the complexities of history extending back more than 50 years and in matters of opinion which cannot be settled by reference to anything as positive and definite as the constitution, laws, 
and established administrative practices of the United States government. To understand the questions involved, however, an examination of our relations in the Far East, and of the diplomatic negotiations leading up to December 7, 1941, are part and parcel of the explanation of the responsibilities involved in this inquiry. Diplomacy failed because diplomacy was not employed to avert war, but to make certain its coming. Gru himself has described his mission to Tokyo as a labor of peace, but as early as December 14, 1940, when, as one groat on schoolfellow to another, he addressed a dear Frank letter to Mr. Roosevelt, he seems to have grown tired of the struggle. In that letter he told the president that it was a question of when we were to call a halt to Japan's expansion rather than weather. About Japan and all her works, he said. It seems to me increasingly clear that we are bound to have a showdown someday, and the principal question at issue is whether it is to our advantage to have that showdown sooner or to have it later. He then expressed the belief that we are bound eventually to come to a head-on clash with Japan. To replying on January 21, 1941, Roosevelt said, I find myself in decided agreement with your conclusions. 3. The President then spoke of American policy in the Pacific in relation to the efforts of the British in the war in Europe. The British need assistance along the lines of our generally established policies at many points, assistance which in the case of the Far East is certainly well within the realm of possibility so far as the capacity of the United States is concerned. Their defense strategy must in the nature of things be global. Our strategy of giving them assistance toward ensuring our own security must envisage both sending supplies to England and helping to prevent a closing of channels of communication to and from various parts of the world, so that other important sources of supply will not be denied to the British and be added to the assets of the other side. For the President then proclaimed it to be the extraordinary duty of the United States not only to support Britain in the European war but to accept a stewardship entailing the protection of Britain's colonial empire while Britain was occupied in Europe. He said the conflict, in Europe, may well be long and we must bear in mind that when England is victorious she may not have left the strength that would be needed to bring about a rearrangement of such territorial changes in the western and southern Pacific as might occur during the course of the conflict if Japan is not kept within bounds. Five In order to preserve British imperialism in Asia and the Pacific, therefore, the United States must see to it that Japan was kept within bounds. The subsequent course of American diplomacy in dealing with Japan may be interpreted in this light. Is it fair to say, Senator Ferguson inquired of Gru before the Congressional Committee, that you foresaw war between the United States and Japan? I was doing all in my power to avert war, Gru said. That is the only position a diplomatic representative should take. The clash need not have been military. Economic measures might have brought Japan to a position to deal with us. Was it your opinion that Japan would fight or that she was bluffing? I never thought Japan was bluffing, the ambassador replied. I thought they would fight under certain circumstances. 6 in February, 1941, at a time when Gru was remarking, the outlook for the future of the relations between Japan and the United States has never been darker, 7 Adam. Nomura arrived in Washington as the new Japanese ambassador. Nomura, known as an admirer of the United States and Britain, had inherited a difficult job. Facing him were Americans who made no effort to conceal their skepticism of his and Japan's intentions. At his back, in Tokyo, were the jingoists of the Japanese Army and Navy, who did not want any mission of peace to succeed, and the agents of Hitler's Germany spinning their intrigues to involve Japan and the United States in a war which would take America off Germany's back and tie the untrustworthy Japanese firmly to their Axis alliance. When Nomura was sent to the United States, Gru noted that Germans here are doing everything possible to prevent Adam. Nomura from going to Washington and to bring about a partial or complete break in diplomatic relations with the United States, and they are also about to intensify their efforts to embroil the two countries and to propel the Japanese southward advance. Eight almost at once upon his arrival in Washington, 
Nomura opened negotiations looking toward a solution of Japan's difficulties with the United States. In his first interview with the President on February 14, the Admiral referred to the chauvinistic military group in Japan as being the chief obstacle to a moderate policy. Nine, he also pointed out, according to a memorandum written by Secretary Hull on March 8, that the people of Japan with few exceptions were very much averse to getting into war with the United States. Ten on April 9 an informal draft, outlining the basis of a cordial resolution of the outstanding differences between the two nations was presented to the State Department by private Japanese and American individuals. Eleven it provided that the United States would request the Chiang Kai-shek government to negotiate a peace with Japan which would be based on the guarantee of an independent China, withdrawal of Japanese troops, no indemnities or territorial changes, recognition of Manchukuo, and coalescence of the Wang Qingwai Chinese puppet government with that of Chiang. The Japanese were to pledge no large scale concentrated immigration of Japanese into Chinese territory and the open door was to be resumed. The draft agreement stipulated that if the Chinese rejected a settlement tendered through President Roosevelt on these terms, America was to discontinue supplying aid to Chiang's government. Japan was to undertake to limit the military grouping among nations not then involved in the European war, and would execute its commitments under the tripartite pact only if one of its partners were aggressively attacked by a power not then involved. In return, the United States would pledge to stay out of any aggressive alliance designed to assist one nation against another. Both Japan and the United States were to guarantee the independence of the Philippines. 12 The draft of April 9 had been prepared by its private sponsors in collaboration with Ambassador Nomura. Secretary Hull, after first expressing skepticism that the time was opportune for it to be presented as a basis for negotiations, finally agreed that it could be used as a framework for beginning discussions if it was supplemented with the following points. 1 respect for the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of each and all nations. 2. Support of the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. 3. Support of the principle of equality, including equality of commercial opportunity. 4. Non-disturbance of the status quo in the Pacific, except as the status quo may be altered by peaceful means. 13 On May 12th, Nomura submitted an official revision of the April 9th draft to Secretary Hull, the principal changes being that the United States was to pledge to take no aggressive measures against any other nation, and was to acknowledge Premier Kono's basis for a settlement in China, providing for a neighborly friendship between China and Japan joint defense against communism, and economic cooperation not based upon any Japanese attempt to attain economic monopoly. 14 Four days later the State Department submitted revisions of these proposals, in which the American pledged to discontinue assistance to China if Chiang refused the Japanese peace tender was rejected, the Kono principles were not stated in the text and the proviso that China and Japan should undertake joint defense against communism was rephrased to read parallel measures of defense against subversive activities from external sources. Recognition of Manchukuo was left for later negotiations between China and Japan. Secretary Hull also insisted that this country should not be bound to any course of action which would limit all-out assistance to Britain in its fight with the Axis partners in Europe, and Nomura was asked to state that Japan's Axis commitments were not inconsistent with the policy of permitting America to intervene against its partners in the tripartite pact. 15 A week later, after Foreign Minister Matsuka had stated Japan's obligations to support Germany in the event of American entry into the war in Europe. Hull informed Nomura that there could be little progress in negotiations until Japan, in effect, agreed that we should be permitted a free hand to give aid to Britain, even if that should lead to the United States being drawn into the European war. Nomura expressed the view that Matsoka was talking for home consumption. The ambassador said that Japan would make its own independent decision as to its Axis obligations, and that once the proposed American-Japanese agreement was signed it would cause a weakening in the influence of the Jingos. 
16 on May 31st Hull again revised the draft basis for negotiations by inserting the provision, obviously, the provisions of the pact do not apply to involvement, in the European war, through acts of self-defense. The Joint Defense Against Communism Clause now became Cooperative Defense Against Injurious Communistic Activities, and was tentatively to provide for the continued presence of some Japanese troops in China. 17 Two days later, Nilmuru informed Hull that he and his associates were in agreement with the document as it stood, except for some changes in phraseology. But Hull remains distrustful even to the extent of questioning whether Japan sincerely desired a settlement. 18 The negotiations now stalled on the issue of whether Japan was to permit the United States to carry intervention as far as it liked in Europe without obliging Japan to honor its commitments under the Tripartite Pact. On June 21 Hull handed Nomura a complete revision of the American draft Common 19 and accompanied it with an oral statement that it was illusory to expect substantial results from an agreement between the two countries as long as certain Japanese leaders were committed to the support of Germany. 20 Nomura on July 15 expressed Japan's objections to the American attitude in saying that Japan could not give a blank check for anything that America might call self-defense. 21 Japan, however, did take measures to meet the objections Hull had stated June 21 against pro-German Japanese leaders when the Kono cabinet was revised on July 18 and Foreign Minister Matsoka, who had signed the tripartite pact in behalf of Japan, was dropped. 22 on July 2 representations were made by Tadao Wikawa, an officer of the Capital Cooperative Bank of Japan to the State Department that he had been informed by J.P. Morgan and Company that diplomatic conversations had already been closed by the United States, and that Japanese funds in this country were soon to be frozen. 23 This intelligence, which preceded by 23 days the actual issuance of the freezing order, did not bring any tangible response from the State Department. On July 25 the freezing order was issued, 24 and Britain followed suit the next day. On the same day, as has been noted before, the United States also prohibited the export of petroleum, petroleum products, and scrap metal without a specific license from the Administrator of Export Control. These measures were supposedly taken in retaliation for Japanese assumption of military control over Indochina, which occurred July 21. But in view of Wikawa's complaint three weeks earlier about the impending freezing order, it seems clear that they had been meditated for some time. That the Roosevelt administration embarked upon its program of economic sanctions against Japan with the clear understanding that these measures might easily precipitate war is amply documented. The question had been fully explored by Ambassador Gru in what he called his Green Light Dispatch of September 12, 1940 to the State Department. After reviewing the trend of events in the Far East, the ambassador urged the United States to embark on a course of economic sanctions in order to curb Japanese military expansion. Of this message Mr. Gru remarked in his book, Ten Years in Japan, another important event, from my point of view, was the sending to Washington in September of what I can only call my green light telegram. Perhaps the most significant message sent to Washington in all the eight years of my mission to Japan. 25 Discussing the risks of adopting a policy of sanctions against Japan, Gru remarked, in his message to the State Department, I have expressed the opinion in previous communications that American-Japanese relations would be set on a downward curve if sanctions were applied by the United States. It is true that measures are now justified by a new program of national preparedness which need not fall within the category of outright sanctions. On the other hand, the probability must be contemplated that drastic embargoes on such important products as oil, of which a superabundance is known to be possessed by the United States, would be interpreted by the people and government of Japan as actual sanctions and some form of retaliation might and would follow. The risks would depend not so much upon the careful calculations of the Japanese government as upon the uncalculating do or die temper of the army and navy should they impute to the United States the responsibility for the failure of their plans for expansion.
It may be that such retaliation would take the form of countermeasures by the government but it would be more likely that it would be some sudden stroke by the navy or army without the prior authorization or knowledge of the government. These dangers constitute an imponderable element which cannot be weighed with assurance at any given moment. However, it would be short-sighted to deny their existence or to formulate policy and adopt measures without fully considering these potential risks in determining the wisdom of facing them squarely. Gru said, however, that it was impossible to stand still when Japan and its Axis partners represented a way of life which threatened Britain and America as the leaders of a large, worldwide group of English-speaking peoples. He remarked, in general, the uses of diplomacy are bankrupt in attempting to deal with such powers. Occasionally diplomacy may retard, but it cannot stem the tide effectively. Only by force or the display of force can these powers be prevented from attaining their objectives. American interests in the Pacific are definitely threatened by her, Japan's, policy of southward expansion, which is a thrust at the British Empire in the East. Admittedly America's security has depended in a measure upon the British fleet, which has been in turn and could only have been supported by the British Empire. If the support of the British Empire in this, her hour of travail, is conceived to be in our interest, and most emphatically do I so conceive it, we must strive by every means to preserve the status quo in the Pacific at least until the war in Europe has been won or lost. 26 before the Congressional Investigating Committee, Senator Ferguson asked Gru, why did you send the green light telegram? Because the time had come to apply economic measures, Gru replied. 27 that the American government and military services were well aware that the imposition of oil sanctions would force Japan into further aggressions was demonstrated at the Congressional Committee hearings. For example, Senator Ferguson asked Adam Stark, about the oil question, and your attitude toward Japan, did you not testify before the Navy Court that after the imposition of economic sanctions upon Japan in the summer of 1941, you stated that Japan would go somewhere and take it, oil, and that if you were a Jap you would? I think that is correct, Stark responded. I stated it, and I stated in the State Department, as I recall that if a complete shutdown was made on the Japanese, throttling her commercial life and her internal life, and her essential normal peace life by stopping her from getting oil, the natural thing for a Jap was to say, well, I will go down and take it. 28 Ferguson then asked whether Stark recalled a White House conference on July 24, 1941, when Roosevelt said he had told Ambassador Namura that, should Japan attack to get oil by force, the Dutch and British would go to war against her. When Stark said he had no recollection of this statement, Ferguson read the following transcript of the president's remarks to Namura. The president said that if Japan attempted to seize oil supplies by force in the Netherlands East Indies, the Dutch, without a shadow of a doubt, would resist, the British would immediately come to their assistance, war would then result between Japan the British and the Dutch, and, in view of our own policy of assisting Britain, an exceedingly serious situation would immediately result. 29 Now, Ferguson said, do you know whether or not shortly after that, in fact, in about 48 hours, the embargo did go on? The embargo went on, as I recall, Stark replied, on the 26th. This is the 24th. Yes, sir. 30 Ferguson then read a memorandum of a conversation on July 25, 1941, between Arthur A. Ballantyne, Assistant Secretary of State, and Col. Iwakuro, Japanese military attaché in Washington. Col. Iwakuro stated that, in view of the imposition of the oil embargo, Japan would have no alternative sooner or later but to go into Malaya and the Dutch East Indies for oil and other materials. Now, Admiral, said Ferguson, taking the high-ranking officials in our government, you said that you thought sanctions such as this oil, etc., would bring war on ultimately. Who else agreed with you? Stark replied that he believed the State Department, army leaders, and practically all high officials in Washington took that position. 
he read from peace and war practically all realistic authorities have been agreed that imposition of economic sanctions or embargoes against any strong country, unless that imposition be backed by a show of superior force, involves serious risk of war. The President and heads of the Army and Navy and Department of State were in constant consultation through this period regarding all the aspects of the diplomatic and military situation. 31 Ferguson then produced a covering letter written by Stark July 22, 1941, to Under Secretary of State Wells, attached to which was an analysis of the expected effects of an oil embargo which had been drafted by Adam. Turner. This analysis set forth the Navy's official position on the advisability of imposing the embargo, as attested by a notation from Stark to Wells saying, I concur in general. 32 Turner, in his analysis, said, It is generally believed that shutting off the American supply of petroleum will lead promptly to the invasion of the Netherlands East Indies. While probable, this is not necessarily a sure immediate result. Japan has oil stocks for about 18 months war operations. Turner said, however, that an embargo on exports will have an immediate severe psychological reaction in Japan against the United States. It is almost certain to intensify the determination of those now in power to continue their present course. Furthermore, it seems certain that, if Japan should then take military measures against the British and Dutch, she would also include military action against the Philippines, which would immediately involve us in a Pacific war. Enlisting his conclusions, Adam Turner said, an embargo would probably result in a fairly early attack by Japan on Malaya and the Netherlands East Indies, and possibly would involve the United States in early war in the Pacific. If war in the Pacific is to be accepted by the United States, actions leading up to it should, if a practicable, be postponed until Japan is engaged in a war in Siberia. It may well be that Japan has decided against an early attack on the British and Dutch, but has decided to occupy Indochina and to strengthen her position there, also to attack the Russians in Siberia. Should this prove to be the case, it seems probable that the United States could engage in war in the Atlantic, and that Japan would not intervene for the time being even against the British. Turner's final recommendation was that trade with Japan not be embargoed at this time. 33 Three days after the Navy Council the State Department and Roosevelt against the embargo, the President imposed it. Four days before the freezing and embargo orders, Namura, perturbed by the turn events were taking, endeavored to see in turn Secretary Hull and Adam Stark, but, unable to reach either finally called on Adam. Turner. Turner's report of this conversation depicts Namura as speaking with considerable frankness as one naval officer to another ambassador Namura stated that for some weeks he had frequent conferences with Mr. Hull, in an endeavor to seek a formula through which the United States and Japan could remain at peace. He no longer hoped for 100% agreement on all points but would be content if a partial agreement could be reached which would prevent war between the two countries. Such an agreement would necessarily be informal, since Japan is now committed by treaty to Germany, and this treaty could not be denounced at this time. However, he noted that the decision as to when the military clauses of the treaty would come into effect lies entirely in Japan's hands, and that these would be invoked only if Germany were to be the object of aggression by another power. He stated that Japan entered the Axis solely because it seemed to be to Japan's interest to do so. Japan's future acts will be dominated solely by Japan, and not by any other power. Whatever military action Japan takes will be for her own ultimate purposes. The ambassador also told Adam Turner that, as a result of the United States export restrictions, Japan's economic position was bad and steadily getting worse. American and British military support to China, in contrast, was steadily increasing. Namura informed Turner that within the next few days Japan would occupy Indochina. He expressed himself as personally opposed to this move, and feared that the United States would take further military and economic action in reprisal. He proposed that if the United States could change its policy in regard to the Japanese embargo and aid to China, 
and that if it could bring itself to agree to permitting Japanese troop concentrations on the border of Inner Mongolia, whatever action was taken by the United States in the Atlantic would not be of great concern to Japan. This was the Japanese proposal in its plainest form, and Adam Turner inferred that it would mean Japanese troop withdrawal from the greater part of China. 34 on July 23, however, Wells, who was acting as Secretary of State, told Nomura there was no basis for pursuing further the conversations between Japan and the United States. 35 This statement provoked such profound concern in Tokyo that the new Japanese Foreign Minister, Admiral Tejaro Toyoda, informed Gru on July 26 that he had hardly slept at all during recent nights. 36 Adam. Nomura, however, left Wells after expressing the hope that no hasty conclusions would be reached and after voicing his own belief that a friendly adjustment could still be found. 37 President Roosevelt on July 24 proposed that if Japan would withdraw its troops from Indochina, he would make every effort to obtain an agreement from the British, Dutch, and Chinese for the neutralization of this area. Nomura responded that withdrawal, with the attendant problem of saving face, presented difficulties that were probably insuperable. 38 The fact that Roosevelt's suggestion was not received in Tokyo until after news of the American freezing order, thus increasing Japanese resentment, made it clear to Gru that the proposal could not be favorably considered at that time. 39 On August 6 Nomura informed Hull that Japan would pledge that it will not further station its troops in the southwestern Pacific areas except French Indochina and that the Japanese troops now stationed in French Indochina would be withdrawn forthwith on the settlement of the China incident. In return for these concessions, Japan asked that the United States agree that Japanese citizens in the Philippines would not be discriminated against, that the United States would suspend its military measures in the Southwest Pacific, and, on the successful conclusion of the conversations, would attempt to induce Britain and Holland to take similar steps, that normal trade relations would be restored by the United States, that both nations were to cooperate in assuring free access to the natural resources of the Southwest Pacific and East Asia, and that the United States was to use its good offices for the initiation of direct negotiations between the Japanese government and the Chiang Kai-shek regime for the purpose of a speedy settlement of the China incident. 40 Hull's formal reply termed these proposals lacking in responsiveness to the suggestion made by the President. 41 Thus, when Roosevelt went off to the Atlantic Conference, where he promised Churchill that the United States would take an uncompromising position against Japan, even if it resulted in war, the negotiations in Washington were stalemated. When the president returned from his meeting at sea to present Nomura with his warning of August 17 that America would fight, the Japanese ambassador brought up the plan for a radical solution of Japan's differences with this country. It was nothing less than that Roosevelt should hold a Pacific conference with Premier Prince Kono, just as he had held an Atlantic conference with Churchill, and that face to face the leaders of the two countries should achieve a settlement once and for all. Adam. Nomura told the President that Prince Kono feels so seriously and earnestly about preserving peaceful relations that he would be disposed to meet the President midway, geographically speaking between our two countries and sit down together and talk the matter out in a peaceful spirit. 42 This proposal was not new with the Japanese. It had first been suggested in the formal draft of April 9 presented by non-official Japanese and Americans to the State Department as the outline for resolution of the strained relations between the two countries. It had then been proposed that this meeting be held during May at Honolulu. Thus the idea of a Roosevelt Kona meeting preceded the Atlantic Conference by four months. 43 on August 8, 44 two days before Roosevelt met Churchill off Newfoundland, and again on August 16, 45 Nomura repeated his request for a meeting between the President and Kona to Secretary Hull. But Hull gave him no encouragement. On August 17 Nomura submitted the plan directly to Roosevelt. The president made no direct reply at the time. In Tokyo, Foreign Minister Toyoda, pressing Ambassador Gru to support such a meeting, 
expressed high hopes that it would solve all of the difficulties. Gru personally appealed for very prayerful consideration of the proposal for the sake of avoiding the obviously growing possibility of an utterly futile war between Japan and the United States. The ambassador wrote Secretary Hull, not only is the proposal unprecedented in Japanese history, but it is an indication that Japanese intransigence is not crystallized completely owing to the fact that the proposal has the approval of the emperor and the highest authorities in the land. The good which may flow from a meeting between Prince Kono and President Roosevelt is incalculable. 46 The hopes of the Japanese moderates were centered on this plan. They believed that the best hope of peace was for peace elements in Japan to establish themselves firmly in control, as against the military extremists, and to cooperate with the United States in shifting Pacific relationships onto a new basis. It was believed, however, that a certain measure of immediate agreement was a prerequisite to establishing the moderates and control, because it would form a counterweight on Japanese public opinion against the pressures of the militarists and of Axis propaganda. Finally, on August 23, Roosevelt said that if such a meeting was to be held, it might be arranged for about October 15, but Nomura stressed the urgency of an earlier date. 47 On August 27, Prime Minister Kono sent a personal appeal to Roosevelt for a meeting as soon as possible. 48 The President, although willing to meet Churchill, now raised difficulties about getting away for 21 days to go as far as Hawaii. He suggested that if the meeting were held in Juneau, Alaska, it would require only about two weeks of his time and would allow for about a three or four day conversation. 49 Nomura replied that Juno was acceptable, and that Kona would get there in about ten days by warship. He suggested the period between September 21st and 25th as most suitable for the meeting. 50 Hull took the position that all of the decisions to be reached at the proposed meeting should be agreed to preliminary to it, and looked upon Juno as merely a ratification meeting. He brought up the serious consequences to both governments if the meeting failed to reach an agreement, but he did not give equal consideration to the hazards of having no meeting at all. Nomura tried to allay his doubts, particularly as to the crucial question of Japan's commitments under the Tripartite Pact, by saying that this alliance would present no difficulties at the conference because the Japanese people regarded their adherence to the Axis as merely nominal and he could not conceive of his people being prepared to go to war with the United States for the sake of Germany. He asserted, however, that for the United States to demand that Japan grant America a blank check for any action against Germany was equivalent to asking for an nullification of the tripartite pact, and that he did not think Japan's leaders were willing to go that far as long as they were subject to pressure, if not belligerent action, by a combination consisting of the United States, Britain, and Holland. 51 On September 3, Roosevelt submitted a formal reply to Kono's proposal for a meeting, adopting the view expressed by Hull that preliminary agreements were necessary to ensure a successful outcome. 52 But, at the same time, he said that such preliminary agreements would have to be submitted to and discussed with the British, Chinese, and Dutch before he could take them up in negotiations with Kono. 53 This proviso not only made an early meeting a practical impossibility, but reduced the possibility of arranging a conference at all. It demonstrated unmistakably that this country already had an alliance, admitted or not, with China and the Western imperialisms and was conducting its diplomacy much more with the view to protecting their interests than its own. Prince Kono, in his memoirs, stated that on August 28 Roosevelt had summoned Nomura and told him, I desire a meeting of about three days with Prince Kono. But something happened, Kono continued, and Roosevelt's enthusiasm cooled between then and September 3.54 Although the conference project continued to be discussed, it had been rendered at Edletu by the President's attitude. The American diplomatic representatives in Tokyo noted that, almost until the very end, Kono and the moderate element were willing to go to almost any lengths to bring off the meeting and avert war.
Eugene Duman reported on September 18 that an understanding had been reached among influential elements in Japan enabling Kona to give Roosevelt direct oral assurance in regard to the tripartite pact which would be entirely satisfactory to the president. 55 On September 27, Foreign Minister Toy Oda again urged a Pacific conference in describing to Ambassador Gru his concern over the growing tension in relations between Japan and America. He said that he hoped for an adjustment, not only for the sake of the two countries, but in the belief that such a step would become the opening wedge to bringing about peace throughout the world. Toy Oda said since assuming my post two months ago, I've been working on the matter of adjusting Japanese U.S. relations even to the extent of almost forgetting to eat and sleep. It is with the same objective that Premier Kono has expressed his willingness to act as a leader in a conference with President Roosevelt. Japan is connected to Germany and Italy by an alliance. The fact that the Premier of Japan had volunteered to meet the President, in itself has given rise to much misunderstanding regarding her relations with Germany and Italy. Thus, there is proof that Japan is making a supreme sacrifice. Moreover, the history of Japan has no precedent of an instance where the Premier himself has gone abroad in behalf of diplomacy. This fact in itself should clearly show the sincerity of the government of Japan in its expressed desire of adjusting the relationship between Japan and the United States, and, through that, of maintaining peace in the Pacific, and, indeed, for the world. Maintenance of peace is Japan's sole motivating power. Should there be those who believe that Japan was forced to her knees by the United States pressure, it would indeed be a sad misconception on their part. Japan desires peace, she is not succumbing to outside pressure. Moreover, Japan is not one to yearn for peace at any price. Toy Oda said that the vessel to transport Kono and his party to the meeting had already been selected, and the personnel of the party, including generals and admirals, had been decided upon. We are in a position to start at any moment now, he said. 56 Toy Oda further told Gru, Time, as I have often said, is a vital factor from both internal and international viewpoints. The decision, whether to hold the conference, must be made as soon as possible. So I desire to ask for the most speedy and sincere consideration of the American government. I may add that, as regards the date for the meeting, October the 10th to the 15th will suit the Japanese government. Finally, by way of a conclusion, I should like to say that negotiations of this sort require sincerity and mutual confidence. I need not dwell on the character, the convictions, and faith of Prince Kono as well as his political position, all of which are well known to Your Excellency. Without Prince Kono and the present cabinet under him, an opportunity for Japanese-American rapprochement is likely to be lost for some time to come. I wish to emphasize again the urgent necessity of having the proposed meeting at the earliest possible date. 57 On September 29, Gru sent a strong plea to Washington in behalf of the meeting. He left no doubt of the alternative if Kono's request were spared. In this message the American ambassador said that the advent of the Kona Toyota regime had given American diplomacy a new lease on life, expressing hope that so propitious a period be not permitted to slip by, Gru said that in his opinion the time had arrived when liberal elements in Japan might come to the top if encouraged. He said that the United States must choose between a policy of economic strangulation or the method of constructive conciliation. If the Kono proposal for a conference leading to rapprochement were rejected, Gru continued, Kono's cabinet would fall, a military dictatorship would come into power, unbridled acts might be expected, and a situation would result in which it will be difficult to avoid war. Gru said Kono, while unable to renounce the Axis alliance, would reduce Japan's adherence to a dead letter? The Roosevelt Kono Conference, the ambassador concluded, presented the hope that ultimate war may be avoided in the Pacific. 58 This forecast was prophetic. Roosevelt was being offered the chance that might have avoided war. He chose to refuse it. Events then followed their inevitable course. After dispatching this message, 
Gru commented in his journal for a prime minister of Japan thus to shatter all precedent and tradition in this land of subservience to precedent and tradition, and to wish to come hat in hand, so to speak, to meet the president of the United States on American soil, is a gauge of the determination of the government to undo the vast harm already accomplished in alienating our powerful and progressively angry country. 59 Even in the face of such representations, Secretary Hull remained obdurate and maintained that Japan's failure to make specific advance commitments was a sign of insincerity and evidence, the intention to continue a policy of aggression. 60 In Japan, such unwillingness to compromise, Duman observed occasion doubt whether the United States ever intended to come to an agreement. 61 Roosevelt and Hull refused to act and matters drifted along until the outside date of October 15 proposed by Toyota for the conference had slipped by. On the following day, October 16, the Kono cabinet resigned and Gen. Tojo and the militarists took over the government of Japan. Although I knew that the failure of progress in the American-Japanese negotiations would almost certainly bring about Kono's fall sooner or later, Gru said, I had not looked for it so soon. 62 In an exchange of letters with Kono the following day, Gru warmly commended the former premier for his distinguished official service to Japan. 63 Later Gru commented the reason why I mentioned his outstanding service was the fact that he alone tried to reverse the engine and tried hard and courageously, even risking his life and having a very close call as it was. Whatever mistakes he made directing Japan's policy, he had the sense and the courage to recognize those mistakes and to try to start his country on a new orientation of friendship with the United States. 64 Kono had indeed pursued his policy at the risk of his life. On August 14, Baron Hiranuma, the 75-year-old vice premier in his cabinet, had been struck by two bullets fired by a member of the Black Dragon Society who found the moderation of the government intolerable. The incident was interpreted as a warning that Kono and the moderates who were endeavoring to avert a war with the United States must go. 65 Kono, facing an order from American military occupation headquarters for his arrest as a war criminal ended his life with poison December 16, 1945. In Oscar Wilde's De Profundis, one of the last books Kono had read, this passage was underlined, society as we have constituted it will have no place for me, has none to offer, but nature, whose swift rains fall on the unjust and just alike, will have clefts in the rocks where I may hide, and secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. 66 No one else wept for the lost peace. The majority report of the Joint Congressional Committee, p. 48, states, that there were elements in Japan who desired pieces unquestioned. But for many years the government of that nation had been divided into two schools of thought, the one conceivably disposed to think in terms of international goodwill with the other dominated by the militarism of the warlords who had always ultimately resolved Japanese policy. President Roosevelt's responsibility in conducting diplomacy was described in the Minority Report of the Joint Congressional Committee, p. 12, as follows. The duty of conducting negotiations with foreign governments from March 4, 1933, to December 7, 1941, was vested in President Franklin D. Roosevelt, under the Constitution, laws, and established practice of the United States and he could delegate to the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, such correspondence and communications relating thereto as he deemed fitting and proper. In respect of matters assigned to him it was the duty of Secretary Hull to keep the President informed of all transactions that were critical in nature and especially those involving the possible use of the armed forces of the United States. Chapter 11 Diplomacy for D-Day Despite the accession of Gen. Tojo and a military government all hope was not yet lost. Tojo started the war and has been brought to dock as a war criminal, but he was not installed as premier with the purpose of embarking upon a conflict with the United States which would end in the ruin of Japan. The danger that the conflict would materialize lay, as far as Japan was concerned, in the insensate ambitions of the military extremists. One, The strategy of Hirohito and his advisers was, therefore, 
to vest in a representative of this very element responsibility for the policies and conduct of the Japanese government, in the hope that by so doing a restraining influence could be exerted over the hotheads by one of their own number. Ambassador Gru wrote in his journal October 20th, despite the fact that, as anticipated, the Kono government was succeeded not by a civilian but by a military man, indications of a willingness on the part of the Tojo government to proceed with the conversations. Would imply that it is premature to stigmatize the Tojo government as a military dictatorship committed to the furtherance of policies which might be expected to bring about armed conflict with the United States. Noting that Tojo, as distinguished from previous Japanese military prime ministers, was not a retired officer, but a full general in active service, Gru observed, it would be logical, therefore, to expect that Gen. Tojo, in retaining his active rank in the army, will as a result be in a position to exercise a larger degree of control over army extremist groups. To as further encouragement to hopes for preserving peace, Gru reported to the State Department that a reliable Japanese informant had told him that just prior to the fall of the Kono cabinet a conference of the leading members of the Privy Council and of the Japanese armed forces had been summoned by the Emperor, who inquired if they would be prepared to pursue a policy which would guarantee that there would be no war with the United States. The representatives of the Army and Navy who attended the conference did not reply to the Emperor's question, whereupon the latter, with a reference to the progressive policy pursued by the Emperor Meiji, his grandfather, in an unprecedented action ordered the armed forces to obey his wishes. The Emperor's definite stand necessitated the selection of a Prime Minister who would be in a position effectively to control the army, the ensuing resignation of Prince Kono, and the appointment of Gen. Tojo who, while remaining in the active army list, is committed to a policy of attempting to conclude successfully the current Japanese-American conversations. Three, there was, in fact, an active appreciation, especially on the part of the Japanese Navy, that it might well be an invitation to disaster to undertake a war against the United States. Kono, in his memoirs, asserted that Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, the commander-in-chief of the combined imperial fleets, when asked what the chances were if a war should develop, told him, if they say it must be done, we will run around at will for about half a year or a year, but if it stretches into two or three years, I have no confidence in a successful ending. For the Roosevelt administration had already kicked over the best hope of preserving peace when it refused to strengthen the hand of Kono and a plain warning of the consequences, embodying an inferential criticism of the Roosevelt policy toward Japan, was dispatched by Ambassador Gru to Hull on November 3. Gru said that if efforts at conciliation were to fail, the ambassador foresees a probable swing of the pendulum in Japan once more back to the former Japanese position or even farther. This would lead to what he has described as an all-out, do-or-die attempt actually risking national harakiri, to make Japan impervious to economic embargoes abroad rather than to yield to foreign pressure. It is realized by observers who feel Japanese national temper and psychology from day to day that, beyond peradventure, this contingency not only is possible but is probable. The view that war probably would be averted, though there might be some risk of war, by progressively imposing drastic economic measures is an uncertain and dangerous hypothesis upon which to base considered United States policy and measures. War would not be averted by such a course, if it is taken. The primary point to be decided involves the question whether war with Japan is justified by American national objectives, policies, and needs in the case of failure of the first line of national defense, namely, diplomacy since it would be possible only on the basis of such a decision for the Roosevelt administration to follow a course which would be divested as much as possible of elements of uncertainty, speculation, and opinion. The ambassador does not doubt that such a decision, irrevocable as it might well prove to be, already has been debated fully and adopted, because the sands are running fast. Five Gru was here saying that Roosevelt and his administration had already committed themselves to war, and that the policy of economic strangulation and the refusal to support the Kono government as the one hope of peace were merely symptoms of the fundamental decision already reached. Gru continued, The Ambassador. 
does not at all mean to imply that Washington is pursuing an undeliberated policy. Nor does he intend to advocate for a single moment any appeasement of Japan. The ambassador's purpose is only to ensure against the United States becoming involved in war with Japan because of any possible misconception of Japan's capacity to rush headlong into a suicidal struggle with the United States. He points out the short-sightedness of underestimating Japan's obvious preparations to implement an alternative program in the event the peace program fails. He adds that similarly it would be short-sighted for American policy to be based upon the belief that Japanese preparations are no more than sabbatling, merely intended to give moral support to the high-pressure diplomacy of Japan. Action by Japan which might render unavoidable an armed conflict with the United States may come with dangerous and dramatic suddenness. Six, the Japanese government, however, would make one further endeavor to reach a solution. Even before the collapse of the Kono cabinet, it had been determined to dispatch Saburo Kuresu, an experienced diplomat, to Washington to assist Nomura in this final attempt to come to an understanding. Seven Kurasi left Tokyo on his mission November 5th. With or without his knowledge, and Kurasu, as well as Nomura, professed after the war that he had no advance knowledge of the Pearl Harbor stroke 8, the Tojo government had already set a deadline for reaching an understanding with the United States. Upon his departure, Kurosu said that he refused to take a later clipper for technical reasons. 9 The obvious inference was that he was working within a fixed time limit. Nor were the reasons for this decision difficult to perceive. By November, the economic war initiated by the United States had already reduced Japan to a desperate pass. Not only had Japanese assets been frozen by the Americans, British, and Dutch, cutting off trade with these countries, but the Panama Canal had been closed to Japanese shipping. These actions, together with the trade stagnation incident to the Russo-German War, had cut off about 75% of Japan's normal imports, causing a serious food shortage and weakening the general economy. Ten these dislocations were so severe that, according to the information given grew November 7 by a leading Japanese, the Tojo government had decided the limits to which it will be possible to go in an endeavor to meet the desires of the United States, but nevertheless should these concessions be regarded as inadequate by the government of the United States, it is of the highest importance that the Washington conversations be continued and not permitted to break down. 11 This insistence that the conversations be continued, even if there were recognition of failure on both sides again hints that a deadline had already been established for agreement, after which any further conversations would be merely for the purpose of deceiving the none too prescient administration in Washington and its Army and Navy command. The Japanese pretense of keeping up the conversations after November 26 was, in fact, designed to stall for time until a military plan already set in train could be executed. When Gru complained to his informant of the bellicose tone of the Japanese press, his visitor merely remarked that frightened dogs bark and the greater the fright the louder the bark, adding that at present the military party in Japan are frightened by the prospects opening up before them. 12 Even before Kuros arrived in Washington, however, the new Tojo government had displayed a disposition to strive for an understanding by authorizing Nomura to present to Secretary Hull on November 7 a memorandum dealing with the disposition of Japanese troops on the Asiatic mainland and pledging that all troops, with the exception of garrisons in North China and Inner Mongolia, would be withdrawn from China within two years after the conclusion of a peace and that Japanese troops would also be withdrawn from Indochina after the conclusion of the Chinese War. Thirteen three days later Nomura again endeavored to satisfy President Roosevelt's concern about Japan's commitments under the Axis Pact by saying, all I have to ask you is to read between the lines and to accept the formula as satisfactory. Fourteen in Tokyo Shigenari Togo, the new Japanese foreign minister, spoke grimly to Gru on November 10 of America's refusal to display what he termed sincerity. Gru said that the minister stated the population of this country is steadily and rapidly increasing, that it was now about 100 million, and it was necessary to assure all materials necessary for their existence. 
It was his opinion that unless the American government realizes this fact as among the realities of the situation, successful conclusion to the conversations would be difficult. During the conversations carried on for a period of more than six months, the Japanese government had repeatedly made proposals calculated to approach the American point of view, but the American government for its part had taken a more advanced position. Those being the facts, we in Japan are led to wonder what is the degree of sincerity of the American government in continuing with the conversations. He said that national sentiment will not tolerate further protracted delay in arriving at some conclusion. Later in the conversation, Togo asserted that the freezing by the United States of Japanese assets had stopped supplies of many important raw materials to Japan. Economic pressure of this character is capable of menacing national existence to a greater degree than the direct use of force. The minister also inquired of Gru why America took a holier than thou attitude toward Japanese military activity, voicing his impression that the American government is now resorting, under the plea of self defense, to measures over and beyond those that are generally recognized by international law. 15 All of these many months, the American government had considered its discussions with the Japanese merely as preliminary and exploratory conversations but now the Japanese deemed that they had advanced sufficiently to be raised to the level of formal and official negotiations. 16 The Japanese also pleaded for more speed in the negotiations, but were answered by Roosevelt with the statement that the six months already consumed was but a short time to deal with such important problems. He then counseled patience. 17 Foreign Minister Togo was described as shocked on hearing from Nomura that Holland Roosevelt did not appreciate the urgency of the negotiations and the necessity to bring them to an early successful conclusion. Japan was so thoroughly subjected to militaristic propaganda that Togo realized, like Kono before him, according to the statement of Gru that he was endangering his position and even his life by opposing extremist groups and keeping the negotiations alive. 18 On November 15, however, Secretary Hull said he would not even enter the stage of negotiations until Great Britain, China, and the Netherlands had been consulted, and that he objected to receiving ultimatums on the question of speeding up the discussions because, he said, the United States had been pursuing a peaceful course all the while and the Japanese government was the one which had been violating law and order. He added that to reach an agreement while Japan's obligations to Germany remained in force would cause so much outcry in this country that he might well be lynched. 19 Hull now suggested a new commercial agreement providing for cooperation by the United States and Japan in reducing trade barriers generally and restoring normal trade between the two countries, except as each might find it necessary to restrict exports for its own security and self-defense. 20 American embargo orders against Japan had not mentioned that country by name but had generally prohibited exports of certain products except to the Western Hemisphere and Great Britain in the interest of self-defense so that resort to the same phrase in Hull's new offer could be interpreted as constituting an escape clause by which this country could give Japan a promise but no tangible benefits. Upon Kurosu's arrival in Washington November 17, Hull threw cold water on his mission at the outset by insisting on an outright Japanese disavowal of the tripartite pact before discussing anything else, and expressing the opinion that Kurosu had nothing new to offer. 21 Hull in continuing conference sessions, displayed no more readiness to compromise, stating at a meeting November 18, we can go so far but rather than go beyond a certain point it would be better for us to stand and take the consequences. 22 Kurosu told Hull that, while he could not say that Japan would abrogate the tripartite pact, Japan might do something that would outshine the tripartite pact. 23 Hull was not impressed. When Kuresu then asked for a State Department formula by which Japan could deal with her Axis obligations, Hull dismissed the request with the statement that this was a matter for Japan to work out. 24 Nomura, also pressing for some means to change Japan's course, pointed out that big ships cannot turn around too quickly, that they have to be eased around slowly and gradually. 25 To attain this end, the Japanese on November 20 and 21 made what was to be their last offer. 
This was the so-called modus vivendi which was to serve until some further agreement could be reached. Hull asked whether the Japanese proposal was intended as a temporary step to help organize public opinion in Japan and whether the Japanese emissaries intended afterward to continue the conversations, looking to the conclusion of a comprehensive agreement. Kurosi replied in the affirmative. According to the State Department account, Mr. Kurosu said that some immediate relief was necessary and that if the patient needed a thousand dollars to effect a cure, an offer of three hundred dollars would not accomplish the purpose. The secretary replied that although the Japanese proposal was addressed to the American government, he had thought it advisable to see whether other countries would contribute and he found that they would like to move gradually. This view entirely discounted Kurosu's insistence that some kind of speedy settlement, even of a stopgap character, was necessary. The ambassador, Hull said, explained that Japan needed a quick settlement and that its psychological value would be great. 26 But Hull couldn't, or wouldn't, move that fast. The Japanese proposals were as follows 1. The governments of Japan and the United States undertake not to dispatch armed forces into any of the regions, excepting French Indochina, in the Southeastern Asia and the Southern Pacific area. 2. Both governments shall cooperate with the view to securing the acquisition in the Netherlands East Indies of those goods and commodities of which the two countries are in need. 3. Both governments mutually undertake to restore commercial relations to those prevailing prior to the freezing of assets. The government of the United States shall supply Japan the required quantity of oil. 4. The government of the United States undertakes not to resort to measures and actions prejudicial to the endeavors for the restoration of general peace between Japan and China. 5. The Japanese government undertakes to withdraw troops now stationed in French Indochina upon either the restoration of peace between Japan and China or the establishment of an equitable peace in the Pacific area, and it is prepared to remove the Japanese troops in the southern part of French Indochina to the northern part upon the conclusion of the present agreement. As regards China, the Japanese government while expressing its readiness to accept the offer of the President of the United States to act as introducer of peace between Japan and China as was previously suggested, asked for an undertaking on the part of the United States to do nothing prejudicial to the restoration of Sino-Japanese peace when the two parties have commenced direct negotiations. 27 In regard to the Axis Pact, Kurosu stated, Japan undertook to interpret its commitments freely and independently. He declared that the Japanese government would never project the people of Japan into war at the behest of any foreign power, it would accept warfare only as the ultimate, inescapable necessity for the maintenance of its security and the preservation of national life against active injustice. 28 This was as far as Japan had ever gone in disavowing the war threat of the pact but Hull noted that he did not think this would be of any particular help and so dismissed it. 29 The Secretary also objected to the clause specifying that the United States would refrain from actions prejudicial to the endeavors for the restoration of general peace between Japan and China. This clause apparently required suspension of American aid to Chiang, and the Secretary said that the purpose of our aid to China was the same as that of our aid to Britain 30 implying an all-out American support of Chinese victory, regardless of its effect upon relations with Japan. On November 22 Hull further insisted that Japanese troops be withdrawn not only from southern Indochina, but from all of that country. 31 On November 24, Gru reported from Tokyo that Foreign Minister Togo expressed perplexity concerning the reasons of the American government for not accepting the Japanese proposal. Togo said he did not expect American aid to China to be discontinued until such time as negotiations between China and Japan were to begin, at which time he assumed hostilities would have ceased. Gru concluded from these remarks that this point in the Japanese proposal was primarily intended to save face. 32 Long after the event, Secretary Hull would describe the Japanese proposals of November 20 and 21 as the final Japanese proposition, an ultimatum. 33 On November 26 he submitted the American counter-proposal, and it meant war. Gru noted in his diary on November 29 that when Hull's proposals became known in Japan, 
Most Japanese leaders, among them Togo and Prince Kono, were very pessimistic. 34 on December 5 he reported having received a letter from a prominent Japanese who said that almost all of the people with whom he had talked believe that Washington has delivered an ultimatum to us. 35 on November 30 the Japanese state of mind was reflected in a bellicose speech delivered by Premier Gen. Tojo under the auspices of the Imperial Rule Assistance Association and Dinipon East Asia League. The Premier asserted the fact that Chiang Kai-shek is dancing to the tune of Britain, America, and communism at the expense of able-bodied and promising young men in his futile resistance against Japan is only due to the desire of Britain and the United States to fish in the troubled waters of East Asia by pitting the East Asiatic peoples against each other and to grasp the hegemony of East Asia. This is a stock in trade of Britain and the United States. For the honor and pride of mankind, we must purge this sort of practice from East Asia with a vengeance. 36 Howell's proposals of November 26 were clearly unacceptable to the Japanese and were known to be so in advance by the Secretary. They made it clear that the State Department had reached the end of negotiations. On the day before submitting them to Nomura and Kuresu, Hull expressed the belief at a meeting of the War Council that there was practically no possibility of an agreement being achieved with Japan, that in his opinion the Japanese were likely to break out at any time with new acts of conquest by force, and that the question of safeguarding our national security was in the hands of the Army and Navy. He also expressed his judgment that any plan for our military defense should include an assumption that the Japanese might make the element of surprise a central point in their strategy and also might attack at various points simultaneously with a view to demoralizing efforts of defense. 37 In the light of these opinions Hull could not have expected much to come of his proposals of the following day. Roosevelt also had no misconceptions about what would happen when the proposals were tendered Japan. In a message to Prime Minister Churchill on November 24, he stated, I am not very hopeful and we must all be prepared for real trouble, possibly soon. 38 Again, at a meeting at the White House on noon of the 25th, the day before Hull handed the President's counter proposals to Japan, Roosevelt brought up the event that we were likely to be attacked, perhaps, as soon as, next Monday. 39 Hull stated before the Congressional Investigating Committee that he conducted his diplomacy in close collaboration with the British, Australian, Dutch, and Chinese governments, all of which were consulted in the preparation of the November 26 Note, 40 and whose views, particularly those of the Chinese, he accommodated even though they had a profound effect upon bringing on the war. One of his memoranda, for instance, showed that on November 25, the day before he submitted the American terms to Japan, he consulted Ambassador Halifax, who wanted the proposals to the Japanese to include removal of all Jap troops and naval and air forces from Indochina, instead of permitting 25,000 troops to remain, as Hull had suggested. The American secretary amended his government's terms to accommodate the British ambassador's view. 41 Halifax also wanted Hull's relaxation of economic restrictions to be amended to forbid export to Japan of all goods of direct importance to the war potential, in particular, oil. Halifax said the British were anxious to facilitate Hull's difficult task but said the British Empire's economic structure was so complicated that Britain considered it impracticable to give carte blanche to diplomatic representatives. 42 In a message to Roosevelt on November 26, Churchill acknowledged receipt from the President of a message about Japan informing the British government of Hull's submission of his ultimatum to the Japanese envoys on that date. Churchill told the President, it is for you to handle this business. There is only one point that disquiets us, Churchill went on. What about Chiang Kai-shek? Is he not having a very thin diet? Our anxiety is about China. If they collapse, our joint dangers would enormously increase. We are sure that the regard of the United States for the Chinese cause will govern your action. We feel that the Japanese are most unsure of themselves. 43 Churchill could have spared himself his worries about the Chinese. They were taking care of themselves. 
The fact was brought out at the congressional hearings that Hull cast away the last help of averting war by yielding to their importunities. Before he submitted his document of November 26, which the Army Pearl Harbor Board described as touching the button that started the war, 44 Hull had inclined toward the idea of submitting a modus vivendi of his own to effect a three months truce with Japan. This scheme was in the forefront of his mind as late as the morning of the 25th as attested by Secretary of War Stimson. Stimson said at 9.30 Knox and I met in Hull's office for our meeting of three. Hull showed us the proposal for a three-month struce, which he was going to lay before the Japanese today or tomorrow. It adequately safeguarded all our interests, I thought as I read it, but I did not think that there was any chance of the Japanese accepting it because it was so drastic.45 in return for the propositions which they were to do, namely, to at once evacuate and at once to stop all preparations or threats of action, and to take no aggressive action against any of her neighbors, etc., we were to give them open trade in sufficient quantities only for their civilian population. This restriction was particularly applicable to oil. We had a long talk over the general situation. We were an hour and a half with Hull, and then I went back to the department, and I got hold of Marshal.46 with the Chief of Staff, Stimson then went to the White House, where, together with Secretaries Knox and Hull and Adam Stark, they heard the President make his prediction of a Japanese attack perhaps next Monday. On the following day, November 26, Stimson learned that Hull had determined to abandon the modus vivendi. Stimson recounted, Hull told me over the telephone this morning that he had about made up his mind not to make the proposition that Knox and I passed on the other day to the Japanese but to kick the whole thing over, to tell them that he has no other proposition at all. The Chinese have objected to that proposition, when he showed it to them, that is, to the proposition which he showed to Knox and me because it involves giving to the Japanese the small modicum of oil for civilian use during the interval of the truce of three months. Chiang Kai-shek had sent a special message to the effect that that would make a terrifically bad impression in China, that it would destroy all their courage and that it would play into the hands of his, Chiang's, enemies and that the Japanese would use it. T. V. Su had sent me this letter and has asked to see me and I had called up Hull this morning to tell him so and ask him what he wanted me to do about it. He replied as I have just said above, that he had about made up his mind to give up the whole thing in respect to a truce and to simply tell the Japanese that he had no further action to propose.47 when Adam Stark was examined before the Congressional Committee. Representative Gearhart brought up the White House conference at noon on the 25th and asked whether Hull at that time gave any intimation that he proposed to abandon the proposal for a three month truce. Stark said he could not recall, but that Hull, in a memorandum of November 27, mentioned that as early as the 25th he was considering abandoning the modus vivendi and on the 26th did abandon it. Well, weren't you very, very much disturbed? and wasn't Jen. Marshall very much disturbed by the progress of that conference in the things that were said and the things that were being planned by Mr. Hull? Asked Gearhart. We were disturbed because we thought things were heading up so fast toward a showdown, if you will, and we wanted more time and it began to look as though we were not going to get it, Stark replied. If you read the modus vivendi, it is nothing like so drastic as the so-called ten-point note which he handed to the Japs on the 26th, but it is my understanding that the ten points mentioned in the note on the 26th were the points which were going to be taken up, perhaps one at a time, under the modus vivendi, and that the modus vivendi would provide some weeks, or three months, to discuss these particular points and that then the modus vivendi was thrown overboard and the points with which you are all familiar were handed to the Japanese. It has been stated, Gearhart said, that the modus vivendi was abandoned because Chiang Kai-shek vigorously objected to it. Was any mention made of Chiang Kai-shek's attitude toward the modus vivendi in that meeting of the 25th? I do not recall that it was, Stark replied. I have an extremely clear recollection of Mr. Hull telling me how he felt about the modus vivendi separate from that meeting of the 25th. You heard the President say in the course of that meeting, in substance or in effect, 
that we were likely to be attacked, perhaps as soon as next Monday. Yes, I recall that. 48A Memorandum by Secretary Halter Roosevelt of November 26 was produced. It read with reference to our two proposals prepared for submission to the Japanese government colon 1. A proposal in the way of a draft agreement for a broad, basic, peaceful settlement for the Pacific area which is henceforth to be made a part of the general conversations now going on, to be carried on if agreeable to both governments with a view to a general agreement on this subject. 2. The second proposal is really closely connected with the conversations looking towards a general agreement which is in the nature of a modus vivendi intended to make more feasible the continuance of the conversations. In view of the opposition of the Chinese government and either the half-hearted support or the actual opposition of the British, the Netherlands and Australian governments, and in view of the wide publicity of the opposition and of the additional opposition that will naturally follow through a lack of an understanding of the vast importance and value otherwise of the modus vivendi, without in any way departing from my views about the wisdom and benefit of this step to all of the countries opposed to the aggressor nations who are interested in the Pacific area, I desire very earnestly to recommend that at this time I call in the Japanese ambassador and hand to him a copy of the comprehensive basic proposal for a general peaceful settlement and at the same time withhold the modus vivendi proposal.49 commenting upon Hull's change of mind, which resulted in the abandonment of the modus vivendi, Stark said. I think there was boiling in Mr. Hull's mind the message from Chiang Kai shek and it jellied on the 26th. 50 Stimson first heard of Hull's decision to substitute his ultimatum for the modus vivendi on November 27, one day after the Secretary of State's interview with the Japanese envoys. Stimson related, the first thing in the morning I called up Hull to find out what his finale had been with the Japanese, whether he had handed them the new proposal which we passed on two or three days ago, or whether, as he suggested yesterday he would, he broke the whole matter off. He told me now that he had broken the whole matter off. As he put it, I have washed my hands of it and it is now in the hands of you and Knox, the army and the navy. I then called the president. The president gave me a little different view. He said they had ended up, but they ended up with a magnificent statement prepared by Hull. I found out afterwards that this was not a reopening of the thing but a statement of our constant and regular position.51 Adm. Stark said that he probably first heard on November 27 that Hull had thrown over the modus vivendi and had submitted his ten-point ultimatum. He said he recalled Hull's statement that it was now up to the Army and Navy which, to his mind, pointed clearly to the fact that he, Hull, had no hope of reaching a satisfactory settlement in the Pacific through further negotiations. When I learned of it, I considered it very important, particularly as we were playing for time. Stark said.52 Returning to the influence exerted by the Chinese in inducing Hull to abandon the modus vivendi, Senator Ferguson produced the message transmitted to Secretary Stimson on November 25 by TV Su, Chiang Kai-shek's brother-in-law. Stark identified it as the message which had disturbed Hull. Isn't it true that the Chinese government not only went to the Secretary of State but they went to other agencies and Mr. Hull was upset about it? Ferguson asked. Very much upset. Ferguson asked whether the Chinese had not put pressure even on Congress to induce Hull to abandon the truce proposal. That is my understanding, and confirmed, without any question, by Mr. Hull's statement to me that they were crying appeasement on the hill, another thing which greatly perturbed him. 53 Ferguson then produced a memorandum by Hull of a conversation he had had on November 25 with the Chinese ambassador, Dr. Hu Shih, which bore the title, Opposition of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek to Modus Vivendi describing his conversation with Dr. Hu, Hull said I said very recently that the Generalissimo and M. Chiang Kai-shek almost flooded Washington with strong and lengthy cables telling us how extremely dangerous the Japanese threat is of attack to the Burma Road, to Indochina, 
and appealing loudly for aid, whereas practically the first thing this proposal of mine and the President's does is to require the Japanese troops to be taken out of Indochina and thereby to protect the Burma Road from what Chiang Kai-shek says is an imminent danger. 54 Stark commented on this as follows, I remember very clearly how upset Mr. Hull was, of his telling me that even the Hill was crying appeasement, that the Chinese themselves should have supported him because he was doing this in their behalf, and that apparently they didn't understand it. Also he pointed out that the British, he thought, were only halfway supporting it. 55 Now, will you tell us why the modus vivendi was not sent? Ferguson asked Stark. You were one of the top officials representing the United States Navy, and this would be a naval war in the Pacific, would it not? Largely, yes. I always looked on it as largely a naval war. Stark said that both he and Gen. Marshall were fighting for time, because the defense of the Philippines, which was an army problem, required a greater state of readiness for war. 56 Stark then referred to a memorandum of a conversation November 29th between Hull and Lord Halifax, in which Hull stated the British ambassador called at his request and I soon discovered that he had no special business except to check on the aftermath of the conversations between the President and myself and the Japanese, with special reference to the question of the proposed modus vivendi. This caused me to remark in a preliminary way that the mechanics for the carrying on of diplomatic relations between the governments resisting aggressor nations are so complicated that it is nearly impossible to carry on such relations in a manner at all systematic and safe and sound. I referred to the fact that Chiang Kai-shek, for example, had sent numerous hysterical cable messages to different cabinet officers and high officials in this government other than the State Department and sometimes even ignoring the president, intruding into a delicate and serious situation with no real idea of what the facts are. I added that Chiang Kai-shek had his brother-in-law, located here in Washington, disseminate damaging reports at times to the press and others, apparently with no particular purpose in mind, that we have correspondents from London who interview different officials here, which is entirely their privilege to do except that at times we all move too fast without fully understanding each other's views, etc., etc. I stated that this was well illustrated in the case of the recent outburst by Chiang Kai-shek. In referring to this I remarked that it would have been better if, when Churchill received Chiang Kai-shek's loud protest about our negotiations here with Japan, instead of passing the protest on to us without objection on his part, thereby qualifying and virtually killing what we knew were the individual views of the British government toward these negotiations, he had sent a strong cable back to Chiang Kai-shek telling him to brace up and fight with the same zeal that the Japanese and the Germans are displaying instead of weakening and telling the Chinese people that all of the friendly countries were now striving primarily to protect themselves and to force an agreement between China and Japan. Every Chinese should understand from such a procedure that the best possible course was being pursued and that this calls for resolute fighting until the undertaking is consummated by peace negotiations which Japan in due course would be obliged to enter into with China. 57 I felt the same way about the impropriety of flooding all of Washington in the manner in which Mr. Hull stated, Stark remarked. I thought they should have gone to him with all of their troubles and not gone into the highways and byways. But after we are all through, it is apparent that Mr. Hull followed just what the Chinese wanted? asked Senator Ferguson. He did. He broke off so far as the modus vivendi is concerned, replied Stark. And he gives extensive reasons there for it. Perhaps he may have agreed with some of Chiang Kai-shek's thoughts that even a leak to the effect that the United States was going to let Japan have oil or other materials or ease up on the freezing might be such a blow to their morale as to make it impossible for them to continue. He talked it over, I assume, with his chief and he came to that conclusion. But, Admiral, said Ferguson, isn't this true, that when you take what Mr. Hull said about Chiang Kai-shek, it indicated that he was not going to follow that route, rather that he was going to follow what he wanted. It was a criticism of the Chinese stand, was it not? I do not know if he criticized so much, Stark replied, 
although he may have criticized Chinese understanding in some respects. That, I would say, could have been resolved and set straight between Mr. Hull and the ambassador. But when it was broadcast, and Mr. Hull gained the impression that even here at the capital he was considered guilty of appeasement, that may have influenced him in the action which he took. Now, wait. Do I understand, then, that the opinion that Mr. Hull was appeasing Japan may have had something to do with his throwing out the modus vivendi and putting in the note of the 26th? Whether or not that criticism which was being leveled at him in official Washington had anything to do with his final decision only Mr. Hull could answer, replied Stark. I do know that it greatly annoyed him. 58 This was the background when Nomura and Kurosu called at the State Department at 5.45 p.m. on November 26, to be handed the American terms. The Chinese had got under Hull's skin with their shouts about appeasement, and the Secretary of State, with Roosevelt's blessing, responded by kicking peace out the window. 59 The proposals he submitted to Japan were as follows. 1. The government of the United States and the government of Japan will endeavor to conclude a multilateral non-aggression pact among the British Empire, China, Japan, the Netherlands, the Soviet Union, Thailand, and the United States. 2. Both governments will endeavor to conclude among the American, British, Chinese, Japanese, the Netherlands, and Thai governments an agreement where under each of the governments would pledge itself to respect the territorial integrity of French Indochina and, in the event that there should develop a threat to the territorial integrity of Indochina, to enter into immediate consultation with a view to taking such measures as may be deemed necessary and advisable to meet the threat in question. Such agreement would provide also that each of the government's party to the agreement would not seek or accept preferential treatment in its trade or economic relations with Indochina and would use its influence to obtain for each of the signatories equality of treatment in trade and commerce with French Indochina. 3. The government of Japan will withdraw all military, naval, air, and police forces from China and from Indochina. 4. The government of the United States and the government of Japan will not support, militarily, politically, economically, any government or regime in China other than the national government of the Republic of China with capital temporarily at Chongqing. 5. Both governments will give up all extraterritorial rights in China, including rights and interests in and with regard to international settlements and concessions and rights under the Boxer Protocol of 1901. Both governments will endeavor to obtain the agreement of the British and other governments to give up extraterritorial rights in China, including rights in international settlements and in concession and under the Boxer Protocol of 1901. 6. The government of the United States and the government of Japan will enter into negotiations for the conclusion between the United States and Japan of a trade agreement based upon reciprocal most favored nation treatment and reduction of trade barriers by both countries, including an undertaking by the United States to bind raw silk on the free list. 7. The government of the United States and the government of Japan will, respectively, remove the freezing restrictions on Japanese funds in the United States and on American funds in Japan. 8. Both governments will agree upon a plan for the stabilization of the dollar-yen rate, with the allocation of funds adequate for this purpose, half to be supplied by Japan and half by the United States. 9. Both governments will agree that no agreement which either has concluded with any third power or powers shall be interpreted by it in such a way as to conflict with the fundamental purpose of this agreement, the establishment and preservation of peace throughout the Pacific area. 10. Both governments will use their influence to cause other governments to adhere to and to give practical application to the basic political and economic principles set forth in this agreement. 60 Lindley and Davis candidly remark, when the document was out of his hands. Mr. Hull had a feeling that it somehow put an end to the grueling, anxious year and a half since Sudan the period of the diplomatic defensive during which the White House and Department of State, lacking military might, had deployed the country's moral suasion and economic strength around the globe in an effort to keep war from our shores. 
Mr. Hull regretfully thought he might have kept the peace a little longer without sacrifice of vital interests, but the issue of war or peace had been taken out of his hands. 61.3, 4, and 9, requiring withdrawal of all Japanese troops from China and Indochina, Japanese recognition of the Chiang Kai shek regime, and abandonment of the Axis, were the most important of the ten demands and promises. After the Japanese had read the documents, Assistant Secretary of State Joseph W. Ballantyne recounted, Mr. Kurasu asked whether this was our reply to their proposal for a modus vivendi. Hull said that it was. Kurasu said he did not see how his government could consider paragraphs 3 and 4 of the proposed agreement and that if the United States should expect that Japan was to take off its hat to Chiang Kai-shek and propose to recognize him, Japan could not agree. After looking over the American terms further, Kurasu said that when he and Namura reported the American answer, their government would be likely to throw up its hands. He suggested that it might be better if they did not refer the statement to Tokyo before discussing its contents further, but Hull said that the proposal was as far as we would go at this time. When Hull repeatedly referred to public opinion as conditioning his actions, asserting that he might almost be lynched if he permitted oil to go freely to Japan, Adam Namura remarked that sometimes statesmen of firm conviction fail to get sympathizers among the public, that only wise men could see far ahead and sometimes suffered martyrdom, but that life's span was short and that one could only do his duty. Kurasu said that he felt that the American response to the Japanese proposals was tantamount to meaning the end and asked again whether the United States were not interested in a modus vivendi. Hull dismissed the question by saying, we have explored that. 62 On the following day the two Japanese ambassadors called with Hull on President Roosevelt. They expressed disappointment about the failure of any agreement regarding a modus vivendi. The president refused to temper the American proposals and told the ambassadors, we remain convinced that Japan's own best interests will not be served by following Hitlerism and courses of aggression, and that Japan's own best interests lie along the courses which we have outlined in the current conversations. If, however, Japan should unfortunately decide to follow Hitlerism and courses of aggression, we are convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that Japan will be the ultimate loser. 63 Replying to this, Kurasu, in an interview with Hull on December 1, disclaimed on the part of Japan any similarity between Japan's purposes and Hitler's purposes, while Nomura pointed out that wars never settle anything and that war in the Pacific would be a tragedy but he added that the Japanese people believe that the United States wants to keep Japan fighting with China and to keep Japan strangled. He said that the Japanese people feel that they were faced with the alternative of surrendering to the United States or fighting. The ambassador said that he was still trying to save the situation. 64 Hull did not even profess still to be trying. On November 29, he told Lord Halifax that the diplomatic part of our relations with Japan was virtually over and that the matter will now go to the officials of the Army and Navy. He said further that it would be serious mistake for our country and other countries interested in the Pacific situation to make plans of resistance without including the possibility that Japan may move suddenly and with every possible element of surprise and spread out over considerable areas and capture certain positions and posts before the peaceful countries interested in the Pacific would have time to confer and formulate plans to meet these new conditions that this would be on the theory that the Japanese recognize that their course of unlimited conquest now renewed all along the line probably is a desperate gamble and requires the utmost boldness and risk. 65 These military moves were indeed in drain. The day before Hull submitted the president's ten-point program, the Japanese fleet which would descend upon Pearl Harbor had already put to sea from Hitokapu Bay. In view of the irreconcilable attitude of both governments, it was now almost beyond the bounds of possibility that the striking force would be recalled from its mission, but even as late as December 2 Adam. Nagano again ascertained from Adam. Yamamoto that the fleet could be turned in its course if a settlement should somehow be attained. 66 Although conversations continued in Washington off and on during the ensuing ten days, they did not change the status 
and the fact that war was inevitable was apparent to both sides. On December 2, for instance, Under Secretary Wells complained of Japanese military activity in Indochina and elsewhere, reading a statement from Roosevelt conveying implied notice that the United States would act under his warning of August 17 in the event of new Japanese aggression. Mr. Roosevelt said the stationing of these increased Japanese forces in Indochina would seem to imply the utilization of these forces by Japan for purposes of further aggression. Such aggression could conceivably be against the Philippine Islands, against the many islands of the East Indies, against Burma, against Malaya, or either through coercion or through the actual use of force, for the purpose of undertaking the occupation of Thailand. Such new aggression would of course, be additional to the acts of aggression already undertaken against China, our attitude toward which is well known, and which has been repeatedly stated to the Japanese government.67 to this Nomura, foreshadowing the final Japanese answer, replied, the Japanese people believe that economic measures are a much more effective weapon of war than military measures. They believe they are being placed under severe pressure by the United States to yield to the American position and that it is preferable to fight rather than to yield to pressure. 68 on December 5. Nomura told Hull that the Japanese were alarmed over increasing naval and military preparations of the ABCD powers in the southwest Pacific area, and that an airplane of one of those countries recently had flown over Formosa. He said that our military men are very alert and enterprising and are known to believe in the principle that offense is the best defense. 69 If the ambassador was waxing sardonic, the effect was lost upon Hull. The Secretary of State remarked after some further discourse that we were not looking for trouble but that at the same time we were not running away from menaces. 70 The only other development preceding the outbreak of war was President Roosevelt's direct appeal to Hirohito on December 6, which, as Hull later remarked, was for the record. 71 The message was withheld from Ambassador Gru for ten and a half hours and was finally placed in the hands of the Emperor at 3 a.m., Tokyo time, December 8, 20 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. 72 In the course of his remarks Roosevelt stated during the past weeks it has become clear to the world that Japanese military, naval, and air forces have been sent to southern Indochina in such large numbers as to create a reasonable doubt on the part of other nations that this continuing concentration in Indochina is not defensive in its character. The people of the Philippines, of the hundreds of islands of the East Indies, of Malaya, and of Thailand itself are asking themselves whether these forces of Japan are preparing or intending to make attack in one or more of these many directions. It is clear that a continuance of such a situation is unthinkable. None of the people whom I have spoken of above can sit either indefinitely or permanently on a keg of dynamite. 73 The first response was at Pearl Harbor. The second came at 6 a.m., Tokyo time, December 8, when Japanese Imperial Headquarters announced that a state of war existed with the United States and Great Britain. 74 The third came several hours after the attack had begun when Foreign Minister Togo made an oral statement as a reply from the Emperor to the President to the effect that establishment of peace in the Pacific and consequently of the world has been the cherished desire of His Majesty, for the realization of which he has hitherto made the government to continue its earnest endeavors. 75 in Washington, Adam. Nomura asked for an appointment with Secretary Hull on December 7 at 1 p.m. 7.30 a.m., Hawaii time, but later telephoned and asked that the appointment be postponed to 1.45, as he was not quite ready. He and Kurasu arrived at the State Department at 2.05 and were received by Hull at 2.20. The attack on Pearl Harbor had begun at 1.20 p.m. Washington time. Nomura stated that he had been instructed to deliver at 1 p.m. the document he handed Hull, but that decoding had prevented him from fulfilling his orders. 76 The document which was handed Hull was Japan's reply to the American statement of November 26. Although the Japanese ambassadors did not know it, 
The contents of this document were fully known to leaders of the American government and the military and naval services in advance of the interview. The Japanese reply was a long statement which rejected every thesis in the Hull proposals and accused the American government of adopting a course of action which menaces the empire's existence itself and disparages its honor and prestige. In the course of this reply, the Japanese government said, whereas the American government objects to Japanese attempts to settle international issues through military pressure, it is exercising in conjunction with Great Britain and other nations pressure by economic power. Recourse to such pressure as a means of dealing with international relations should be condemned, as it is at times more inhumane than military pressure. It is impossible not to reach the conclusion that the American government desires to maintain and strengthen, in coalition with Great Britain and other powers, its dominant position it has hitherto occupied not only in China but in other areas of East Asia. It is a fact of history that the countries of East Asia for the last hundred years or more have been compelled to observe the status quo under the Anglo-American policy of imperialist exploitation and to sacrifice themselves to the prosperity of the two nations. The Japanese government cannot tolerate the perpetuation of such a situation since it directly runs counter to Japan's fundamental policy to enable all nations to enjoy each its proper place in the world. Obviously, it is the intention of the American government to conspire with Great Britain and other countries to obstruct Japan's effort toward the establishment of peace through the creation of a new order in East Asia, and especially to preserve Anglo-American rights and interests by keeping Japan and China at war. This intention has been revealed clearly during the course of present negotiations. Thus, the earnest help of the Japanese government to adjust Japanese-American relations and to preserve and promote the peace of the Pacific through cooperation with the American government has finally been lost. The Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government that in view of the attitude of the American government it cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. 77 Hull who had word of the actual attack half an hour before he received the Japanese emissaries, expressed great indignation to them over their government's language in rejecting his terms. He told them I must say that in all my conversations with you during the last nine months I have never uttered one word of untruth. This is borne out absolutely by the record. In all my fifty years of public service I have never seen a document that was more crowded with infamous distortions and falsehoods, infamous distortions and falsehoods on a scale so huge that I never imagined until today that any government on this planet was capable of uttering them. 78 The need for politeness was over. It was war. In a statement to the press later that day, Hull stated, Japan has made a treacherous and utterly unprovoked attack upon the United States. At the very moment when representatives of the Japanese government were discussing with representatives of this government, at the request of the former, principles and courses of peace, the armed forces of Japan were preparing and assembling at various strategic points to launch new attacks and new aggressions upon nations and peoples with which Japan was professedly at peace including the United States. It is now apparent to the whole world that Japan in its recent professions of a desire for peace has been infamously false and fraudulent. 79 In his message to Congress December 8 requesting a declaration of war, Roosevelt used similar language, referring to December 7 as a date which will live in infamy, stating that the Japanese had attacked suddenly and deliberately, again describing the attack as unprovoked and dastardly, and asserting, Always will we remember the character of the onslaught against us. The pretense of surprise was emphasized in the statement, while their, Japanese, reply, of December 7, stated that it seemed useless to continue the existing diplomatic negotiations, it contained no threat or hint of war or armed attack. 80 This high-flown condemnation is customary under the circumstances but it is hard to see how the attack at Pearl Harbor could have been regarded as a completely unprovoked and unexpected act of treachery, for both governments had resigned themselves to war, and it was just a question of time when one of them should take the step that led to open hostilities. What was not known at the time, and would not be known until almost four years later, was that Hull, 
Roosevelt, the Secretaries of War and Navy, and the Navy High Command and Army General Staff had clear and indisputable evidence long before December 7 that Japan was going to fight, and that it would open the war on the day that it did at the place that it did. All of the professions of Roosevelt and Hull, therefore, that the Japanese assault was a totally unforeseen event were, to this degree, counterfeit, while the diplomacy they had pursued had made war inevitable, as both well knew. 81 On the night of December 7, Prime Minister Churchill later would recall, he was sitting with John G. Winant, the American ambassador, at his country residence, Chequers, listening to a news broadcast. Quite casually, he said, came an item that the Japanese had attacked United States shipping in the Pacific. It passed almost without our realizing it, and then suddenly we realized what had happened. Churchill obtained a connection with the White House on the transatlantic telephone. We are all in the same boat now, said the President. 82 The United States was in the war, not only against Japan but all the way, as Roosevelt triumphantly announced in his radio address to the nation on the night of December 9.83 cf. pp. 194, 196. Chapter 12 Magic Diplomatic Negotiations, as often as not, serve to mask the real motives and the real intentions of the governments conducting them. On any point of issue, the governments which are parties to a dispute endeavor to conceal their real aims by invoking language which will present them in the most favorable light and emphasize their passionate dedication to justice and international morality. This generality undoubtedly applies to both the United States and Japan in their discussions in Washington between February and December, 1941. What the Japanese government did not know all the time these conversations were in progress, and what the American people would not know until four years later, was that months before the Pearl Harbor attack the American government, by a stroke of unmatched good fortune, had been placed in possession of a priceless weapon. Our intelligence had cracked the Japanese code relating to ship movements and the Japanese ultra code used in advising its diplomatic corps throughout the world. With this knowledge in their possession, President Roosevelt, the State Department, and the Army and Navy were privy to all of Japan's plans and intentions. They knew what the Japanese were saying among themselves, what they were thinking, and what they were planning to do. Our officials could not have been better informed if they had had seats in the Japanese War Council. So like a gift of the gods did our leaders consider the breaking of the Japanese code that they referred to cryptanalysis as magic. The first intimation that the American government had broken the Jap code came on August 29, 1945, when President Truman released the reports of the Army and Navy Boards of Inquiry which had investigated the Pearl Harbor disaster. The Navy Court had reported its findings to the Secretary of the Navy on October 19, 1944, and the Army Board to the Secretary of War on October 20, 1944. At that time the nation was still at war with Germany and Japan, and, by resorting to the convenient pretext of national security, the secretaries labeled the reports top secret and suppressed them for ten months. When they were finally released, Large sections were still withheld, but there were enough hints in the text made public to suggest that the United States was in possession of the code secret before Pearl Harbor. The Army Board, for instance, significantly stated information from informers, agents, and other sources as to the activities of our potential enemy and its intentions in the negotiations between the United States and Japan was in possession of the state, war and Navy departments in November and December of 1941. Such agencies had a reasonably complete knowledge of the Japanese plans and intentions, and were in a position to know their potential moves against the United States. Therefore, Washington was in possession of essential facts as to the enemy's intentions and proposals. This information showed clearly that war was inevitable, and late in November absolutely imminent. It clearly demonstrated the necessity for resorting to every trading act possible to defer the ultimate day of breach of relations to give the Army and Navy time to prepare for the eventualities of war. The messages actually sent to Hawaii by the Army and Navy gave only a small fraction of this information. 
it would have been possible to have sent safely information ample for the purpose of orienting the commanders in Hawaii, or positive directives for an all-out alert. Under the circumstances, where information has a vital bearing upon actions to be taken by field commanders, and cannot be disclosed to them, it would appear incumbent upon the War Department then to assume the responsibility for specific directives to such commanders. Gen. Short got neither form of assistance after November 28 from the War Department, his immediate supervising agency. It is believed that the disaster of Pearl Harbor would have been lessened to the extent that its defenses were available and used on December 7 if properly alerted in time. The failure to alert these defenses in time by directive from the War Department, based upon all information available to it, is one for which it is responsible. The War Department had an abundance of vital information that indicated an immediate break with Japan. All it had to do was either get it to Short or give him a directive based upon it. Short was not fully sensitive to the real seriousness of the situation, although the War Department thought he was. It is believed that knowledge of the information available in the War Department would have made him so. General discussion of the information herein referred to follows the records show almost daily information on the plans of the Japanese government. In addition to that cited above and in conjunction therewith the War Department was in possession of information late in November and early in December from which it made deduction that Japan would shortly commence an aggressive war in the South Pacific that every effort would be made to reach an agreement with the United States government which would result in eliminating the American people as a contestant in the war to come, and that failing to reach the agreement the Japanese government would attack both Britain and the United States. This information enabled the War Department to fix the probable time of war with Japan with a degree of certainty. In the first days of December this information grew more critical and indicative of the approaching war. Officers in relatively minor positions who were charged with the responsibility of receiving and evaluating such information were so deeply impressed with its significance and the growing tenseness of our relations with Japan, which pointed only to war and war almost immediately, that such officers approached the Chief of the War Plans Division, Gen. Jiro, and the Secretary of the General Staff, Col. now Lieutenant Gen. Walter Bedell Smith for the express purpose of having sent to the department commanders a true picture of the war atmosphere which, at that time, pervaded the war department and which was uppermost in the thinking of these officers in close contact with it. The efforts of these subordinate officers to have such information sent to the field were unsuccessful. They were told that field commanders had been sufficiently informed. The secretary to the general staff declined to discuss the matter when told of the decisions of the War Plans Division. Two officers then on duty in the War Department are mentioned for their interest and aggressiveness in attempting to have something done. They are Col. R. S. Bratton and Colonel Lotus K. Sadler. The following handling of information reaching the War Department in the evening of December 6 and early Sunday morning, December 7 is cited as illustrative of the apparent lack of appreciation by those in high places in the War Department of the seriousness of this information which was so clearly outlining the trends that were hastening us into war with Japan. At approximately 10 p.m. on December 6, 1941, and more than 15 hours before the attack at Pearl Harbor, G2 delivered to the Office of the War Plans Division and to the Office of the Chief of Staff of the Army information which indicated very emphatically that war with Japan was a certainty and that the beginning of such war was in the immediate future. The officers to whom this information was delivered were told of its importance and impressed with the necessity of getting it into the hands of those who could act. The Chief of Staff of the Army and the Chief of the War Plans Division. On the following morning, December 7, at about 8.30 a.m., other information reached the office of G2, vital in its nature and indicating an almost immediate break in relations between the United States and Japan. Col. Bratton, Chief, Far Eastern Section, G2, attempted to reach the Chief of Staff of the Army in order that he might be informed of the receipt of this message. He discovered that the General was horseback riding. Finally, and at approximately 11.25 a.m., 
The chief of staff reached his office and received this information. Jen. Miles, then G2 of the War Department, appeared at about the same time. A conference was held between these two officers and Jen. Juro of the War Plans Division, who himself had come to the office of the chief of staff. Those hours when Broughton was attempting to reach someone who could take action in matters of this importance and the passing of time without effective action having been taken, prevented this critical information from reaching Jen. Short in time to be of value to him. About noon, a message was hastily dispatched to overseas department commanders, including Short in the Hawaiian department. This message came into Short's possession after the attack had been completed. One, these were matters which the Roosevelt Truman administration did not want to have explored, for they would lead into embarrassing avenues. In March, 1945, when it had become apparent that there would be further investigation of the Pearl Harbor catastrophe after the end of the war, Senator Albert D. Thomas of Utah, chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs, introduced Senate Bill 805 in behalf of the administration. This measure provided that the disclosure of any cryptographic information, either our own or that of any other government, allied or enemy, should be punishable by a sentence of 10 years in prison or a fine of $10,000 or both. This measure went to the committee with an endorsement from Secretary of War Stimson and from H. Struve Hensel, acting Secretary of the Navy, who said that enactment of the proposed legislation is considered essential in the interest of national defense and security. Senator Thomas, elaborating on this theme, said, with respect to cryptanalysis, an even greater degree of secrecy is required. Such activities of vital importance in time of war and also essential in time of peace in order to be ready for war, require even a greater degree of security because the enemy or potential enemy has it within his absolute power to deprive us of any information from this source if he suspects we are getting it. To this excuse of national security was invoked by many of the principal figures who testified before the Congressional Pearl Harbor Investigating Committee in extenuation of their failure to alert the Hawaiian commanders in accordance with the decoded information in their possession. The Thomas bill was slipped through the Senate. April 9, 1945, but, because of the vigilance of Senator Ferguson, it was recalled and modified so that any regularly constituted committee of the Senate or House was exempted from its provisions. Ferguson had detected at once that the purpose of the bill was to stifle any prospective investigation of the Pearl Harbor debacle. The following October, when the bill was brought up for consideration in the House, it encountered so much opposition even in its amended form that it was withdrawn. Three on November 6, 1945, Representative Gerhardt, a member of the four man Republican minority on the ten member Congressional Committee which three weeks before had been appointed to investigate Pearl Harbor, took the floor of the House and for the first time revealed the nature and content of some of the most important Japanese secret code messages intercepted and decoded in 1941.4 it was apparent immediately why the administration had gone to such lengths to endeavor to suppress these messages for all time. Gearhart stated that the messages he was reading were outlined in a memorandum of the Judge Advocate General of the Army for the Secretary of War. The messages set forth in this document all pointed unmistakably to war, and even to the time and place of the initial attack. The Japanese code intercepts were finally disclosed in full on November 15, 1945, the opening day of the congressional investigation. More than 700 of them were produced, of which more than 200, dating back to December 2, 1940, dealt with ship movements. The report of the decoded diplomatic messages began on July 2, 1941.5 in response to the American order freezing Japanese assets, Foreign Minister Toyota radioed Ambassador Nomura in Washington July 31, 1941 comma commercial and economic relations between Japan and third countries, led by England and the United States, are gradually becoming so horribly strained that we cannot endure it much longer. Consequently, our empire, to save its very life, must take measures to secure raw materials of the South Seas. 
our empire must immediately take steps to break us under this ever strengthening chain of encirclement which is being woven under the guidance and with the participation of England and the United States, acting like a cunning dragon seemingly asleep. That is why we decided to obtain military bases in French Indochina and to have our troops occupy the territory. Toyota continued. I know that the Germans are somewhat dissatisfied over our negotiations with the United States, but we wish at any cost to prevent the United States from getting into war, and we wish to settle the Chinese incident. Six on August 7th, Namura reported to Tokyo, there is no doubt whatsoever that the United States is prepared to take drastic action depending on the way Japan moves, and thus closing the door on any possibility of settling the situation. It is reported that the President, accompanied by high army and navy officials, is meeting with Churchill. This indicates that careful preparations are being made to counter our every move without falling back a single time. Seven on August 16, two days after the announcement of the Roosevelt Churchill meeting at sea, Namura reported to Tokyo. I understand that the British believe that if they could only have a Japanese American war started at the back door, there would be a good prospect of getting United States to participate in the European War. Eight on September 27th, Toyota sent Namura a digest of a conversation which he had had with Gru the same day in which he said that Japan's paramount policy was to keep peace with the United States. He said, should the United States and Japan come to blows, the Pacific, too, would be immediately thrown into the chaos that is war. World civilization would then come crashing down. No greater misfortune could befall mankind. If, at this time, Japanese U.S. relations were to be adjusted so as to promote friendship between them, the effects would be felt not only by the United States and Japan, but would indeed contribute greatly to a world peace. The imperial government desires the adjustment of Japanese U.S. relations not only for the sake of Japan and the United States but hopes that at the same time such a step would become the opening wedge to bringing about peace throughout the world. All through the dispatches of this period Tokyo kept expressing its hopes that the proposed conference between Roosevelt and Prime Minister Kona would provide a solution to all problems in the Pacific. On August 26 Tokyo informed Nomura, now the international situation as well as our internal situation is strained in the extreme and we have reached the point where we will pin our last hopes on an interview between the Premier and the President. Ten as the Kono government entered upon its final weeks of life, the urgency of a Pacific conference was increasingly stressed. A message to Washington on October 1 stated, time is now the most important element. Whether this matter materializes or not has a direct and important bearing on peace in the Pacific and even of the world. 11 again, on October 3, a message to Nomura informed him that the British ambassador to Japan, Sir Robert Craigie, was so impressed with the need of jogging Washington into action in order to avoid a Pacific war that he had cabled Foreign Minister Anthony Eden and Lord Halifax as follows among the difficult points in the materialization of a Japanese-United States conference, is that with Japan speed is required. By pursuing a policy of stalling, the United States is arguing about every word and every phrase on the grounds that it is an essential preliminary to any kind of an agreement. It seems apparent that the United States does not comprehend the fact that by the nature of the Japanese and also on account of the domestic conditions in Japan, 